welcome back to another epic tale filled with action and adventure. As we begin, we see countless different types of monsters ravaging the earth. Humans screamed and fled, trying desperately to save themselves from the beasts. Dragons infest the skies, shooting beams of energy waves at their poor victims, while terrifying orcs, wolves, and other land creatures tear people apart like papers. It all started when the gates opened, marking the fall of our world. Of the countless humans who were helplessly dying to the monsters, only a very small number awakened their supernatural abilities. They are called the saviors of humanity, the last line of defense of the people on Earth, the players. They utilize various weapons, swords, shields, staves, and magic, the very stuff you find in a magical RPG game. Only this time, the survival of the human race depends on it. They tear down monsters with great powers, magical swords, and other methods they can use to retaliate from the otherworldly beasts. Among the so-called players, our hero for this series, Lee Hyunwook, an F-rank player, is called the Great Steel Emperor. He is called the last savior of humanity. Or at least, that is what he has hoped to happen. This thought is shattered like fragile glass touched by a mosquito. Savior, my ass. Our hero thinks that his life has been royally fucked. We get to see our boy in a military uniform, struggling while performing one military exercise. We see a group of soldiers sticking their heads to the ground, doing as they were commanded. The commanding officer walks down from a stair and orders them to get their heads straight. This military camp is called the Ant, Anti-Monster Troop, a kind of military training that players who have awakened their skills are required to serve. Look at that poster, though, looking like a goofy-ass cartoon with a bright smile and a thumbs up, as if the training would just be a walk in the park. Well, it does say that they are proud of them, so it must be rewarding, right? Wrong. We see our boy Lee Hyunwook having a hard time while complaining with all his heart. He grits his teeth while thinking how the hell did he get into this position if he is the last savior of humanity. They are currently at the ant shooting range, a vast piece of land located in the middle of nowhere, where players are drilled to become worthy heroes capable of defending lives. The commanding officer shouts that they are the strongest, then proceeds to scold his subordinates for losing track of nine cartridges. I'm guessing that they lost precious equipment during one of their skirmishes. While maintaining the awkward position, our hero sneakily uses his power with just the tip of his index finger. And immediately, a bullet cartridge case comes flying out from one of his pockets. He meticulously controls the cartridge, guiding it to his mouth and swallows it. It's quite weird to see, but I guess that's why he is called the Great Steel Emperor. The commanding officer asks them one simple question, with his eyes red from rage and his mouth wide open, making sure that everyone hears him. He asks them if they are in their right minds. With their heads stuck on the ground and their butts pointed at the sky, they all answer in unison, no. While all of this is happening, our hero is currently preoccupied with something. He stares at the system window beside him and reads its content. It says that the weight of metal currently available for manipulation is 300 grams. It would seem that his power allows him to manipulate metal in the surroundings proportionate to the weight of metal he ingests. He chews the bullet cartridge case like some kind of bubble gum with a serious expression on his face. How would he be in his right mind when this is his second time in the army? We go back to the early scenario where monsters are rampaging uncontrollably in the city. We see our hero spit blood as he takes massive damage from an enemy. This will all happen in the near future. While our hero is lying helpless on the ground, a mysterious man cloaked in a white robe and wearing a doctor's plague mask approaches Lee Hyunwook. In the background, countless human corpses piled up, indicating that the players have lost the battle. Buildings were destroyed, and the landscape of what was a beautiful city is now in complete destruction. An explosion occurs in the distance, the light coming from it highlights the lifeless bodies of the citizens. There were no exceptions, men, women, elderly, and children were all killed indiscriminately, yet no monster is in sight. While holding back his tears, our hero scoffs and says that in the end, it wasn't the monsters that killed humanity, rather, the human race was devoured by their own, the players. The man in the white robe knows our hero, he addresses him as humanity's last hero, the great steel emperor, as he removes his mask. He then retracts his statement and calls our hero by his name, the F. Rank Lee Hyunwook. Though the man in the white robe is clearly a human player, his eyes are red, and his pupils are those of a reptile, indicating that he has surrendered his humanity. He calls themselves divine creatures. They claim that they have not betrayed humanity, rather, as divine creatures, it was their duty to judge humanity, and so they did. Hearing this self-righteous nonsense, our boy grits his teeth to suppress his anger and tells them that they are nothing but fucking villains. If only he had known how to grow stronger in a year, no, even just a day earlier, he would have easily killed those sons of bitches. In this series, humans who sold their souls to the devil and began massacring humankind are deemed as villains. The man mockingly smiles at our enraged hero, asking him if he is frustrated. One muscular dude with a weird-ass giant hammer approaches them while the man continues to taunt our hero. At this point, helplessness and despair have enveloped our strong-willed boy, and he is no longer able to hold back his tears from rolling down. 
the blonde villain says that someone as useless as him, an F rank, would have died right away even if he had known everything earlier. The buff dude starts to raise his weird ass hammer, intending to squash our boy with it, while the blonde fucker states that this kind of death is the most fitting for F ranks like Lee Hyunwook. In his final moments, our hero shouts the name of the blonde dude, Gordon Pracy, as the hammer squashes the life out of him. Just like that, Lee Hyunwook, humanity's last hero, has died. But to his surprise, he goes back in time. He has never expected this kind of development. Regression is something that only happens in web novels, and it is exactly what happened to our boy. A notification window pops up congratulating him for realizing how to grow stronger, along with a prompt stating that he has 10 minutes remaining until metal absorption. Back to their imposing officer. He declares that he will fix the soldier's rotten minds. When he says one, he expects them to say soldier, and when he says two, he wants them to respond by saying mindset. Our boy is clearly struggling with this hellish position. His whole body is now trembling from numbness. He has returned to the past, and now his skills are back at their starting point. But that is fine for him. And so, the bizarre mindset training has begun. The commanding officer shouts, while the cadets respond with the appropriate phrase. Regression is fine and all for Lee Hyunwook. But why the fuck did it have to be at the time in the army? A sentiment I think everyone can relate to if they ever regress back to their cadet times. The scene switches to somewhere that resembles a campus. Soldiers are lined up in an orderly manner, with their weapons at their backs. The commanding officer tells Platoon 3, Squad 2 to enter the structure. I guess this is the canteen because some of the soldiers are whispering, saying that today's menu will be stir-fry with chicken stew. Man, this is making me hungry. You guys go ahead and get yourself some snacks while you watch this amazing series as well. On our hero's face, words I didn't think I'd be back here are written all over. The commanding officer informs the other squads to stand by, then Corporal Lee Hyunwook raises his hand. But that officer tells them that they need to do something first before they can eat. Our hero protests that they just got back from training. They are famished, so they would like to eat first. But the commanding officer just smirks menacingly, asking what training he is talking about while calling our hero a loser. Lee Hyunwook almost forgot about this guy. The army's garbage, Oh Sanguk. In every situation, there will always be that kind of guy who does power trips. Sanguk approaches our boy with authority and angrily asks him if our boy wants his squad to do the work then. He taps Lee Hyunwook's helmet in an attempt to mock him and states that F ranks like him can't even level up, so they might as well take on more work instead to compromise. That's the sole purpose that they have. Back in his previous life, our hero genuinely thought he'd never get past F rank. As Sanguk flips our hero's head back, he asks him if the F rankers will take responsibilities if something urgent happens while they are working, believing that they are so weak that they won't even contribute to anything. All other soldiers laugh and smirk as they watch an F rank corporal get bullied right in front of his squad members. Our hero's eyes exhibit anger while he was staring at his superior, but he is not mad at Sanguk. He is angry about how much of a loser he was back then that trash like this one orders him around. The other party doesn't take his glare lightly though, he becomes agitated and is ready to punish Lee Hyunwook. He readies his power and asks our hero if he wants to go at it, while declaring that he is a D rank. Our boy takes a deep breath and collects his composure. He smiles and tells his superior that he will do as he says but at least give him and his squad food first. Sanguk didn't like his attitude, not one bit, and is now more prepared to attack him. But our hero immediately informs him that other people are observing the current commotion. If this continues, people will think that he is being abusive. He adds that he is worried that his superior might get wrapped up in weird rumors, when he is supposed to be a great person in society in the future. This isn't how it was supposed to go, thinks Sanguk. He takes Lee Hyunwook's words to heart and becomes calm. And with an obedient tone, our boy says that since it was his orders, they will eat real fast and then get the work done quickly as well. Sanguk clears his throat and tells his corporal good work. This dude made a complete 180 real quick. He scolds all onlookers for standing idly and commands them to go eat their fill now. Though everything went smoothly, our hero has lost his appetite and tells his squad member Park Junmo to go ahead and eat first with the rest. Junmo is obviously concerned about his superior, but has no choice but to obey him. Sanguk, on the other hand, is totally flabbergasted about our hero's attitude. He hasn't seen our boy act like that before, and he feels somewhat different. Our hero walks away, feeling down and angry. He was just holding back all his anger, but in reality, he was about to explode. He praises himself for doing well given the situation. That infuriating encounter holds no candle compared to what Gordon Pracy Bastard did. Lee Hyunwook angrily grits his teeth as he curses at the son of a bitch. If he has to stay in the camp longer because he caused trouble, he won't be able to catch up to that fucker. He eats another piece of metal, which adds one gram more to his available weight of metal manipulation, which is now at 309 grams. He then smiles as he takes out a couple of metal spoons. The reason he went out of sight is that he doesn't want the world to know that he has found a way to level up just yet. The scene shifts to the cafeteria where all the soldiers are having their fill. 
A commotion occurs when they notice that all the spoons are missing and start pointing fingers at who is responsible for bringing them. One of the squad members asks Private Park Juno about the spoon, and the lad has absolutely no idea. On the other hand, our boy is happily munching down all the spoons that the soldiers are looking for. He gulps them down like some tasty snacks. He then looks at his weapon, the M7 bayonet, which weighs 140 grams. If he wants to put more weight into the weapon for more impact, it will be the only thing he will be able to control with the available weight manipulation he currently has. He is facing quite a predicament right now, cartridges are just 1 gram, and spoons are only 1.25 grams. It will take him too much time to level up significantly. He thinks to himself if what he has in mind is the only option he has. He has 3 days to prepare himself. After that, he has to defeat a boss mob at level 1. His eyes are brimming with determination. He goes and tests his power, lifting the bayonet with his mind. With a satisfied smile, he tells the world that he will show them what it means to be an expert. Fast forward to three days later. The darkness of the night enveloped the 3rd Brigade, 1st Battalion Station, Namsen 5th Post. We see our boy Lee Hyunwook and Private Jenno, standing guard at one of the guard posts. The private can't help but stare at his corporal. He tells him that he seems to have changed recently. Corporal Hyunwook doesn't really concern himself that much. While he is looking at his watch, he asks the private if it makes him uncomfortable. The private tells him that it isn't the case, but our hero is currently busy looking at his system window stating that he can now manipulate 6 grams more, and his total weight manipulation is 1,359 grams. The private continues to explain that he thinks that the corporal changed for the better. Suddenly, our hero walks towards him without saying a word, which surprises Genmo, thinking he said something wrong. But instead of getting scolded, Hyunwook asks him if he trusts him. Utterly confused with the sudden question, the private says that he indeed does. Satisfied with the answer, our hero smirks and reloads his gun, confusing Junno even more. In the shade of the night, a gate suddenly opened out of nowhere, spawning ugly-looking goblins near the camp. With their disgusting appearances, they smiled with evil intentions as they wielded their weapons. They looked down from the top of the mountain and planned to attack the amp camp. At this hour, most of the soldiers are sleeping soundly. One of the goblins shouts their battle cry but was immediately greeted by a flying knife. The projectile immediately took down the fucker in one hit. And the one behind the surprise attack is none other than our hero, Lee Hyunwook, who went solo to the enemy spawn. The monsters sneered and growled at him, acknowledging our boy as a threat. Turns out, this is what our hero was waiting for the past three days. He smiles and tells the beast that he has been anticipating their arrival. Then, something catches his attention, and he turns around to look at it. The monster he attacked earlier wasn't finished yet. Though it's bleeding profusely from the attack, the ugly creature managed to get back on its feet. He has never failed an ambush in his past life. This reality check made him realize that he is still level 1. This is his second chance at life, so he really doesn't like doing that same work twice. The disgusting monster launched itself like a straight arrow towards our boy, ready to take revenge. But as soon as the degenerate shit closes the distance, its head was cut off by our boy's knife, sending it flying into the air with its body rolling on the ground. The mob is really angry at him now, they all took out their weapons and prepare for an all-out war. The corpse of the previous monster dropped a red crystal-like object. Our hero manipulated the drop, guiding it to his mouth and eats it. All the monsters watching him were taken aback. That shit came out from one of them and this dude casually ate it. Honestly, that'd be pretty disgusting to watch. With a sour expression on his face, our boy remembers this stinky taste, it is none other than a mana steel. He knows that future, and is aware that he needs to eat steel for him to grow stronger, no matter what kind of steel it is. Still doesn't change the fact that even the monsters find what he did disgusting. The status window congratulates him for having consumed a mana steel, a metal of the other world. It also states that mana will also increase after the absorption, and the expected increase in weight is still unknown. This made our boy extremely happy. It just means that if he eats all the items he comes across from now on, this life's difficulty will be extremely easy. Now that's all said and done, it is time to resume the battle against the monsters. Lee Hyunwook takes control of his bayonet and declares that the mukbang starts now. Before we continue the epic massacre, let's go back to what happened after the corporal reloaded his gun in front of Private Junmo. He informs the private that he can sense that metal is moving, which confuses the private because he was informed that Hyunwook can only sense the metal that he can see, which is actually the truth. Junmo promptly tells his corporal that he will make the report as soon as possible, but our hero replies saying that the branch office won't believe that an F-rank can sense something as complex as that. So, Lee Hyunwook says that he will go and check the situation and would like the private to stay on guard and wait for him, and to make sure that he never reports it to the higher-ups. If the military finds out, all the weapons will belong to them and he will miss his chance to get stronger. The monsters furiously charge towards him, wielding their blades that thirst for our boy's blood. In response, Hyunwook marched forward as well, masterfully controlling his bayonet to kill the enemies in the most efficient way possible. 
he does a barrel roll to avoid the attacks of the vanguards, allowing him to pass through the first line of defense. And with their backs wide open, our hero sends the spinning bayonet flying towards them. Being hit on their vulnerable spots, the monsters can't help but scream in pain. The experienced player meticulously aimed for the monster's feet, immobilizing them at an instant. While the massacre is happening below, one particular monster is watching from a tree branch. Seems like this is a high-ranking echelon of the particular clan of monsters. It has a more buffed physique and sharper teeth. Our hero seems to be enjoying himself tormenting the ugly fucks, taunting them to keep screaming while he takes their lives. Suddenly, one monster managed to get in his blind spot and is about to hit him with its blade. But our boy was quick to react, he put the influence of his power on one of the monster's blades. And uses it to parry the monster's sneak attack. Its weapon flew away from the force of the impact, and its hand was dislocated. Then while the fucker was looking at its weapon that was sent away, our boy skillfully cuts its throat with his spinning bayonet. The monster screamed in agonizing pain, but no sound was coming out, because its throat was slit open, and blood gushed out of every hole possible in its neck. Lee Hyunwook is deliberately making the poor thing suffer as much as possible. That way, it can maximize fear which would affect other monsters as well. With the drop of the mana steel, it is confirmed that the poor bastard has been finished off. He angrily tells the terrified monsters that he was killed from a stab in the back. They got the balls trying to attack him from behind, incurring his wrath. With absolute rage on his face, he declares that if one more bastard attacks him from behind, he will eat the fucker alive. Man, I don't even know who's the monster at this point. Such intense murderous intent coming from our hero managed to freeze the dumb monsters in their places. He has instilled enough fear into these unintelligent bastards. As the mobs start to lose their will to fight due to fear, our hero takes a look around and looks for the thing he calls the main course for tonight. His eyes swayed left and right. It was kind of frustrating for him to try and find it with his eyes. I guess in the past, he has learned other methods for detecting enemies. The thing that he is looking for is the cunning boss monster, who is currently hiding in the trees. Since the enemy is too reluctant to show itself, our hero needs to lay a bait. He sees the corpse of one of the dead goblins and pretends to defenselessly take it, giving the shaman a perfect opportunity for an opening. And sure enough, the hideous bastard fell for it. It immediately grabs one of the plates like things hanging on its neck to attack Hyunwook, making sure it doesn't miss this big chance. Our hero continues his ploy, casually leaning down to grab the mana steel on the ground. Unlike the shaman, all the other goblins just stand there and watch, still too afraid to do anything. The shaman hastily starts casting a spell using one of its amulets. Runic glyphs come out of it, indicating that it has been activated. Sensing the shaman, our hero lets out a sinister smile, one that is of a predator spotting its prey. Now he is just playing the waiting game until the boss finally shows itself. Thinking that he has the edge on our hero, the hideous shaman smirks, confident that he'll take down the enemy by surprise. After it has completed channeling its spell, the shaman breaks the amulet to begin the attack. As soon as the stone breaks, the ground starts to rupture, shaking our hero's foothold. But his face shows that this is within his expectation. He smiles merrily, knowing that he has finally got a hold of the shaman's location. After a few seconds delay, the rock spikes emerge from the ground, indiscriminately attacking anyone above. Even the shaman's underlings are caught by its spell. The attack is powerful, and the rumbling can be heard back at the camp. But it isn't too strong to cause a commotion. One of the soldiers feels a slight tremble of the ground and asks his platoon leader about it. But the drowsy platoon leader isn't going to let his peaceful sleep be disturbed by such a weak ground shake. He warns his subordinate not to wake him up again for something so minor. Back to the scene of the action, we see the lifeless corpses of goblins impaled by the earth spikes. Yet, Hyunwook is nowhere to be seen. All the remaining surviving goblins are shitting their pants at the sight of their dead comrades. I guess even though they lack intelligence, they still care about their own kind, except for the shaman who was the cause of all unnecessary deaths. The shaman stares at the aftermath of its spell. A huge cluster of spikes covered with smoke and dust is seen from afar. The dumb shit is satisfied with his work. He inhales fresh air, standing proud of what he has done. He was extremely happy until he hears a voice saying I found you, which immediately sends chills through his bones. Our hero's spinning blade attack clears the smoke in the surroundings, sending the sword flying fast straight in the shaman's direction. As it was about to hit the shaman, he deflects it, showing why he is the boss of the goblins. Hyunwook acts like his surprise attack has failed to patronize the shaman. Hearing this, the dumb piece of shit laughs, thinking that he has spoiled his attack. Our boy's poor acting is quickly halted as he reveals that the first attack is just a feint, revealing the bayonet coming in fast from the side. The shaman notices it too late, as it is only inches away from hitting him. This battle is done and over, too easy. Or at least it is what our boy thought. He is shocked to see the unexpected development right before his eyes. The goblin boss manages to grab the knife in the nick of time, leaving him with just a scratch on his neck. I guess he won't be called the goblin's boss for no reason. He has quite the ability and skills. 
Realizing that he was fooled by the sneak attack, the shaman is now enraged, bearing his fangs toward Hunwuk. Our hero smiles, he wasn't expecting the enemy to catch his blade, but he isn't impressed by the goblin's skills at all. Rather, he is disappointed with his past self for being this weak. The sneak attacks from the two are over. It is now time to fight for real. The shaman stands tall, convinced that he and his gang can take down our boy. Hunwuk tries to taunt him to get him to come down from his vantage point, saying that he will slice every last one of them in one go. In reality, though, he is in a bit of a pinch here. He is completely surrounded, and the boss is out of his reach. Since the shaman who was hiding earlier is now fighting him head-on, the other goblins come back to their senses and are now in high spirits. To make the situation even worse, a notification pops up stating that he has consumed mana rapidly in a short amount of time, leaving him with only 40% of mana left. The situation is proving to be of concern to our boy as well. He needs to be more cautious and efficient with his mana usage. Since it has come to this, he has no choice but to use his rifle. While our hero is thinking of methods to end this quickly, the shaman raises his staff in preparation for another attack. Left with no choice, our boy uses his gun to attack, which he prefers not to, since he wants to finish the shaman with his ability and eat its mana steel. But then, something catches the boss's attention. He smiles as he sees something that might prove to be an opportunity for him. Our boy was about to start his barrage when suddenly, a voice is heard from a distance. It was from Private Junno, who left his post to look for his corporal. Hunwuk was distracted by Junno and immediately turns around out of concern for the private's safety. The oblivious Junno casually shouts for his corporal's whereabouts, unaware of the monsters infesting the surroundings. Suddenly, the shaman orders his subordinates to attack the unsuspecting victim, and in an instant, all the goblins surrounding our boy leap off to charge towards Junmo. Hunwuk has no choice but to prioritize his soldier's safety. He takes his sight off the boss to assist the private. Junmo shouts in surprise as he sees the incoming monsters. One of them was able to close its distance and is about to slash Junmo in half. Hunwuk immediately orders the private to duck and get down. Just in the nick of time, the bullets manage to reach the attacking goblin before its blade touches the kid. Since our hero knows that bullets alone aren't enough to kill the bastard, he manipulates a blade to finish it off. But the goblin was able to deflect it with ease. These fuckers are getting good as time passes by. It's still not enough to defeat the man who was once called humanity's last savior, though, as he follows up his attack with a flying knee. Then proceeds to unload his magazine straight into the bastard's mouth at point blank. After taking down the first goblin, the fighting expert Hunwuk quickly turns around to face the other monsters. But not one soul is in sight, except for the private who is currently in a fetal position. The monsters all fled the scene, knowing that they don't have a snowball's chance in hell to defeat our hero in a head-on fight. Hunwuk grits his teeth in frustration. The enemies were more cautious than he has anticipated, resulting in his failure to exterminate them. Due to the sound of the gunfire, the soldiers back in the camp were alerted. They started asking about the situation on their radios. Our hero answers the queries, stating that a gate has appeared within the area. He adds that the monsters were confirmed to be goblins, which have just fled the scene after the first skirmish. He takes a glance at the shaking private and reports that there are no casualties in the fifth post. The headquarters acknowledges his report and orders them to be on standby and defend their post. Hearing the order, Hunwick knows what is coming next. She is going to arrive soon. The radio commands everyone to a five-minute standby for emergency, informing that a gate has appeared in the area. Then we see a red-haired woman getting ready for battle. She is known as the Ant's Paladin, Lieutenant Sio Yuna, a beautiful woman with bright red hair and deep blue eyes. Our hero is aware that if she comes, just like in his past life, she will stop the gate and take all the weapons. Any loot that they find from the drops of the monsters will belong to the military at that point. Needless to say what happens to legendary grade items. The legendary item, Adamantium. In the past, it was the ultimate item that made people call our boy the Steel Emperor. If he misses the chance to get that now, the next chance he will get is four years from now. If that were to happen, the same future will be inevitable. He needs to get it first no matter what. Hunwick intends to finish the gate before the standby team arrives. Time is running out, and our hero is thinking of ways to track the goblins. According to him, the monsters need a living human sacrifice. With that fact, he analyzes possible locations where the goblins might go. Private General regains his consciousness and is taken aback to see the corpse of the goblin. Our hero eliminates the possibility of the monsters going to the city for sacrifice, because their number is too low to invade such a dense population. Suddenly, the radio begins buzzing, a call from the sixth post requesting backup is received, stating that the goblins have ambushed them. The report gives our boy a glimmer of hope. It looks like he still has the chance to get the adamantium first. He grins from ear to ear, as he gets ready to move as swiftly as possible. He informs the HQ that the fifth post will assist the sixth post immediately. But the HQ scolds him. They know the capabilities of an F rank and deem that they won't be much help, so they insist that they stand by. But Hunwuk isn't having it. 
he would rather get in trouble later than lose this precious opportunity to obtain such a rare item. Genno desperately pleads with our boy to stop what he is about to do, informing him that this won't end with him being confined to the guardhouse. This disobedience is enough for a military trial. But our hero tells him that the sixth post is either full of archers or mages with only long-range players. They won't be able to handle the goblins and would die the instant the monsters get close to them. Still, this isn't enough reason for the private to let his corporal charge on his own, stating that he won't make much of a difference. But Hunwick has one good rebuttal. He says that he won't be going alone, since Junno is coming with him. The boy's complexion turns pale as he hears his corporal's words. I guess he didn't see that coming. The sixth post is starting to panic. They urgently need backup, and to top the predicament that they're in, their corporal Kim jong -ok is down. The goblins are wreaking havoc at their posts, and the only thing that the HQ can tell them is to guard their posts with their lives. At this rate, the sixth post will be completely annihilated. The soldiers barricaded themselves inside the guardhouse while the monsters are giving their all in an attempt to tear it down. Corporal Kim is badly injured. Despite that, he still uses his ability to enhance the post's durability with his skills, while his second-in-command is worried sick about his corporal's condition. Kim has lost too much blood, evident on his pale face. He tells his subordinate that he can't hold on much longer, and the barrier will collapse anytime soon. So, the second-in-command repeatedly spams the radio, asking for immediate assistance. Suddenly, eerie silence enveloped the atmosphere. All the banging and crashing that the monsters were dishing out, for some reason, stopped. Turns out, it was only the calm before the storm, as we see rocks and stones float in the air. It was the doing of the goblin shaman, casting an attack spell of telekinesis. And after the brief peace and quiet, a hail of rock storm flew towards the guard post. Stones of different sizes came crashing in, badly damaging the structure. The soldiers inside can't do anything but brace themselves. It is apparent that the structure won't hold on much longer. The corporal knew at this point that the boss monster has appeared to join the fray. He has foreseen the upcoming scenario. After the guardhouse is destroyed, the goblins will capture them, and then they'll raise them to the altar, then take out their hearts while they are still alive. Knowing their inevitable fate, the corporal decided to take up his arms and end his life by his own hands. That way, it would be less painful. The second-in-command can't do anything to stop the corporal. He also knows that their situation is hopeless. He can no longer hold his tears back. Another round of rubble is being prepared by the shaman once again. With a sinister grin on its face, the boss monster is aware that this would be his final attack before destroying the annoying structure completely. On the other hand, the soldiers' requests were answered. The radio states that help will be arriving now and commands them to load the bow and shoot the arrow aimed at the light, then stand by. The speaker adds that they use the fire skill when they use the bow and to just aim at the light. Even though there's a hint of doubt at the back of the private's mind, he still does what he was ordered to. It was their only hope of survival. While he is peeking at the window, he sees all the boulders getting ready to be launched at them once again. He states that he can't even see anything properly since the rocks are blocking the way, hence he can't spot any light that the radio was talking about. Then in a quick instance, a light shimmered from a distance, and the private instantly knows that it is that light he was ordered to aim at. Turns out, the one speaking on the other end of the radio is none other than our boy, Lee Hunwick. He tells Private Park to aim for the light and adds that he will be the one to control the trigger after that. With a flick of his finger, the trigger of the crossbow moved, shocking the soldier. The arrow launches straight to the light, passing through the floating rocks. The goblin that our hero was riding on was struck by the speeding projectile right in its midsection. Then after a short delay, the arrow exploded, effectively killing the bastard. That whole maneuver only took 1% of mana from our hero. It was our hero's plan all along. He acknowledges the destructive power of the archer, and with just a bit of his mana added, he can efficiently kill the monsters. But of course, the other monsters notice what has just happened, along with the down corporal and his private. The one who is most bothered by the sudden development is the goblin shaman. He realizes that the pesky enemy from before is back on his trail. He shifts the direction of the rubble towards our hero in an attempt to finish the enemy swiftly. The barrage of boulders came flying fast, but the only thing it has managed to hit was the poor goblin who is currently burning from the fire arrow. Hunwick was able to dodge in time. The archer was astonished to see all the rocks aimed at them disappeared. Then he was instructed to reload his bow quickly. He swiftly obeys the radio and reloads his bow. He was given the same instruction, to aim for the light. The goblin shaman came to verify if he hit the enemy. It is noticeable that the amulets he is wearing are now down to only two, indicating that he only has two spells left. All he was able to find is his beaten subordinate, about to explode from all the damages it received. The shaman seeds in rage as he failed to dispose of the annoying enemy once again. Meanwhile, inside the bushes, we see Private Junno sneaking his way. He was commanded by our hero to locate the whereabouts of the boss monster. He is debating with himself how he will signal his corporal once he finds the shaman without dying first. Then, he gets to see the aftermath of Hunwook's havoc. 
multiple goblins are running around directionless, trying to put out the fire that has engulfed their bodies. The private is amazed beyond admiration. The corporal only told him that he will distract the monsters, but this is more like him finishing the whole gate on his own. As he was lost in thoughts, he became careless and wasn't able to notice that one of the goblins is near him. He gets spotted immediately as a result. The hideous fucker screams as it raises its blade to kill the spooked private. Jumbo's jaw drops as he realizes that he made such a terrible blunder. But as soon as the blade was about to reach him, our hero's flying bayonet arrives just in time, saving the young private. Hunwook turns on his light, signaling the archer to aim, then he manipulates the arrow once again, striking the goblin right on the spot. Before leaving the private alone, the corporal signals him to ready his weapon, which Genno hastily obeys. The lad can't help but wonder if Lee Hunwick is really the same corporal that he once knew. The goblins fell one by one, leaving the shaman in great disbelief, but still, he ain't revealing his location just yet. Our hero is wondering why the bastard is still not showing itself when its whole army is getting picked on one by one. He then realizes the true plan of the shaman. The cunning bastard is waiting for our hero's mana to deplete, which seems to be the case, since Hunwick's mana is left with only 12%. While he was running around, desperately searching for the boss's location, he hears his private once again, asking for his help. When he turns around, he sees the goblin shaman holding Junno by the head, using him as a hostage. Our hero tries to use his flying bayonet to attack, but the cunning shaman slowly digs his pointy staff towards the private's neck, stating that he will kill his subordinate if Lee Hunwick tries anything funny. Our hero grits his teeth, with his subordinate taken hostage, his hands are tied now. The corporal raises his hands, giving the goblins the idea that he surrenders. Seeing this, the bottom fodders immediately surround him and try to attack. But as the goblins were approaching him fast, he thanks his private for delivering the checkmate in this dragged-on fight. With the flick of his finger, the trigger on Junno's gun activated. Now we get to see the reason why Hunwick ordered the private to hold his rifle like that. He was expecting the shaman to use the vulnerable kid as a hostage right from the start. The rifle began unloading its magazine on the ugly bastard. The fucker spits a huge amount of blood, indicating that it has received fatal damage. Corporal Hunwick instantly dashes towards the private out of concern for his safety, dodging the sneak attack that the other goblins launched in the process. The boss monster kneels down from the pain and lets go of his grasp on the private. Juntno informs his corporal that he is fine. Hunwick was elated to hear that. He smiles, knowing that he can now finally finish off the tenacious bastard. The shaman tries to escape, running away with all his might while holding his wounds, but he was immediately followed by our hero's flying bayonet. The blade strikes the monster in its back, but the knife just bounced off. Our hero clicks his tongue as he didn't expect that the boss is wearing a leather armor. Time is running out fast. Junno's mana is left with 9%. He continues to chase the fleeing bastard relentlessly, not wanting to let this opportunity escape from his hands. The shaman quickly runs towards the gate, attempting to enter it. At this rate, the boss will manage to get away. But then, our hero notices that the necklace the goblin shaman is wearing has some steel on it. With his last 7% of mana remaining, he pours everything he has to manipulate the necklace, stopping the shaman in his tracks. His mana quickly depletes, but it was just enough for his attack to land right on the fucker's face. As his reserve reaches 0%, our hero was able to make the goblin shaman eat his bayonet, killing it on the spot. Exhaustion and fatigue are finally catching up to our hero. He is aware that his ability still needs work, but his past body must be shaped to fitness as he gets tired too quickly. As he was catching his breath, a bright firework sets off from a distance. It is the signal of the holy light. That means that the main army has arrived, along with the ant's strongest player, Seo Yunha. Time is running out, and he needs to find the adamantium steel before the army confiscates every single loop. After ravaging the corpse of the shaman, he was finally able to obtain it. But as soon as he was able to get his hand on it, the soldiers arrived and ordered the corporal to raise his hands. Albeit the crystal still has goblin blood on it, our hero stuck it in his mouth and gobbled it with one gulp. The soldiers asked him to identify himself and tell them his rank and name. Our boy slowly turns around and did as he was asked. Thankfully, he was able to eat the whole mana. His face is covered with disgusting green liquid though. The soldier recognizes our boy and immediately went to his aid. The men inform the others to take caution since the gate is still open, indicating that the enemies must still be around. Yuna on the other hand, notices something strange at the scene. She wonders how could four regular soldiers take down a boss monster. Then she notices that the wounds on each goblin's bodies have similarities, coming to the conclusion that this is the work of just one man. I guess she's not the ant's paladin for no reason. Her deductive skill is top-notch. Our hero's system window informs him of the successful ingestion of the adamantium, which would take a whopping 10 hours to be absorbed. Nonetheless, our boy is satisfied, and he smiles as they carry him via a stretcher. This nuance won't escape the keen eyes of the paladin though. She wonders why our hero is laughing in this kind of situation. 
hinting to her that something is suspicious about Hyunwook. Our hero doesn't care though, the only thing that is running in his mind is that he has finally got the adamantium back, which would help him grow exponentially. Yuna wasn't able to dwell on her thoughts much longer, as other soldiers inform her that some goblins are spotted running away close to the sixth post. Meanwhile, our resting hero is now able to feel the difference in his power. Though it would take some time to fully absorb the steel, he can now sense the resonance of metals around him. Today is the day that the great steel emperor makes his comeback. Fast forward a few days after the barracks gate incident. Rumors are circling around about a certain F rank related to the monster's mysterious annihilation. They whisper about how the sixth post soldiers were basically waiting for their death when suddenly, an F rank corporal appeared and with a huge sword, sliced up the goblins. While other soldiers are talking non-stop about our hero's achievement, one particular officer is vomiting from all the rumors spreading around. It is none other than our favorite sergeant, Oh Sanguk, wizard magician of the specialty communication second squad commander. He refuses to accept that something like the rumor would actually happen. But one of his subordinates firmly stood and confirms its validity. Then one bulky officer commands the soldier to lower his voice. I'm guessing this one would be another F-rank bully. He scolds the soldier for lowering his hands while his sergeant hasn't accepted his salute yet. The terrified subordinate shakes and tells them that he will rectify his behavior. The poor soldier's name is Private Park and Ill, a short bowman of the 6th century post. Sanguk addresses the fat dude and asks if he, who can rip goblins with his bare hands, be able to take care of three boys and do a gate raid by himself. One sick replies that he absolutely can't. The sergeant seconds his answer. No matter how he thinks of a way, there's no way that a worker, much less an F rank, will be able to do that. So, he deems that it was all just a fluke. But still, even if it was just by mere luck where an F ranker went wild, it will become an issue for the military discipline. The fat ass takes this as an opportunity to mess with the corporal, saying that they can't let this incident become an issue for military discipline. It was a relatively peaceful day. The sun is up, and the weather is a blessing from above. Inside one of the battalion commander's rooms, a loud salute is heard. It was our hero, saluting the battalion commander and informing him that he has business to talk to him. But deep inside, the great steel emperor is complaining about them for not letting this incident slide. Lieutenant Sio Yuna, the black paladin of the paladin specialty, a B-ranker player, is also present in the room as well. Along with Lieutenant Lee Minhee, a wizard affiliated with the Magic Corps, a C-ranker player, with the specialty of warp. The battalion commander opens his mouth in a very authoritative fashion to intimidate our hero, asking if he really disobeyed the standby order. Then successfully, albeit forcefully, repelled the first round of the gate. This terrifying-looking dude is Major Kim Kangseok, also known as Namsen's King of Mountains, a B-ranked player, ranked 166th in the whole South Korea. Hyunwook is fully aware that if he says one wrong thing, he will end up in a military trial, and that won't work in his favor. He wants to at least not end up in the guardhouse. He didn't cover up anything and straight up told the truth, saying that he seized the gates outbreak while on duty and responded immediately. But the Major is having trouble comprehending how a mere f rank soldier can perform such a feat. Under normal circumstances, given his rank, he should have been ripped to shreds. This dude has no filter. Even though he was called the Great Steel Emperor, humanity's last savior, in the past, the pressure that the Major is emitting is still overwhelming for him. But if he steps back now, he can kiss his military life goodbye. With conviction, our hero states how he feels. He says that he feels like he has been scammed by the battalion commander. Lieutenant Min, he wouldn't let such a disrespectful response slide. But he was halted from interfering by the battalion commander. Major Kangseok wants to know why our hero feels that way. Our hero continues, saying that there is something that the commander has instilled in them ever since they entered the ant. The major is taken aback by his reply, growing more and more curious. You see, without fail, the major would always emphasize to the cadets that no matter how low their rank is, if they approach using ant's tactical textbook, even if they're E-ranks, they would be able to face trolls. And that is exactly what our hero did, according to him. He adds that the ones he faced are mere goblins, so it shouldn't be deemed impossible. He protests that although he did go against the command control center's order to wait, the six post soldiers would have died if he hadn't gone to support them. Internally, the great steel emperor is praising himself for dishing out a rational attack. It is now time to hit the emotional side. He then uses the major's words once again, stating that for a true soldier, there are no ranks, and they should be prepared for the worst and fight with all their might. To add more razzle-dazzle to his moving speech, our hero says that those are the words straight from the battalion commander's mouth, whom he so respects. He took the tactics they learned after their difficult training to heart and did his best to respond by carrying out the strategy with the workers with his life on the line. The only reason he could endure his military life while being mocked and looked down upon for being an F rank was because of the true military mindset he felt from the battalion commander. So, to see him deny the results of that belief, he feels like his entire military life is being denied, and that is why he feels like he has been scammed. 
let's have a quick glance at the life of the esteemed battalion commander, Kim kang -seok. Right around when he was appointed as a second lieutenant, the gates started opening. He almost lost his life during a fight with the orcs, but without a second of hesitation, he returned to the army and became an early foundational member of Ant. In other words, he is a soldier down to the bone. Our hero told him that he took his words as his superior, as his belief and put his life on the line for his fellow soldiers. A truly touching story. So, there is no way the major would send him to a military trial. The buff dude approaches our hero and squeezes his arms. His whole body is towering over the corporal. Our boy is getting nervous from the major's sudden silence and weird demeanor. Then, the major declares that the corporal has just become a non-commissioned officer. Quick, did you know, a non-commissioned officer or NCO is a military officer who has yet to earn a rank or commission. Such individuals still hold a leadership position within their units, but they rank lower than commissioned officers. At that exact moment, our hero's notification window informs him about the completion of the absorption of the adamantium, and he has acquired a new skill, steel physique. His total weight manipulation is now 2,558 grams. The two lieutenants were flabbergasted with the sudden decision of the major, with Yuna going as far as facebombing herself. But the battalion commander is dead serious, he is even tearing up after being moved by the heroic tale of Hunwuk. Our hero, on the other hand, sweats profusely as he wasn't expecting this kind of development, thinking that he bit more than he can chew. The scene switches to the 3rd Brigade, 1st Battalion Station, training room, where the soldiers are preoccupied doing exercises. One of them is our hero, doing some bench presses while cursing his luck. He is thinking that he stepped into a shitty situation while trying to avoid the guardhouse. From a distance, Private Wonsuk and Sergeant Sangak are looking at our hero. They look at each other and immediately come to an agreement to mess with the non-commissioned officer. While wiping off his sweat, he recalls what had just happened. Thanks to platoon leader Lee min -hee's dissuasion, our hero gained some time to think about the promotion, since there has never been an F-rank player who became an NCO before. But he would prefer to live like a mouse for a while and not attract attention. A little bit too late, though. Private Wonsuk approaches him and asks if he is done using the bench, which he clearly isn't. The two stared at each other awkwardly. Then Hunwick breaks silence asking Wonsuk what he actually wants with him. The fat ass says that he thinks that if the hot famous person these days only used this much weight, it would be an embarrassment to their unit. Then he proceeds to curl the barbell. The interaction between the two is starting to gain attention with other officers. And our hero immediately knows that this was all set up by Sergeant Sanguk. Our hero is aware that if he avoids him right now, he will openly start to bully him like in his past life. So, even though he has decided to lie low for now, he has no choice. He tells Wonsuk that his arrival is in perfect timing since he's feeling annoyed right now. Then, with an irritated expression, he invites the fat ass to do some sparring. Everyone in the gym was shocked, especially the two bullies, but this is the best outcome they could hope for to embarrass the NCO. News spread fast like wildfire. All the witnesses informed the other soldiers that Wonsuk and Hunwuk are about to fight. So, the soldiers gathered in the octagon, with the two all dressed up for the fight. Lee Wonsuk can't hold back his excitement about the match. He declares that it is time for the amazing Private Lee Hunwuk to learn some lessons. So, the crowd is all abuzz with anticipation, and here come the two young guns, chilling inside the ring, ready to bust out some killer moves. Now, Mr. Cocky Grin decides to take the liberty to throw the first punch, but my dude is not holding back either, he is standing there like a boss, fully geared up to dish out some serious punches. The hefty fellow swings his fist, aiming to hit the blue head with all his might, and man, that punch even left a trail of pressure. Now, we find ourselves outside, soaking in the beauty of this shimmering starry night. Two dudes are casually hanging under the streetlight, and out of the blue, one of them blurts out in shock about Choi Yeonjun taking a vacation. The dude with the green cap spills the beans, confessing he wanted to witness it firsthand because rumor has it, Choi's got the skills to be a legit sword saint. Then, the lady standing nearby jumps in to save Officer Chin's disappointed face, assuring him that even though Sergeant Kai Myung Ho is currently the ace, there is another dude in the mix, the future ace. And get this, he's got the barbarian trait. So, we have got Officer Chen Myongho, the tactical wizard of the Black Tiger unit, the most elite special forces unit in town, and yeah, good luck finding out more about them because their name is top secret classified info. This guy is disappointed but still holding it together with his warrant officer title. With a reassuring grin, the lady suggests to warrant Officer Chen that he might as well check it out for himself since he has made the trek all the way here, and going back empty-handed would be a tad awkward. Now, we are back in the arena, and it looks like our boy is facing some serious struggle against these incoming fists that practically look bigger than him. But hey, the dude's got some solid footing and is holding his ground like a champ. Here comes another giant punch, but our guy's reflex game is on point, dodging it like he is dancing with fate. So Mr. Fatass decides one punch at a time is not cutting it, and he unleashes a full-on barrage of punches. But fear not, my man's got it all figured out, dodging those punches like he is in a championship dodgeball game. 
just when things get chaotic, our dude startles, takes two steps back, and crashes into the arena's boundary net. The crowd holds its breath, but no worries, he is still standing strong, quick to regain his composure. But wait, before he could make his move, the fat fuck is already gearing up for another punch. And judging by our boy's face, it is like the universe decided he is about to get a serious reality check. Onlookers are in shock, recoiling in fear because this is not the twist they expected. And guess what? The fat dude's punch turns out to be another useless swing, landing on the boundary net, while my man skillfully dodges it like a ninja rolling on the ground. Finally, he is standing tall once again, full on stance mode, while it looks like the fatty guy is practically steaming at the ears, annoyed that our hero keeps slipping away. With nonchalant swagger, my man casually uses his fingers in a swift gesture, basically telling the fat dude, Come at me, bro, and you will not believe it, that finger move seems to be sending the fatty into a rage-induced meltdown. Round 2 is about to kick off, and the crowd is going bananas with excitement. Warrant Officer Chin and the lady have also made it to the scene. The lady casually drops the hint to Chin that the stage is set up like it is meant for him, and now he can witness the audition. At this moment, Warrant Officer Chin finds himself deep in thought and cannot help but question the lady about her take on the situation. In response, the lady coolly mentions that, despite appearances, the fatty guy's punches seem to pack a considerable punch. But, as we take a closer look, it becomes apparent that, fierce as those punches may be, they are not finding their mark on the blue head's face. The warrant shares the same observation, wondering aloud what is the point of being strong if you cannot even land a hit. Attempting to reassure the warrant, the lady suggests that maybe the fatty guy is just inexperienced. She adds that if he manages to land a proper punch, the dude standing in front of him is as good as dead. Now, let us shift our focus to Sergeant Sanguk who is practically shrieking at the top of his lungs. He's pointing fingers and throwing some serious shade at the fatty guy, accusing him of going easy on the blue head. With a stern tone, he commands the fatty to get his act together. The rest of the crowd is not holding back either. They join in on the screeching, emphasizing that this sparring session is no joke. They're urging the fatty to pull himself together, especially since some serious bets have been placed on him. However, if we peek into the arena, the fatty's perspective tells a whole different story. From his end, he is giving it his all, and at this point, he is practically losing his cool. Under the relentless pressure from the audience, the fatty guy starts feeling the strain on his body. It's like a sudden heaviness has descended upon him, making every move an uphill battle. Despite this, he decides to lunge at our dude once again, determined to make a comeback. Now, here's where it gets interesting. All the metallic elements on the fatty guy, from zippers to lace holes, start shimmering with a mysterious blue energy. Meanwhile, our man is seemingly manipulating this energy with his fingers, revealing a hidden power, metal control. Using his newfound ability, our hero makes every step for the fatty guy as heavy as it gets, turning the sparring ground into a metallic battlefield. It reaches a point where the fatty's feet are practically stuck in the arena's bed, but he is not giving up. Even from a distance, he continues throwing punches. Reality starts to sink in for the fatty, realizing he is in deep shit. Despite being in a literal hellhole, the fatty guy does not throw in the towel. He keeps on throwing punches, looking like he is sparring in a swamp, turning every move into an exhausting workout. Sure enough, this puts a smile on our guy's face and he is thoroughly enjoying the chaotic spectacle. Then, out of the blue, the fatty calls for a time break in the midst of battle. He raises concerns about his legs feeling a bit weird. On the other side, the my guy is just smirking, taking pleasure in the miserable state of his opponent. As the dude grins like the Cheshire Cat, the frustrated fatty guy grinds his teeth, calling him every name in the book. This is when the fatty decides it is time to put on a real show. Out of nowhere, he transforms into Goku, his eyes shimmer, and a cloud of dust starts to appear in his wake, as if he is undergoing a massive beefing up. This does brings a smile to the lady standing beside the warrant, and even the warrant himself is intrigued to see that the fatty guy has a hidden ace up his sleeve. As the scene zooms out, the once fatty ass transforms into a muscle giant, proudly declaring it as his berserker mode. Vines pop out all over his forehead, creating an ominous aura as he prepares to take down the annoying mosquito that has been buzzing around him. Seeing the situation escalate, the steel guy decides it is time to get serious and takes a formidable stance. Now, the sergeant is not just freaked out, he is downright alarmed. The sparring match has evolved into something beyond their usual domain, and what intrigues him even more is that the opponent before them does not even flinch or shake. From the warrant's perspective, this battle has transformed into a life and death match between two ferocious animals, an enraged buffalo and a leopard with hidden fangs. He's all in for it, finding the spectacle thrilling enough to continue watching. The lady is equally excited, noticing that the warrant is considering the fatty guy as a worthy opponent. She expresses that witnessing a berserker who can use body strengthening is a first in her life. Now, the giant fella stands proudly before the steel guy, tossing out threats that his opponent is as good as under six feet in the ground. In the blink of an eye, the giant monster disappears from his place and lands a direct hit on the steel guy's belly with such intensity that the blue guy decides it is time to crash into the nearby boundary net wall. In the crowd, Sergeant Sanguk is going absolutely bonkers, ecstatic to see our boy finally biting the dust. 
he cheers wholeheartedly for the fatty guy, adding a wild energy to the already charged atmosphere. Meanwhile, back in the arena, after landing a solid hit on our dude's belly, the giant's hand starts to tremble inexplicably, and steam begins to rise. The dude recoils in fear, wondering what kind of trickery is at play. When he landed that hit, it felt like he just punched Steel Bear fisted. The one who took the hit stands tall on his two feet, adopting a defensive stance that suggests he is more than ready for whatever comes next. Taking a peek at his profile card, it reveals that he is a rank D player, utilizing mana and temporary strengthening of body parts as his effects. Interestingly, the card notes that consuming a certain amount of high hardness magic metal can increase the skill rank, essentially turning a part of the body into steel. It becomes clear that his steel-like fists are the source of his sly grin and confident vibes. To add insult to injury, he mocks the fatty, calling him a pig and daring him to come at him. This further enraged the fatty, who starts shrieking at the top of his lungs, hurling insults and labeling him as a worthless F-ranker. The fatty guy lunges once more, but to his dismay, his punch strikes empty air. Seizing the opportunity, the dude on the ground looking for a chance to strike back. With determination, he starts turning his feet into steel, mentioning that using his skills like this is a waste on a guy like the fatty. Nevertheless, he does what he has got to do and strikes his leg with full force, causing the fatty to tumble down. Now, what was once a giant, cocky pig now resembles a chicken, taking a tasty blow to the face with sheer impact that leaves ripples around his expression. Finally, the fatty is on the ground, and the steel guy is relentless, throwing punches like there is no tomorrow. As the fatty guy takes blow after blow, the crowd's jaws drop faster than Sanguk's misplaced confidence. Warrant Officer Chen, grinning like a lizard who just found a cozy sunspot, probably never imagined that his neighborhood had a hidden beast, let alone a steel-fisted one. Meanwhile, our steel guy is punching the fatty as if he is trying to set a world record for the longest combo. In the Warrant's mind, it is nature's way, a cheetah finally catching its buffalo. But let us hope the buffalo learns to breathe again soon or we might witness a neighborhood wildlife documentary right here. Out of the blue, the pig decides it is time to strike back. With surprising agility, he grabs our dude by the collar, hoisting him into the air with his abnormally huge hands. A closer look at the fatty's face reveals a bruised spectacle, with one eye doing the limbo out of its socket, showcasing a lovely shade of purple. Grinding his teeth, the fatty hurls insults, claiming he has no clue what tricks this bastard is playing. As the scene transitions, we finally get the full picture of just how big this motherfucker's hands are compared to our poor dude. It's like watching a kitten being manhandled by an overenthusiastic toddler. At this point, the buffalo swings the dude into the air, preparing for a spectacular crash landing. On the other hand, the dude is now rethinking his life choices, realizes he is royally fucked. But our blue-headed hero is not ready to throw in the towel just yet. He clenches onto the giant motherfucker's fist like his life depends on it. Using his electrifying legs, he starts grabbing the giant entirely, catching the dude off guard. They're now only inches away from hitting the ground, and it looks like the giant one got zapped out of his mind, stuck in a deadlock and losing his proverbial gorilla shit. Meanwhile, Warrant Officer Chen is in full-on thinking mode. He's impressed that the buffalo guy, despite being a bit of a brute, has some impressive instincts, avoiding a move that could have broken his own arm. However, as he glances at our dude, he is starting to think that maybe he overestimated the steel fella. It turns out, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a barbarian using body strengthening is no easy feat. In this deadlock, where both are unable to move, the giant guy mocks, asking if our dude is really struggling that much for his life. So while he is getting all cocky, he then starts twisting the dude's body while taunting him about the uselessness of crashing his arm. Amidst the chaos, the poor boy is screaming at the top of his lungs. Yet, he refuses to go down without a fight and begins bending the gorilla's giant finger. The gorilla, now even more pissed off, is baffled by this relentless persistence. But, eventually, he decides it is time to release the dude from his grasp. Seizing the opportunity, our man, in a move worthy of a seasoned gymnast, grabs the gorilla's face with his legs and leaps over him. Swiftly, he places his hands around the buffalo's neck. Now, this giant motherfucker's neck is in the dude's hands, ready to be twisted to bring this chaotic neighborhood showdown to a potentially deadly end. Warrant Officer Chen, grinning like a lizard on a sunny rock, revels in the sight of the dude pulling off a rear naked choke. He's all pumped up, realizing that the beefed-up gorilla is now nothing more than a chicken. After all, body strengthening might pump those muscles, but it cannot protect against a compressed carotid artery. Despite the struggle, the stubborn bastard does not let go of his cocky tone. He taunts the dude, claiming all he needs to do is use his strength to break free. Little does he know, our man has already figured it out, his sly grin giving a hint of the impending lesson. Now, we are taking another look at the profile card. It is a reminder that the dude has the ability to temporarily strengthen a part of his body. Now, the giant motherfucker is stuck in the hands of steel, unwilling to let this lesson go untaught. As the system warning pops up, it warns him that he is pushing the limits of the strength and body transformation, using it in a wider range than his current threshold. Now, our dude is shimmering with blue lightning, a clear indication that he is giving it his all to take down this behemoth. 
However, the challenge proves to be more formidable than expected. Meanwhile, one of Sanguk's lackeys, in a fit of dry humor, turns to the master and suggests, knowing this fat is stubbornness, he might as well sign up for a lifetime subscription to the afterlife. Our steel fella, in the midst of this intense struggle, shares the same sentiment, wondering why this gorilla is so darn stubborn. With a determined gaze, he locks eyes with Sanguk, sending a silent message that this is a final warning. Sanguk, looking like he just stumbled upon a ghost, is sweating bullets, realizing he might have bitten off more than he can chew. Now, our struggling giant fella is sinking into despair, contemplating the unthinkable, losing to a supposed loser like our dude. His half-closed eyes scan the crowd, worried about the impending humiliation. After all, he is the future ace, and he is not about to let his reputation crumble. The steam starts pouring out of this muscular fella again, probably fueled by a mix of desperation and an overdramatic sense of pride. In the midst of the chaos, our man's eyes catch something extraordinary. The struggling giant's muscles decide to go for a growth spurt, tearing through the shirt like it is auditioning for a Hulk remake. It's like the guy activated another buff, reaching what seems to be his full and final form. However, the irony is that, despite these newfound supersized muscles, they seem utterly useless when it comes to matters of escaping a chokehold. His neck is still firmly tangled in our dude's hands. The lizard-like warrant officer Chin, now even more stoked, witnesses this unexpected development. Seeing someone in the D-rank using body strengthening twice as unheard of in his neighborhood career, he reckons that if the dude fails to get out of this chokehold, then it is still game over. Those muscles, apparently are as effective as a flashlight in the sun. The final question hangs in the air like a riddle, who is the predator and who is the prey? With the scene intensifying, the blue-headed dude presses the chokehold even harder, determined to settle the score. The gorilla is now losing his composure and is left utterly in pain, screaming like a banshee who just lost its favorite toy. In a dramatic climax, he collapses to the ground, taking our dude down with him. The showdown reaches its peak, leaving the crowd in suspense. As the dust settles, the crowd is left in a state of terror after witnessing this spectacle. Meanwhile, Warrant Officer Chen is grinning like he just won the lottery, reveling in the unexpected outcome. As it turns out, my man emerges victorious, standing there like nothing short of a beast, the undisputed champion of this quirky showdown. It's the middle of the night, and we shift our gaze to the training building. Inside, a bunch of guys nervously huddle around the buffed-up gorilla, checking if he is alive. Thankfully, he has just fainted, avoiding a knockout blow in real life. Now we see a curly-haired guy, towel in hand, sprinting towards our dude to give him the hug of victory. However, the nonchalant champion stops his advances with a bare hand, all while his gaze locked somewhere else. And there is Sanguk, trying to hide his sorry face, probably turning back to shield himself from the shame of the loss. While our victorious man is attempting to dig into the lost face of Sanguk, suddenly the warrant makes a grand entrance into the scene. He inquires about the name of our dude, and without hesitation, the champion salutes to his superior and introduces himself as Hunwick of the First Company. However, he cannot shake off the question of why this man is here all of a sudden. The warrant reciprocates with the same salute gesture, introducing himself as Lieutenant Ching Myung-ho, the raid tactics instructor of the Black Tiger unit. He compliments our dude for the impressive display of skill and might in the showdown. Without beating around the bushes, the warrant extends his hand and invites our hero to join the special warfare raid. At this point, onlookers in the background start losing their minds as they witness the guy receiving an invitation from the prestigious Black Tiger unit. A wise white head among the spectators remarks, did the scout just offer him a position in the Black Tiger unit? They're the best troops in the entire ant. And the other one finds it ridiculous. Our humble hero, feeling the need to clear things up, reveals to the warrant that he is just a lowly f rank player. In response, the warrant, brimming with enthusiasm, makes it abundantly clear that ranks are just standards set by normal people, and they need warriors like our dude. At this point, his inner badass is doing somersaults at the prospect of joining such an elite unit. But on the outside, he remains silent and conservative. He stares blankly at the invitation card, his mind caught in the whirlwind of thoughts as everyone around him seems to be claiming a stake in his sudden military fame. However, his contemplation is cut short when the warrant, perhaps sensing his inner turmoil, asks if he plans to keep him holding the card forever. In the end, he grabs the card, his thoughts swirling with the realization that he might get caught up in confrontations with villain groups later. As he salutes the warrant and assures him that he will look into it, it becomes evident that someone is already watching him. And this guy Sanguk seems pretty pissed off, confirming the fears our hero had about potential conflicts arising from his newfound military connection. In the tranquility that seems to have settled outside, our attention shifts to the battalion commander's office. Inside, two senior figures are sipping tea, engaging in a casual conversation. One of them, seemingly curious, asks the warrant about the current whereabouts of the Black Tiger unit. The warrant responds with a matter-of-fact tone, stating that they have been short-staffed lately. The other, a slightly anxious gorilla with a forced pleasant smile, reveals that these days guilds even try to recruit talent at the C-rank level. 
he acknowledges the struggles they face, emphasizing that after investing time and effort into training their talents, they often get taken away in the name of external appointments or other opportunities. A serious exchange of glances passes between the two seniors, as if they are rivals sharing the same mindset. However, the tension eases as the slightly anxious gorilla breaks into laughter, assuming that the warrant's visit must be related to Sergeant Choi in June. The warrant, wearing a broad grin, confirms this assumption with a simple yes. However, the mood shifts again as it is revealed that Sergeant Choi in June is currently on leave. Once more, the two seniors exchange glances, because they are seemingly competing to recruit on June 1st. Despite this rivalry, the warrant adds another twist to the plot by mentioning that, thanks to this visit, he has discovered another interesting soldier. It seems that my man has become the center of attention in this military chess game. As the warrant mentions this intriguing soldier, the scar-faced gorilla falls into a sudden silence. While this lizard is flexing with a grin of his own, the gorilla is lost in deep thought, his mind replaying the mention of the interesting soldier. Meanwhile, we shift our gaze to the towers on the mountains outside, where a mysterious voice calls out to our guy. In the middle of the night, when everyone is supposed to be asleep, our hero is running on the grounds, breathing heavily, with a man calling out to him. Unbeknownst to them, the gorilla is watching this scene unfold while engaged in a phone call. On the phone call, the battalion commander confirms his identity and proceeds to spill the latest gossip in town. With an air of confidence, he reveals that he has uncovered the mystery of what Corporal Lee Hyunwook used to do before joining the army. Back outside, the curly-haired dude is enthusiastically attempting to grab our blue head, who is feeling quite creeped out, and sternly tells him to stop clinging because this show does not revolve around gay drama. However, he's like a persistent puppy expressing his undying admiration, wanting to be the his sidekick. So, here's Mr. Gorilla, multitasking like a champ. He's chatting away on the phone, casually giving the go-ahead to handle Corporal Lee in some mysterious way. Talk about a casual chat with a side of covert operations. Now, over to our man, who's literally in the trenches. Despite buckets of sweat and probably a strong desire for a nap, he is powering through that run like it is the only thing standing between him and a lifetime supply of pizza. The struggle is real, but he is not letting that treadmill win. And here we have Gorilla again, making this whole situation weirder. It seems like he has got a major crush on our dude, giving him the eyes like he is the last piece of pizza at a party. As the camera zooms in, we catch that creepy, overly enthusiastic grin plastered on his face. He's thinking, it is not his charming personality, it is just that our dude is the hottest thing in this town. In the bustling streets of the country, people are going about their regular lives. Amidst the crowd, a little boy senses something strange. Intrigued, he starts running towards what he believes to be a monkey. As the boy stands before a dark alley, calling out to what he thinks is a monkey, it becomes clear that this creature is far from an ordinary primate. The boy realizes this as well, and fear sets in, causing him to tremble in his shoes. A closer look reveals that the beast has an enchantment circle on its forehead, hinting at some mystical qualities. It turns out this so-called monkey is not flying solo. He has got a whole squad of these enchanted creatures emerging from what looks like a portal gate. Back at the military base, our curious kid is up to something interesting. Picture this, he sneaks into the battalion armory, a place where every weapon from swords to slingshots seems to find its home. And hey, he is not alone in this arsenal wonderland. And there is also a scene stealer, a fiery red-headed lady. She spills the beans that the big shot, the battalion commander, is a virtually giving our guy a high five for his accomplishments. Now he is also getting days off and a weapon in the house. But, and there is always a but, the platoon leader is not exactly throwing a confetti party for our hero. Now, the image of the other eye-patched individual once again appears in his mind. Reflecting on the past, he realizes that he was too fixated on his previous life, and perhaps he has not changed as much as he thought. Acknowledging this, he remarks that whether the platoon leader believes in him or not is now a matter of the past. Turning to the red-headed lady, he asks if she agrees, but the lady gives him a silent treatment. And then, with a heavy dose of seriousness, she hits him with the big question, are you really a smug one? So, she goes on this epic tale about the sword marks on those goblin outfits by the gate. Apparently, they all look the same, signaling that our dude single-handedly faced the first goblin wave. She is like, does that even make sense to you? And raises an eyebrow. Finally, the dude grabs a sword that could pass for a piece of firewood. He starts strutting around, showing off like he is the hero of the day, and the lady's just standing there, totally dumbfounded. She throws a friendly caution his way, saying, hey, do not just grab any random weapon. I am backing you into a corner here. But he is all stubborn, insisting he is vibing with this one. The system window reveals that the wooden sword he chose is called the Cloud Blade. It has the ability to absorb water and release a wet fog. He acknowledges that it might seem like a useless and trashy item right now. However, he claims that in the future, Sergeant Choi in June becomes known as a sword saint with this very sword. The true name of the item is revealed to be the Dark Hand of the Cloud Master. In the Dangan mythology, there were three weather gods, the Wind Lord, Rain Master, and the Cloud Master. The Cloud Master's pitch black hand was called the Hand of Darkness, interpreted as blades hidden amidst the clouds. These blades, hidden amidst the clouds, were none other than the Thunder God. 
upon unleashing its full power. The Cloud Master's hand becomes capable of using lightning mighty enough to raid a mid-sized monster dungeon all alone. And the boy believes that with the combination of steel and lightning, nothing can beat him, and this time he is determined to wield this powerful weapon. But, the lady, completely oblivious to the epic lore drop, asks if he does not think the Cloud Blade is a bit scrappy for someone with his accomplishments. But our dude's like, nah, I'm good with this one. Time's ticking, and I cannot be picky. Just as they are chatting, the sirens go absolutely bonkers, grabbing the lady's attention too. The whole military base turns into an echo chamber of emergency sirens, and the rumor mill spreads like wildfire. Emergency. Iduan gate breakout. Soldiers start sprinting, yanking on their uniforms like it is a fire drill. Our dude, who was all chill a minute ago, is suddenly Mr. Serious. He stands there silently, looking like he is ready to drop some hero moves. Now, the red-headed lady's giving him the side eye, suspecting something fishy. Why is he not surprised? And seriously, why is he so calm? It's like he already knew about this emergency. Now, we are in the city, where the soldiers are on guard, making sure nothing funky happens. Enter a seriously stern-looking night lady, marching with her posse like she owns the place. Two regular soldiers, just chilling on guard duty, are totally gobsmacked. One states that, this is my first time witnessing the Blue Flower Guild in action. The other drops the knowledge bomb that the Blue Flower sent reinforcements for this gate backup mission. They start dissecting the scene, chatting about those flashy armors and designer level weapons. It's like the Blue Flower Guild raided a high-end fantasy fashion show. One soldier goes all in, revealing that if you could sell what you see, you would be able to buy a building in Gangnam. That's when the blonde dude spills the beans about his master plan. I am transferring to the Blue Flower after my service. Gonna spend my whole life flexing. Now, we see our dudes running his own little platoon, looking all commander-like. He reminds the soldiers that the vice president spilled the beans, it is cobbled gate this time. But hold on, these little buggers may be small, but they play dirty. Because they use poison needles and gas that hits you harder than fighting giant orcs. And casualties can stack up like a bad game of Jenga. Then, he singles out a soldier for a fashion faux pas, telling him no rolling up sleeves in the middle of duty. We're not at a beach party. But, of course, there is always that one soldier questioning the seriousness of it all, wondering if the kobolds will even bother coming this far. Our guy shuts him down real quick, making it crystal clear, this is not a drill. He even throws in a vivid image of kobolds gouging eyes out, just to drive the point home. The terrified soldier states no sir, and just when you think it is over, our man drops the mask bomb, and tells them to inspect those masks, because they are talking about poison gas protection in case things go south. Safety takes first priority, even in the midst of monster madness. Now, Blondie enters the scene, tossing shade like confetti. He shouts over to our dude, asking if his so-called trash unit is also having a strategy meeting. Then, he goes full on mockery mode, saying they might be mistaken for the support squad in a raid or something. The poor squad members, taking hits like champs, stay silent. You see, the support squad is like the benchwarmers of the game, composed of low-ranked players who could not climb the ladder. But our blue-headed hero gives Blondie the ultimate side-eye of scorn. You can practically feel the how dare you vibes. Without missing a beat, he claps back, schooling Blondie that many kobolds sneak away during the raid. He instructs him not to be all carefree just because they are at the back. And, so, masks at the ready folks. By the way, the red ground is that evacuation zone when the gate opens. Safety first, trash unit or not. But the blondie is not having sass. He snaps back, making it clear that he can handle himself just fine. Thank you very much. No need for advice from a sidekick. Blondie throws shade, acting like he is some high and mighty hero, not the lowly sidekick type. Our man shoots him another epic side eye because, seriously, who does this guy think he is? As Blondie struts away, our dude cannot let it slide. He throws one last reminder about the danger lurking. But Blondie just scoffs and states, Sure Mr. Squad Commander of the shitty squad. The rest of the squad members stay silent, like they have accepted their trash status. But our man is still fuming. Those bastards made a mockery of his friends and buddies, and he is not letting it slide. Trash or not, they are his trash squad, and he is not taking any crap from Blondie. Overflowing with frustration, our dude unleashes a verbal storm on his squad, commanding them to get themselves together. With a tone so spine-chilling, he hammers home the point that this is not the first time they have heard it. Or is it? He reminds them that this is not some virtual game, it is real life, where lives can be on the line, and growls at them to don't lose your spirit. The squad, feeling the weight of his words, responds in unison, a resounding yes, sir. He goes on, explaining the kobold's petite stature, emphasizing the need to target their emotional sensors in the sewers and narrow passages. He declares that there's no time to waste. You've got 20 minutes, and like the obedient bunch they are, the soldiers kick into action, ready to tackle the mission. The countdown begins, and the squad gears up for some serious cobbled confrontation. Corporal Lee calls out to Soldier Junno, and like clockwork, he responds with a hearty yes, sir. Private Park Junno reporting for duty. While the soldiers are busy with their tasks, they take a moment to gossip. One of them points out his fella if he has noticed Corporal Lee Hunwuk. 
he seems unusually anxious today. The other agrees, noting that he is exceptionally serious. With all the routes closed and the soldiers prepared, Corporal Lee Hunwick is on edge. He's staring at one soldier with a blank expression, giving the poor guy the creeps. It's like his gaze is trying to penetrate the soldier's soul. Feeling the awkward tension, the soldier musters an uncomfortable smile, asking, what is going on? It's like a scene from a psychological thriller and everyone's on edge. Out of nowhere, a needle shoots straight into Corporal Lee's neck, leaving him no chance to retaliate. Glancing at the needle, it is clear it is the poison work of those sneaky cobbles. The dude starts to crumble to the ground. Then, a poisonous gas bomb explodes, hitting the soldiers like a nasty surprise. They drop like dominoes, succumbing to the unexpected attack. But it is not just one bomb, there is a series of poisonous gas blasts in the vicinity. Most soldiers have now kissed the dust, while some desperately try not to inhale the toxic green cloud. A few soldiers, quick on their feet, scramble to put on their masks, attempting to shield themselves from the poisonous onslaught. Seizing the chaos, the cobbles take advantage, lunging at the soldiers, hell-bent on sabotaging them under the cover of the poisonous gas. It's a ruthless ambush, and the situation just went from bad to worse. Paralyzed on the ground, Corporal Lee can only watch in horror as his comrades are ripped apart. Then, a cobbled strolls down towards him, exuding a ferocity that screams big shot leader of the cobbled party. The dude's eyes widen in disbelief. This cobbled jerk decides it is time to pull a dagger out of his ass and launches his attack. And just when you think it is curtains for our dude, someone crashes into the cobbled out of nowhere. The abrupt collision accidentally cuts near Corporal Lee's eye, adding injury to the insult of the poisonous needle. The resilient cobbled, refusing to give in, rises once again to his knees, dagger in hand. Amidst the chaos, the injured corporal calls out to his comrade, desperately reaching for help. The comrade rushes to his side, handing him a mask, urging him to put it on immediately. But before Junno can attend to the injured corporal, his head is sent soaring through the air, body left behind in a gruesome display of blood gushing from the severed neck. Helpless, Corporal Lee can only watch in horror as his comrade's head flies through the air, the surreal scene terrifying him to the core. Now, the scene takes a shift to the present, where Park Junno questions Corporal Lee about the reason for summoning him. Here, we unveil the dark truth of our hero's past life. Park Junno is killed by cobbles while trying to save Corporal Lee. What we witnessed earlier was a glimpse into our boy's previous life. In the present, Corporal Lee, scarred by the past, is taking extra precautions. He instructed the soldiers to place sensors in every possible path, a move triggered by the traumatic events he experienced. This explains his overly cautious approach when Blondie was ridiculing them. Now, fully prepared for the impending battle at the rear, our hero is ready to face the cobbles head-on. We return to the moment where Corporal Lee was calling out to Genmo. In response, the soldier assures his corporal that he will follow any order Lee has to give. Corporal Lee informs the soldier that he will send a signal later, and when he does, the soldier is to take the squad members and leave the operation zone. The soldier, taken aback by this unexpected request, startles at the suddenness of the plan. Just then, a six-wheeler military truck speeds towards them, leaving the soldier shocked to his core. He mumbles, armed desertion. Corporal Lee corrects him, stating that it is not desertion, it is a war tactic. In the following scene, transmissions come in about cobbled annihilation from various squads. Beta Squad reports that Zone 2, B9 Cobbled Nest, is discovered. Outside a building, we see soldiers are fully prepared to infiltrate the nest, with over 200 cobbled spotted inside. The platoon commander starts giving a series of hand signals, a secret military language that goes over the head of anyone not versed in military nerdery. With that, they prepare to enter in a wide-range magicka formation, gearing up for the intense mission ahead. With a swift hand gesture, the squad marches through the closed door, completing their infiltration. Inside, they seamlessly transition into an a-formation, ready for whatever lies ahead. A command rings out to unleash the magic circle and stand by. Following orders, the soldiers activate their enchantments, fully prepared for the impending battle. Cobbled start to emerge from the shadows. In the blink of an eye, the entire place is now crawling with cobbles, swarming like cockroaches in the gutters. These furious beasts are not exactly thrilled to have uninvited guests crashing into their home without so much as a knock on the door. With a wild surge, the cobbles launch at the squad, their sheer numbers overwhelming to say the least. Yet, despite the impending onslaught, the squad receives the order to stand by. Following instructions, they hold their ground, allowing the giant cat-like creatures to make the first move. As soon as one bold cobbled attempts to touch the soldiers, the squad finally gets the green light to fire back. Instantly, they unleash their fiery might, guns blazing, turning those cobbles into crispy critters. The fire rages in every direction, burning any cobbled daring enough to step into its fiery dance. The battleground becomes a chaotic symphony of destruction with the soldiers wielding their might against the cobbled invaders. Outside, soldiers led by Corporal Lee are in action, strategically placing sensors in every nook and cranny of the streets. Zone 2 signals the completion of their attack, confirming that all sensors are successfully attached. Zone 5 also reports their success in the sensor-attaching business. Meanwhile, Corporal Lee is using duct tape to affix something to the floor. He's focused on his task when someone calls out to him from behind. 
Corporal Lee promptly salutes his senior, revealing that he is attaching motion sensors according to the manual and marking the relevant locations with aluminum tape. Blue Flower Knights proudly stand with their flags fluttering, showcasing their presence. However, an orange-headed individual, Lieutenant Lee Minwi, the Wizard Mage Class Specialty Warp C rank player, does not seem pleased with what Corporal Lee is up to. He makes it clear that the Blue Flower Guild is here to assess, not fool around over a cobbled gate. Lieutenant Lee Minwi further instructs Corporal Lee that the first platoon will commence its operation in 20 minutes, so the support squad should focus on getting the detox potion. However, Corporal Lee, straightforward as ever, makes it clear that the support squad's mission, as relayed by the vice platoon commander, is to prevent any monsters that might escape from the rear from entering civilian areas. In the background, other soldiers are visibly terrified as Corporal Lee unleashes his frustration at the top of his lungs. The orange head then takes awkward glances around him and starts grinding his teeth upon learning the true mission from Corporal Lee. In a display of superiority due to his high rank, Lieutenant Lee Minwi bullshits our guy with a cocky tone, reminding him not to forget his place just because the battalion commander showed a bit of favor towards Corporal Lee. In a display of superiority, Lieutenant Lee places his finger atop Corporal Lee's head, sternly questioning him about the guy in the barracks. The obedient corporal, like a well-trained dog, immediately replies, privately Hunwook, to which the lieutenant asks who has only one gate as real battle experience. Again, the response is, privately Hunwook. The lieutenant snaps at the boy, questioning the audacity to teach him and demanding that he wipe that look off his face. However, the boy responds with a polite no, sir. As the confrontation seems on the brink of escalation, a pink-haired lady soldier comes running, huffing and asking the second platoon leader if there is anything wrong. This lady is Sergeant Choi Siangha, a caster mage class specialist, and a heel C rank player. At this point, the orange-headed Lieutenant Lee Minwi is visibly losing his composure upon seeing the vice platoon leader. Words seem to escape him, and he is left speechless. This, however, is all part of our dude's grand plan. He provoked her into coming here because she is Lieutenant Lee Minwi's weakness. Seeing the vice platoon leader, the orange-headed lieutenant suddenly becomes all cozy and friendly towards Corporal Lee, as if they were buddies by birth. He reassures the pink-haired sergeant that the support squad seemed to be having a hard time assessing the site, and he was just reminding Corporal Lee of what a real battle is like. With a blush on his face, Lieutenant Lee asks why she is here. The clumsy lady immediately remembers and reveals that the battalion commander called for Private Lee Hunwuk. Now, our dude is left confused, wondering why he, of all people, is suddenly being called into action. At the site, tanks and four-wheelers have gathered, forming a formidable force. On top of a building, a commanding lady oversees the soldiers, standing tall as they await her orders. With binoculars in hand, she carefully observes the preparations, ensuring everything is in order. And then she spots two soldiers on the road below. And one of the soldiers is the pink head sergeant and the other is Corporal Lee. The sergeant reassures our guy, advising him not to let the second platoon leader get to his head. With a nod, he decides to leave the scene, as there is much more to be done. However, the lady gives him a playful twinkle in her eye and a sweet smile, suggesting that others will finish setting up the censors. She invites him to join her, and though he feels a bit reluctant, he has no choice but to comply with her wishes. Our dude is left terrified, with a looming threat and not much time remaining. He wonders why the battalion commander is trying to summon him and what she might want from him. Back at the scene, the red-haired lady stands tall, still peering through her binoculars. A soldier beside her questions if it is okay for their attack squad to be present in a cobbled raid, especially when they are under the battalion commander's direct command. The lady reveals that it is indeed the battalion commander's orders and makes it clear that soldiers are meant to follow the orders given to them. Finally, Corporal Lee arrives at the temporary command post, the battalion commander's spot, asking if he heard correctly that he was summoned. At this moment, the scar-faced gorilla and the lizard-like warrant are present. Corporal Lee is quite confused to see the lizard-faced lieutenant, though he senses a serious tone in the gorilla's presence. He cannot shake off the feeling of uncertainty regarding why the lieutenant Chen Myung-ho is here with the battalion commander. The battalion commander finally speaks up, revealing that he wants to put our dude to the test. He proposes that Corporal Lee take the place of Choi in jun who is currently on leave, and serve as the temporary squad leader of the first platoon for the second strike mission on the gate. Our dude is losing his mind at this unexpected turn of events. He wonders why the baldy is paying attention to him now when he never did before. Despite the confusion, he realizes there is no time for this and immediately addresses the battalion commander. He points out that he has only carried out missions with the support squad since his assignment at the base, and this is not even a drill. He expresses his confusion about why he would put the lives of the first platoon on the line during an actual battle. While the outside remains seemingly calm, inside the temporary command post, the air is thick with tension. The gorilla bluntly declares that it is his order, and our dude bites his lips, realizing he has to face the challenge. As they deliberate, the Delta Platoon reports that the boss monster has left the cobbled nest. The order comes to personnel on the second and third red rounds to stay alert. Our dude is on the verge of losing his composure, realizing that the cobbleds will soon attack the support squad. The urgency pushes him to grind his teeth, he cannot just stay put. 
The need to get out of there is overwhelming, no matter the cost. He decides to address the battalion commander, stating that he has something to say. The battalion commander, all ears, tells him to go on. Suddenly, a silence descends on our dude as if he cannot muster the courage to speak. Meanwhile, outside, the red-head lady continues peeking through her binoculars and spots a guy running down the streets. Now, the red-head lady is all confused, witnessing this unexpected development. The guy running down the streets is none other than our hero, Corporal Lee, racing as if there is no tomorrow. Suddenly, he screams at the top of his lungs toward his support squad, continuously running and shouting something about the gas. Right at that moment, the sirens start to buzz, and the entire place descends into chaos. Just like in Corporal Lee's memories, the gases start to appear out of the gutters. And, in the blink of an eye, the entire area is covered in this ominous green gas. Amidst this chaos, we find him all terrified, witnessing the event unfolding much quicker than he remembers. So, we are back at the battalion commander's temporary command post, and Corporal Lee is about to dish out some juicy details to his superiors. The gorilla gives him the nod to go ahead, and he starts off by saying he heard through the grapevine that this very gorilla lost his entire platoon. The battalion commander and that sneaky lizard guy lurking in the background are both pretty shocked to hear this. Corporal Lee goes on to explain that this is precisely why he finds it hard to believe that battalion command is now suddenly asking him to join a combat squad, just for a test, despite him being a lowly corporal in the so-called crappy support squad. He then turns to the battalion commander, his voice tinged with a mix of disbelief and frustration, and asks if they have started to look down on an ordinary soldier like him so much that they now consider our boy just another expendable regular soldier. But the commander immediately denies it, saying it is all just a big misunderstanding. That is when our man, with a straight face and an undeniably gutsy attitude, says that if it really comes down to following the commander's orders, then he would gladly give his life. Deep inside, he is getting frustrated, wrestling with the fact that he cannot just come out and tell the commander about the truth, that he knows the future. This secrecy is driving him up the wall because, truth be told, he has zero interest in leading the combat squad. In an effort to stir the pot, he decides to lay it out for the commander. If his lack of battlefield experience means commanding someone else's squad, then they are staring down the barrel of a very real possibility of high casualties. He does not stop there, though. He makes it crystal clear that while he is genuinely grateful for the battalion commander's high expectations of him, if the cost of validation is too steep, he is prepared to disobey the orders. The battalion commander is momentarily lost for words, unsure of how to respond to such a direct challenge. It is at this point that the warrant officer steps in, reminding our guy, Corporal Lee, that defiance during wartime is a capital offense, and he will have to face the consequences. The boy remains silent because he is well aware of the rules and regulations. However, his silence is not out of fear. He is more concerned about the fact that if he does not act, everyone in the real guard will die. Outside, everything seems calm for a moment, but inside, the tension is palpable. Finally, the commander speaks up and, surprisingly, gives in to the boy's wishes, saying that since he insists on proceeding with the original support mission today, he has the green light to go. Now, our guy is quite surprised to hear this, especially coming from this stubborn gorilla of a commander. But then, the commander adds a but to this agreement. With a stern tone and a somewhat cocky face, he makes it clear that, like a true soldier, our man has to deal with the consequences of disobeying orders later. Now we are finally back outside, where the entire area has already fallen victim to this green gas, and the sirens are going absolutely bonkers. There is our guy, doing his best not to inhale the poisonous gas, all while scanning the area with his eyes for his fellow soldiers. He immediately puts on his gas mask, and while he is at it, he is cursing those damn kobolds under his breath. Without missing a beat, he starts to pull out a sword from the enchanted inventory box. Now, this box is no ordinary bag. In it, you can load items from military supplies, and the number of items stored may vary for higher-ups and soldiers. He then pulls out a water bottle and starts to pour the water onto the sword. As he does, a system window pops up, giving all the deets about this sword. Its name is Cloud Blade, and its effect is pretty cool. The sword absorbs water and releases a wet fog. And just like that, the sword has started to absorb water, with the absorption rate hitting 25%. Now he is geared up, sword in hand and mask on his face, but he cannot see clearly because of the toxic gas enveloping everything. He wonders if he is too late, silently hoping everyone managed to run to safety. But it seems the cobbled creatures have already arrived on the scene, starting to slash at the poor soldiers caught in their path. And right in front of us, this soldier is just getting brutally butchered. As the scene zooms out, we see it is not just one, cobbles are everywhere, and the soldiers are putting up their best fight to beat these beasts back. Then, amidst the chaos, one soldier getting the beating of his life starts to shout for help, calling out to Private Park Junno. Hearing the pleas for help, one solider immediately turns around, his resolve hardening. He swings around with his gun ready to take down these cobbles, determined to save his fellow soldiers from this nightmarish assault. With blazing determination, he pulls the trigger, ready to take these cobbles down. But it turns out these creatures are not just mindless beasts, they immediately react to the commotion. 
and before the bullets can even reach them, they start to scatter from the scene, leaving the injured soldier on the ground. It looks like the soldier is alive, but he is far too injured for comfort. Amidst the smoke and chaos that is engulfing everything, the soldiers are doing their best to hold their ground. In a moment of quick thinking, one of the soldiers instructs the injured man to get inside the box and take an MRE with him. Just a side note, the military box is not just any box, it has basic barrier spells around it for transporting supplies and setting up camp in case of an emergency. Taking the opportunity, one soldier tries to drag the injured soldier out of this harrowing place. As he does, a gruesome trail of blood marks their path, a stark and horrifying reminder of the violence they have just faced. The vice president, witnessing this scene, is terrified out of her mind at the sight of this bloodbath. One of the privates tries to snap her back to reality, but the scene before her is just too gruesome for her to quickly recover from. It is then remembered that she is barely 20 years old, making her reaction all the more understandable. Not to mention this is her first real mission after her appointment which speaks volume. Private Park finds himself in a bit of a pickle too. He is not in a position to back up the support squad soldiers in this situation, adding another layer of complexity to the already chaotic scenario. Just when it seems like the situation cannot get any worse, one soldier shouts at Private Park, informing him that they are now out of ammo and down to their last rounds before the magazines run dry. The cobbles are swarming the area, and their numbers are multiplying rapidly. Left with no options and surrounded by the encroaching threat, the grim realization hits Private Park. They might not make it out of this alive. In a moment of desperation, he recalls something and starts to think about what Corporal Lee Hunwick would have done in this situation. As the chaos intensifies, another soldier shouts back, reminding the vice president that Private On Minty needs immediate medical attention. It is a dire moment, with the soldiers grappling not just with the immediate danger but also with the need to prioritize their wounded comrade. Fueled by a bright idea inspired by Corporal Lee, Private Park springs into action. As the soldier announces the grim news that they have run out of ammo, Private Park is still holding onto a weapon he has pulled from his inventory. With a sense of urgency, he shouts for the attention of the support squad. Reminding everyone that kobolds are obsessed with shiny things, he unveils his plan. He proposes to use the shiny objects as a distraction to lure the kobolds away. That will create an opportunity for the support squad and the vice leader to make a run for it. However, the vice president is not vibing with this idea and asks Private Park what he is talking about. Undeterred, Park makes it clear that this is his order as the vice platoon leader. He invokes Corporal Lee Hunwick's words, mentioning that the Blue Flower Guild is just outside the red zone, ready to unleash hell on these cobbled motherfuckers. With determination in his eyes, Park orders everyone to grit their teeth and run for their lives. As we glance at the monstrous creatures, it is evident the cobbles have no clue what about to go down. Private Park raises his hand, acknowledging that his pathetic electric powers cannot take down a single monster. Yet, in the end, the fact that he will use them to save people brings a genuine smile to his face. With absolute resolve and no fear of death, Private Park charges into the opposite direction, holding his shimmering weapon in hand. Every cobbled in the vicinity turns their attention to him, chasing him relentlessly. He becomes the star of this deadly show, drawing all the cobbles away from the platoon. Once he reaches a safe distance, he signals everyone that now is their chance to run. However, the soldiers are struggling to gather the courage to flee. It is a heartbreaking moment as they realize Private Park has willingly put himself in the line of fire to save their lives. At this point, it seems inevitable that Private Park is about to meet his demise. The cobbles are mere inches away, reaching out to grab his limbs. Yet, Private Park is not backing down. He is running full throttle, reminding himself that if Corporal Lee were in his shoes, he would use his so-called pathetic power just like this. He then imagines that if Corporal Lee were present, he might have used him as bait too. Just when it appears that Private Park is done for, a shimmering steel blade suddenly comes hurtling down through the air like a laser and starts cutting down the cobbles like cucumbers, turning the tide of the deadly pursuit. Now, the once fiercely disgusting cobbles have transformed into a juicy feast, while good old Private, completely oblivious to the meaty makeover, is still sprinting like he is being chased by his own shadow. But out of the blue, someone pops up right in front of him. He then takes a direct hit and goes tumbling down like a sack of potatoes. And behold, it is Corporal Lee, all serious, informing Private Park that he has heard every bit of the nonsense he was spouting while on his epic jog. But Corporal Lee is standing there all authoritative and defiant, wielding his sword like he is auditioning for a medieval action movie. The sword starts doing its thing, releasing a wet fog that wraps around the entire area. And voila, this magical fog seems to be neutralizing the toxic gas, casually strolling around like it is on a mission to make everything smell like a fresh morning breeze. So, as Corporal Lee strikes a pose that could rival any action hero, it finally dawns on Private Park that this cool cat is none other than his fellow soldier in action. With a grandiose flourish, Corporal Lee dramatically belts out Private Park's name. Now, poor Private Park is all kinds of terrified. He stammers and mumbles, desperately trying to convince Corporal Lee that it is all a big misunderstanding. He was just doing a spot on impression of the corporal and things got a tad out of control. But instead of scolding Private Park, Corporal Lee surprisingly praises him. 
you heard it right. He throws a hearty thanks at him for being alive, all with a grin as wide as the Grand Canyon. Now, tears well up in Private Park's eyes, moved by this unexpected moment of appreciation. Meanwhile, these kobolds clearly did not get the memo about sentimental reunions. They are still marching towards our dynamic duo, fueled by the same energy as if they are on a mission to crash the emotional party. Once again, wearing a grin that could light up the darkest dungeon, Corporal Lee declares his genuine pride in Private Park. He goes on a gratitude spree, commending the guy for his noble courage. Then, with an eager glint in his eyes, Corporal Lee turns his attention to the approaching horde of kobolds. He is practically rubbing his hands together with excitement, ready to unleash a symphony of sword slashes on those little troublemakers. With that same broad grin, he announces that this is exactly the kind of party he was hoping for, a grand buffet of hack and slash. He is all in, ready to devour every last one of those kobolds with everything he has got. And so, the slashing spectacle kicks off. Corporal Lee is dicing and slicing those kobolds left and right, as if he has found the ultimate stress relief therapy. He is just chilling in one spot, twirling his sharp blade like it is a ninja's whip, turning approaching kobolds into a smoothie. It is like they wandered into a blender and did not read the warning label. Now, as we glance at the ground, the fallen kobolds have left behind some shiny stones they were holding onto. My man's eyes light up with excitement, ready to savor the flavor of every single one. Meanwhile, Private Park is standing there, utterly confused, wondering what in the world is delicious about these monster pebbles. He throws a frustrated side eye towards Private Park because, let us face it, munching on essence stones in the presence of Private Park is a strict no-go. It seems the kobolds have finally hit the brakes, maybe realizing they are on a one-way ticket to kobold Valhalla. My man shoots them a curious glance, wondering aloud where their big boss is hiding. Suddenly, the enchantment emblem on the kobold's head starts to shimmer, as if they are being summoned. The realization finally dawns on Corporal Lee, and now he is in disbelief. The kobolds, as if on cue, start turning around. Corporal Lee is standing there in disbelief, while Private Park is still clueless about what the heck is going on. Then, like they have just remembered they left the oven on, the kobolds start heading back in the opposite direction. Now, Corporal Lee kicks into high gear, sprinting after the retreating kobolds like his life depends on it. He immediately yells at Private Lee to hustle before these little buggers put the entire squad in jeopardy. Meanwhile, back on the rooftop, the lady in charge orders the attack squad to hold their ground and shoot down any kobolds escaping the gas zone, coordinating with the Blue Flower Guild to make their way to Cavillion. A nearby soldier nods in understanding. However, he throws a curve ball, asking the lady if she is planning to head somewhere herself. Now, the lady is really suspicious of Corporal Lee's peculiar behavior, because he was giving off vibes as he knew already that this is going to happen. So she casually responds that she has something she needs to confirm. And just like that, she nonchalantly leaps off the fifth floor building, descending with the grace of a cat dropping from a pot, landing amidst a swirl of green smoke. Now, we are back in the chaotic battlefield where the vice president is losing her cool, and Private Minty is on the brink of joining the unconscious squad if he does not get healed pronto. While other soldiers are busy patching up their injured comrades, suddenly, their box formation is getting shredded. The boss monster enters the scene, tearing apart their carefully crafted formation. The ordinary soldiers are putting up a valiant fight to maintain their grip on the formation. But lo and behold, there is this one kobold who is busting out some magical moves, giving the soldiers a run for their money. He seems to be the ferocious type, so no rocket science needed to figure out he is the kobold boss. But seriously, I was picturing their boss to be a hulking giant rat, not some magical wizard pulling tricks out of his non-existent sleeves. Finally, he succeeds in tearing down their box barrier, and like a swarm of cockroaches crashing a party, the other lucky kobolds join the scene. Judging by the hunger in their faces, it is crystal clear these guys are in the mood for some fresh human meat. The soldiers, now partially in panic mode because they are fresh out of ammo and surrounded by these hungry monsters, are practically on the verge of turning their pants into a tactical retreat. Suddenly, the boss monster perks up, noticing something unusual. The scene zooms out, revealing silhouettes emerging from the wet fog my man is producing with his sword. And the other is Private Park both running side by side. The boss monster's alarm bells start ringing, realizing this is not going to be a walk in the park. Seizing the opportunity, my man hurls down his blade with all the force in his arsenal. The sword hurtles directly toward the boss, but with the reflexes of a caffeinated cat, the boss takes a step back, narrowly avoiding a direct hit. Much to the monster boss's surprise, the blade pulls a magical stunt, changing its trajectory like it is auditioning for a wizardry show, chasing its target like an automated missile. However, just before it can land a hit, the nimble cobble takes a swift step down, avoiding the direct impact once again. While evading, it takes a tumble but effortlessly regains its footing as if it is a walk in the park. A little victory dance turns into a frown when the kobold realizes the jar it was holding has been pierced by the blade and is now leaking out. Pissed off to the core, he telepathically commands his lackeys to attack our dynamic duo. And so, they launch themselves toward Corporal Lee in Private Park. Now, Corporal Lee's alarm bells are ringing loudly as he finally grasps the gravity of the situation. The kobolds, plotting a sneaky attack, take a step back and find their footing. 
keeping a safe distance, they start blowing poisonous darts like it is a twisted party trick. In the blink of an eye, hundreds of those tiny needles are zooming toward Corporal Lee in Private Park. But fear not, my man takes a superhero stance, hurls down his sword, and not a single needle makes its way to our dynamic duo. But hold your applause because here comes round two, another batch of the same poison needles heading their way. This time, Private Park is right in the line of fire, ready to take the hits. But Corporal Lee immediately screams at the top of his lungs, telling the guy to get down. Sure enough, Private Park immediately leans downward, narrowly avoiding the incoming needles. Now, the window system pops up, reminding us that Corporal Lee boasts a metal control ability, and the current controllable metal weight is a hefty 29.59 grams. However, there is a warning flashing. The metal control transition speed is a tad too fast for our guy's current ability. Anyway, priorities first. Corporal Lee ensures that no needle touches his friend or himself. With a swift motion, he deflects all the needles that came their way, sending them off in different directions. Talk about turning poison darts into a deadly game of dodgeball. But here comes another curva ball. A warning blinks, indicating my man has lost control of the M7 greatsword. And now the blade is doing its own whimsical dance in the air. Now suddenly the cobbled eyes lands on something unexpected. Here we witness Corporal Lee, now with a gun in hand, unleashing a barrage of bullets towards the kobolds. It dawns on him, this particular kobold is not just any ordinary commander, he is literally the puppet master controlling the whole kobold squad. The realization hits hard, scaring them off will not buy any time, and engaging in a full-blown battle with these little troublemakers is way too perilous, especially with Private Park as his sidekick. It is time for some strategic thinking and maybe a tactical retreat. So, with a quick decision to retreat, Corporal Lee leads the way into the safety of the box formation. Private Park, looking a bit clumsy but determined, and Corporal Lee are doing their best to reach the box in record time. However, those pesky cobbles are relentless, throwing their poisonous darts once again. Now, they are just a few feet away from the box, but before they can make it to safety, the darts are closing in, mere inches away from hitting their mark. Quick on his feet, Corporal Lee utilizes his metal manipulation once more, successfully diverting the needles away from their tragic trajectory. With a nimble jump, Private Park finally makes it inside the safety of the formation. Corporal Lee also takes a step behind him, sealing the box and leaving those persistent cobbles out in the cold. At this point, the darts are futilely hitting the force field of the safety formation, unable to penetrate through. The cobbles, clearly displeased by this unexpected setback, are starting to get riled up. To really get under their scaly skin, my man decides to flex his funny grin at the cobbles, as if he is practically trying to provoke them. It is like he is throwing a little insult party just for them. Inside the formation, we see soldiers tending to their injured comrades while the vice president is having a meltdown on the side. The other injured souls start to kick back a bit upon seeing Corporal Lee finally back in action. Immediately, Private Park turns to Corporal Lee and breaks the news, Private Minty has lost consciousness. It is a serious situation amidst the chaos. Corporal Lee shoots them a doubtful glance, wondering what on earth they are talking about. After all, they have got the vice president, who is considered the best healer in town. However, it becomes apparent that the lady is going through a full-blown breakdown and is too terrified to even move or flinch. Corporal Lee, now with a hint of sternness in his tone, asks her what the heck she is doing. Private On Minty is on the brink of departing for the heavens, and every second counts. Unfortunately, she is in the midst of a panic attack, and to make matters worse, she is the sole healer in the state, the last hope for their injured comrades. It is a desperate situation, to say the least. Corporal Lee gives her an even more terrifying glance, a silent plea for her to snap out of it. Then, he takes a deep sigh and addresses the vice president by her name. Immediately, the lady seems to come to her senses, likely starting to wonder what is going on. As she lifts her gaze, she sees Corporal Lee towering above her, sternly telling her to come back to her senses. The stakes are high, and everyone's lives are hanging in the balance in the midst of this battle. It is a wake-up call for the healer-in-chief. Now, he urges her to snap back if she does not want to live with the regrets of not helping her comrades throughout her life. Drawing from personal experience, Corporal Lee shares how horrifying life becomes when burdened with lingering regrets. Finally, his words seem to weave a magic spell, gradually sinking into her previously clouded mind. As the magical enchantment unfolds, the kobolds in the distance observe the spectacle with keen eyes. Inside the formation, we see the vice president finally snaps back to reality and starts channeling her magical abilities, ready to perform wonders and heal the wounded soldiers. At last, we see a moment of hope amidst the chaos. The story resumes, and while the vice president is fully engaged in healing, Corporal Lee inquires about the soldier's well-being. She then reveals that he has lost a significant amount of blood due to being late. But, she is all determined not to give up on saving him. In response, my man throws her a pleasant thank you with a warm smile. Now, he decides to borrow all the blades from his fellow soldiers and starts manipulating them with his abilities. Private Park, in complete disbelief, questions Corporal Lee, wondering if he is actually planning to face those bastards head-on. 
grinding his teeth out of frustration. Corporal Lee makes it crystal clear that he is itching to give those creatures a taste of their own medicine. Now, the scene shifts, and we see someone of high authority cruising down the highway in their luxury car. Meanwhile, the lady, after taking a phone call, abruptly cuts it. It becomes evident that she is quite fond of spiders, as we can see one casually chilling around on her shoulder. As we take a full look at her, we see the lady sitting there gracefully, mentioning a plan to pay a visit for some consolation. There is an air of mystery and authority around her, making it clear that she is not one to be taken lightly. On her way, she instructs her driver to head to Itiwan. Now, we are back in the arena where my man is casually strolling through the green smoke, supported by the daggers that seem to dance around him. He stumbles upon the mark he made with the duct tape before the kobold attack. As he stands there, we see the kobolds are gearing up for the impending action against our formidable guy. At this point, the boss monster, in particular, is grinding his teeth at the mere sight of our boy. Telepathically, he commands his lackeys to get ready for the showdown. Meanwhile, he is still standing over the duct tape mark, his daggers floating around him, providing a full-blown cover from every possible angle. With a devilish grin etching on his face, it is apparent that the prey has walked right into the perfect hunting spot, and the night is about to get a whole lot crazier for him. Shifting perspectives, we take a full look from above, revealing that this place is the center mark where he strategically set up boxes and sensors at the desired location. The only margin of error is a section of Area A, commanded by Vice President Choi Sianha, the pink-haired lady. Now, he is all fired up, realizing that it is game over once he gets his hands on the kobold's leader, the puppet master pulling the strings from behind the scenes. Right on cue, he whips out his metal detector and scans the entire area, revealing the whereabouts of every sneaky kobold lurking in the shadows, just waiting to pounce on our unsuspecting hero. And any metal he does not recognize outside of this area must be those pesky kobolds up to no good. Finally, the showdown kicks off, and he readies his daggers, manipulating them with his metallic powers. Then, just as things get intense, the system window pops up again, dropping the deets about the consume effect. Apparently, munching on metal and absorbing it increases the weight he can control. And currently, he is in command of a whopping 2,959 grams of metal mayhem. Finally, he hurls his blades in every direction, aiming at the anticipated lurking kobolds like he is auditioning for a knife-throwing circus act. Meanwhile, the kobold leader has starting to catch wind of our guy's master plan. The blades swing into action, piercing through those kobolds one by one like they are cutting through a cake at a birthday party. Now, these creatures are groaning in pain, and their green blood which is surprisingly stylish color for blood, is gushing out with every blade hit. Suddenly, one blade gets a personal vendetta against the kobold leader and turns toward him. It is like the blade has a score to settle, and it is not taking no for an answer. But hold on, the kobold leader is not about to kick back and watch his comrades getting chopped down like vegetables. He kicks into full wizard mode, unleashing his magical prowess. He then tries to snatch the floating sword with his magical energy, and would not you know it, he successfully grabs the blade like it is a mid-air game of catch, magical style. But wait, Corporal Lee was way ahead of the game. It is like he had a crystal ball for situations like these, predicting it with the precision of a ninja fortune teller. Without missing a beat, he hurls a batch of blades towards the poor kobold, who is already tangled up with one blade like a badly wrapped present. These blades are coming from practically every direction, and this kobold is standing there like he is the designated target for a medieval knife-throwing carnival act. Just when you think it is game over for our screeching kobold friend, he lets out a scream that could wake Super Saiyan 4 before Goku even gets a chance. Corporal Lee's eyes widen in disbelief, as if he has just witnessed Superman himself dropping into the scene. As the scene zooms out, shockingly, the kobold has somehow managed to grab all five of the blades that were coming at him. Now, this kobold seems to be beyond angry. In a move that is either brave or just plain foolish, my man decides to taunt the already furious creature by flaunting his hand gestures, attempting to manipulate those daggers further. He kicks it up a notch by using his power of steel manipulation, all while trying to sweet-talk the kobold into giving back his precious daggers. But then, out of nowhere, the system window decides to chime in with a reality check, warning him that his daggers are bound by a force even higher than the weight he can control. Now he is startled, like someone who just realized their superpower is not as super as they thought. And the kobold seizes the opportunity to unleash his lackeys. They get the signal from their boss to attack, and without wasting a single moment, these kobolds start launching needles at our poor guy. Before he can even process what is happening, a needle arrives from behind, ready to plant a not-so-friendly kiss on his back. He finally turns around, only to realize that he is in a tight spot. Let us just say things are looking a bit dicey for our hero. Now, he bravely stands there, taking the barrage of needles directly on his body like it is some weird initiation ceremony for the Needle Lovers Club. The air is so thick with tension you could cut it with one of those fallen daggers, and the kobolds are watching with bated breath, wondering if our guy is now officially a human pincushion. As if on cue, the daggers decide to retire early, falling lifelessly to the ground as if our guy suddenly lost control over them. The kobold boss, looking as confused as a cat watching a magic trick, 
takes a moment to process what just happened. Suddenly, he snaps out of his confusion and immediately directs his lackeys to lunge at our guy. Without missing a beat, all the cobbled start charging toward the dude who just took a rain of poisonous needles like he is the lead in some bizarre, deadly parade. It is safe to say things are about to get wild, and our hero might need more than just luck to get out of this one. As we zoom in, it turns out the needles landed on his hands, but quick thinking saved the day. He transformed his hands into steel right before they could turn him into a human pincushion. Now, he is grinding his teeth, fuming, more determined than ever not to let this life end like his previous one. Standing up, he casually shrugs off all the needles pinned on him like it is just a pesky mosquito bite. Behold, his steel muscles are now on display, the unsung heroes that just saved his behind from an untimely demise. With a triumphant move, he retrieves his daggers, and now they are spinning in the air like he is auditioning for a knife-throwing circus. Our guy is beyond pissed, it is like these kobolds just stomped on his very last nerve. The kobolds launch towards him, ready to take him down, and, on the flip side, the daggers are coming right at him. With a booming voice and a dramatic hand gesture, he screams for everyone to get lost. The daggers respond to his fury, slashing through the air with a vengeance. They move so fast around him that it is like a tornado or maybe a blender, and the kobolds are getting cut left and right like cucumbers in a salad. This spectacle of sheer strength is so intense, you can practically see it from far away. Finally, after an intense showdown with those pesky rats, he stands amidst the settling dust, looking like a warrior straight out of a metal album cover. The kobold leader is having a reality check, wondering what just hit him. He directly calls out to this motherfucker of a cobbled mage and, with determination in his eyes, he tells him it is time to settle the score. And so, the cobbled decides it is time to get serious, taking an offensive stance while simultaneously unleashing a mysterious green gas from his jar, setting the stage for this impending battle. On the other side stands our guy, surrounded by the swirling green gas. Unfazed, he whips out his sword, conjuring a wet fog that pours out to counter the poisonous effects of the cobbled's gas. Amidst the thickening smoke, he reminds the wizard cobble that he has put a lot of effort into ensuring a fair and square match, and he is not vibing with this smoke disguise idea. Now, armed with his trusty metal detector, he starts scanning the surrounding area. Even in this dense fog, it is as clear as day to him where this tricky cobbled is standing. It is like he is playing hide and seek, but our guy brought a cheat code in the form of high-tech metal detection. Now, having learned a thing or two from past confrontations, our guy believes it is too reckless to throw the daggers at the cobbled like last time. He is aware they will just get trapped, so he has to tread carefully. Taking a closer look at the cobbled, he notices something unusual, the wizard is strangely firm on his feet, not making any movements at all. As our boy takes a look down, a shimmering red energy descends towards him, aiming to catch him off guard. On the other side, the cobbled is stretching his magical energy as far as possible, attempting to reach our guy. Finally, the energy whips extend and grab Corporal Lee by the leg, causing him to take an unexpected tumble to the ground, courtesy of the cobbled's energy whip. Now fully geared up for revenge, the cobbled lifts our guy from the ground and elevates him into the air, going higher and higher into the sky. With a fierce flick, he hurls our guy forcefully from above, sending him crashing into the ground below, creating a cloud of dust in his wake. The cobbled starts feeling victorious and starts laughing like a maniac, thinking he just hit the jackpot. The fucker stands confidently, sporting a grin of triumph. But much to his surprise, his joy is cut short when he hears our guy calling out to him from the midst of the chaos. Now, our man's had enough of playing the hero, he is ready to embrace the role of the villain in his own story. Why? Because he simply cannot tolerate a pesky rat of a cobbled laughing at him. As we take a peek at his legs, they have transformed into steel before he could even hit the ground. Despite bleeding from his mouth, he is on fire, not just from the fall, but from the sheer determination to end this conniving cobbled who keeps dragging him through the depths of hell, reminding him of his previous life again and again. On the other side, the cobbled is still spouting mad noises from his mouth, fueled by anger that matches our guy's. He then vanishes from his spot like a flash, but this time, he is not going anywhere unnoticed by our guy's keen eyes. On the flip side, the cobbled is tearing through space at lightning speed, rushing down toward our fella. In a blink, he appears behind our boy, readying his dagger to catch him by surprise. However, our man, showcasing his lightning quick reflexes, effortlessly dodges the attack by taking a step back and firmly planting his feet on the ground. Now, he is even more pissed, not just from the attack, but also from the audacity of this little rat trying to strike from behind. He hurls down his sword right back at him, all the while telling him that getting stabbed from the back is the thing he despises the most. However, this cunning bastard of a cobbled counters with his own dagger, but the expression on his face reveals that he is finding himself in a tight spot. Now, Corporal Lee channels his body strength into his legs, turning them as hard as steel, and delivers a devastating blow to this bastard's face. The cobbled is sent soaring through the air, crashing and bouncing on the ground like a pebble in a water pool with no breaks. While this sorry excuse for a rat wizard lies on the ground thoroughly beaten, Corporal Lee makes it abundantly clear that he has envisioned this very moment for a long time. Finally, he is having his revenge against cobbled backstabbers like him. 
leaning over the battered cobble. He states with a mix of triumph and righteous anger that this little rodent is the first one to meet his end at his hands. He even throws in a sarcastic note, telling this creature to feel honored for being the pioneer in this grim lineup. With that mask crushed beneath his boot, my man is grinning like a boss. The battered bastard on the ground can no longer use that crappy magic, and Corporal Lee is ready to cure his past trauma by taking his revenge. He hurls his daggers at the cobbled, and like boomerangs, they come back slicing down this rat from every direction. The dagger this creature once held is now on the ground, and his smoke jar has turned into rubble. Despite the thousand cuts, the rat motherfucker surprisingly still clings to life. Undeterred, Corporal Lee grabs him by the mouth, preparing his sword like a devil about to strike the final blow to this cobbled's head. It is payback time, and it looks like the score is about to be settled in the most satisfying way possible. But just before ending his life, Corporal Lee lets the rat wizard know that because of him, he spent years like a cripple. He reveals that the daggers that just sliced him a thousand times were once wielded by squad members whom this cobbled wizard killed in his previous life. As the rat's life hangs in the balance, the image of Private Park appears in Corporal Lee's mind. Private Park, a kind and happy soul, always admired Corporal Lee. Yet, one day, this bastard had severed Park's head from his body, a haunting memory that still grips Corporal Lee to this very day. It is a moment of reckoning, where past grievances surface, and the weight of revenge takes a toll on both the victor and the vanquished. With a searing determination, Corporal Lee thrusts his sword into the cobbled's belly, exacting a brutal payback for what he did to his comrades. As the sword starts to pierce the creature, a window notification pops up, stating that Cloud Bals is absorbing the blood of an elite monster, and the energy being filled is of an unknown nature. The progress bar indicates it is 1% charged. Ignoring the digital prompt, Corporal Lee drives the sword deeper into the cobbled's belly, the creature desperately trying to let out screams of agony. Meanwhile, Cobbled's own dagger, lying on the ground, starts to shimmer. With his steel manipulation ability, Corporal Lee brings the dagger towards him, stopping it right before the Cobbled's forehead. Driven by the desire for payback for the scar this Cobbled left on his face in his previous life, Cobblot's own blade starts to thrust into his own head, slicing the rat wizard's face in half. With this final, vindictive strike, the bastard finally meets his well-deserved demise. The system notification pops up again declaring that Cloud Blade is being filled with an unknown energy, and 11% has been achieved. The notification further states that the latent powers of Cloud Blade will be unlocked when it is completely filled with this unknown energy. But who cares about what this system window is saying? Corporal Lee is feeling satisfied. Finally, he has reversed the first event of his past that had been haunting him, and the weight of revenge has been lifted, even if it's only a little. Now, back on the streets, the smoke has started to dissipate. Suddenly, the medallion of the cobbled pops out of his lifeless body. Corporal Lee is struck with a mixture of amazement and surprise at this unexpected turn of events. Another notification pops up, revealing that it is the Devil Medallion, and he has acquired Inferno. This Hellfire Medallion contains the power of devilish race demons and is the highest ranked item in the Medallion series. However, Corporal Lee gives the Medallion a doubtful glance, wondering why it is appearing there all of a sudden. Also, this Devil's Medallion, Inferno, is believed to belong to a leader of an undead army. It is believed that the undead army led by this mysterious guy was hell for the surviving humans, making him humanity's worst villain, and this villain is a necromancer. However, there is virtually no intel about this guy, and the mystery surrounding him deepens. My man, though, has one crucial piece of information, specific growth traits that they have in common. He has always kept hidden the fact that he can advance from an F rank because of this specific growth trait. This trait allows one to grow through a specific method, not through normal combat or training. We further learn that in Corporal Lee's previous life, he barely managed to end the battle at his Blue Lava Golem workshop, acquiring a mere replica of Inferno, which was an imitation of the original. Now, he is filled with curiosity. Why is this original Inferno the genuine Hellfire Medallion is appearing out of nowhere? He then starts to lose his brain cells, wondering if there is something else he is not aware of. The poison gas is almost gone, so he decides to eat it before anyone see him eating this thing. But before he could take a bite out of it, the redhead lady appears behind him and calls out a name that leaves the dude sweating buckets. Now she draws her weapon and sternly asks him who the hell he actually is and she further questions him what is he hiding. At this point, this goofball just does not know how to respond, and one thing he is clear on is that he is royally fucked. Then, the spider lady arrives at the scene and cuts through the thick tension with her resounding voice of claps. She takes off her mask, and with her delicate lips, she lets out that the battle she just saw was impressive. As this spider lady closes in on the vicinity, the red-headed lady introduces herself as the captain of the 1st Battalion Attack Squad of the 3rd Amp Brigade. She sternly informs her that they are inside a military operation area, and civilians are not allowed. However, the spider lady pays no heed to what the redhead is blabbering about and strides straight toward our guy. It seems like she is on a mission of her own and is not easily deterred by military protocols. Without beating around the bush, she greets our guy and introduces herself as Catherine Yu, the head of the Soul Attack Unit of the Blue Flower Guild. She also extends her hand with her guild card, 
the boy is playing hard to get, ignoring the lady's fancy moves as she clings to that card like it is the last slice of pizza at a party. She throws him a curve ball, asking if he has been living under a rock and does not recognize her. But, from the expression on his face, it is crystal clear he is not suffering from amnesia. Turns out, she is on his hit list, and revenge is on his mind. Now, let us rewind and peek into his past. There is this feisty redhead with a shield bigger than my weekend plans, trying to play a firefighter and stop the flames from toasting her marshmallows. In the midst of the chaos, she is giving the dude a lecture telling him to get his act together and insists him to survive this hot mess. Corporal Lee tells her to get out of the way, but this lady's playing statue and refuses to budge. And later, she ends up being the tragic victim of these creatures crawling above her. And the reason for her death falls on this lady, Yuhina, a true murderer of Seo Yuna. Now back to the present. The spider lady, not receiving any response from our guy, assumes he probably does not recognize her. Nonetheless, she leaves him with one thing clear. Rejecting her offer means losing a huge opportunity laid in front of him. But our dude could not care less about her glorified guild and is probably daydreaming about giving her face a makeover. The tension is thicker than peanut butter on a winter morning. Then, out of the blue, the redhead breaks the tension, reminding Miss Spider that this is not a tea party, it is a military zone, and orders her to schedule pronto. Spider Lady, feeling the heat, lets out a frustrated sigh. With a glare that could freeze the sun, she snaps back, reminding the redhead about military decorum. She insists on being addressed by her proper title, the head honcho of the soul attack squad from the Blue Flower Guild. Now, it is like a staring contest on steroids between these two ladies, shooting daggers at each other with just their eyes. My man's caught in the crossfire of this intense glare off, feeling as uncomfortable as a cat at a dog show. But just when things could not get any more awkward, a military truck makes its dramatic entrance in the scene. The thing screeches to a halt, grabbing everyone's attention. Out steps none other than the big cheese himself, the battalion commander. The commander scans the scene, first left, where he spots the deceased cobbles, then right, where their leader lies sprawled out like a discarded sandwich wrapper. At this point, Corporal Lee is sweating buckets now, envisioning all sorts of doom and gloom scenarios. Then the commander starts shooting him a skeptical look. Meanwhile, Corporal Lee's mind is doing the limbo out of his body, attempting to slip away from his physical self, urging him to handle this shit on his own. So, we are back in action, and the battalion commander slices right through the heavy air of tension when he meets the department head of the soul attack squads. With a grin, he says it has been ages since they last faced off. The lady fires back with the same vibe, wondering how things are holding up. Then, the battalion commander does not miss a beat to show his thanks for the reinforcements sent over by the Blue Flower Guild. But he lays it down straight, this is military ops territory, and sneaking into the action zone without the green light is a no-go, even for the Blue Flower Guild. So, he politely, but firmly, suggests she makes an exit. She then lets out a sigh of disappointment, rolling her eyes at how predictably inflexible typical soldiers can be. Yet, to pique everyone's curiosity, she hints she was just about to get to the best part of the story. But she decides to let it go. Then, out of the blue, she kisses the guild card she has been holding, leaving a delicate mark of her lipstick on it, and slides it into our guy's uniform pocket. With a wink, she tells him to call her later. After that, the lady makes her grand exit from the restricted area, and the battalion commander immediately calls over our boy, the corporal. The corporal snaps to attention and reports in. The commander then drops the bombshell. From this moment on, the corporal himself is being promoted to squad commander for the cobbled operation. He orders him to make the rescue of the survivors the top priority, and entrusts him with the task of assigning roles to the squad members. Corporal Lee does not say a word in front of his senior, he just takes it all in stride. But deep down, he is really not feeling the whole spiel the commander has dumped on him. The commander then lays down another order, telling him that once the dust settles and the operation wraps up, Corporal Lee needs to report back to him in person for a debriefing. With the unyielding energy of a soldier, Corporal Lee responds with a crisp yes, sir. But just as they are about to part ways, the redhead lady shoots him a soul-piercing glance. And just like that, Corporal Lee feels a shiver run down his spine, all thanks to her intense gaze. A week has flown by, and we are outside the 3rd Armored Brigade, 1st Battalion, where everything seems peaceful. Suddenly, a system notification pops up, announcing that the absorption of Devil's Medallion Medal is complete, and the controllable metal weight has increased by 499 grams. Now, Corporal Lee can manipulate a total weight of 3458 grams with his powers. Shifting the scene, we find ourselves outside the boys' bathroom, where it sounds like someone's really going through it, puking their guts out. Then, another notification pops up, warning that a breath room is forming in our guy's stomach, currently at 1%. This could lead to excruciating pain for the time being. When we finally see Corporal Lee, it is clear the devil's medallion he devoured is wreaking havoc on him. Flames seem to be escaping his mouth, and because his body is weak, the toll it is taking on him is much more painful than it should be. Private Park makes his entrance into the toilet, his playful nature on full display. Leaning towards the door of the cubicle Corporal Lee is in, he flashes a mischievous grin and teasingly asks if the corporal is enjoying some nice alone time. 
but inside that toilet room. It is clear that what is happening is far from what Private Park imagines. It is not a pleasant experience by any means. Corporal Lee's entire body is steaming, with light trying to burst from the corners of his eyes and mouth, as if a heater has been cranked up inside him. The reaction intensifies, heating up the entire toilet room, and now Private Park is the one feeling chills running down his spine, wondering what in the hell this guy is up to. Rewinding the clock to when the whole cobbled gate scenario unfolded, everyone had underestimated the creature's infiltration, leading to a high number of casualties among the soldiers. But, fortunately, the vice president, with her healing powers, managed to pull Private Aunt Mantique back from the brink of death. He was then safely transported to the military hospital. After that nightmarish day, Corporal Lee had a change of heart. He realized he could not shoulder the burden of protection all by himself. So, he began training the support squad members, aiming for them to at least be able to defend themselves. This shift in strategy was not just a learning curve, it also brought its own set of challenges. However, this change sparked an unexpected development. The vice president started paying more attention to Corporal Lee, something he found more than a little unsettling. It was not just the occasional glance or casual check-in, it felt like he was under a microscope, and frankly, he was not here for it. Now, we catch a glimpse of the vice platoon president nagging Corporal Lee yet again. Our guy, clearly not on the same wavelength, asks in a dejected tone, what do you want now? It is like he is running out of patience for these encounters. On the flip side, we have got this orange-headed motherfucker steaming with anger. He is a second problem Corporal Lee finds himself dealing with. Ever since the battalion commander started showing our boy some extra attention, suggesting he quit his current role to become a non-commissioned officer, this orange-haired individual has been on edge. But honestly, Corporal Lee is not feeling all this spotlight. It is not his scene. Yet, he is not the type to outright defy orders or suggestions from his seniors. The commander harbors a firm belief in shaping an ideal military culture, one where ranks do not dictate every interaction, aiming for a more unified, team-oriented approach. He sees Corporal Lee as a crucial piece of this puzzle, someone who could help realize this vision. And there is Corporal Lee, scratching his head, wondering why on earth he has been chosen to help this gorilla achieve his ambitious dreams. Despite his reservations and not being fully on board with this whole setup, he ends up telling the commander he will think it over during his vacation. And just like that, three weeks whisked away, bringing us to the much-awaited vacation day. Day one kicks in, and we find ourselves outside Seoul Station, where we see someone is holding down the fort outside the toilet room. Meanwhile, our corporal is dealing with the same stomach issues that have become a regular feature lately. But wait, a system window pops up out of the blue, congratulating our guy for meeting some special conditions. As a reward, he has been granted a shiny new skill, introducing the latest addition to Corporal Lee's repertoire, Breath Room Fire. It is a grade D skill, boasting the power to turbocharge his metal absorption by 50 to 250 percent. But there is a downside of it. The more efficient the furnace, the higher the inflicted pain. Now, here comes the second act of this skill named Fire Breath. Corporal Lee can store some of his metal in a breath chamber and unleash it as, you guessed it, fiery breath. The weight limit is a cool 3 kilograms per breath, and interestingly, fulfilling some hidden conditions can actually level up this skill. Corporal Lee emerges from the bathroom, looking like he just wrestled a dragon and won. Finally over with his stomach issues, there will not be any rumors circulating about him engaging in bizarre bathroom antics. As he stands before the dressing mirror, he cannot help but reflect on the harsh reality. He is not sure if his current powers and abilities are up to the task of handling the next gate. In a somber moment, we are transported back to a grim episode in his past. The battalion commander, facing an angry mob of people, questioned about his commitment to helping and the potential abandonment of Soul Station. The crowd demands clarification, wondering if the commander plans to forsake the citizens inside the station. Inside the station building, innocent civilians are trapped, screaming for help, their bodies covered in blood from head to toe. These haunting memories continue to plague Corporal Lee, and he is determined not to let history repeat itself. The thought of innocent lives at stake fuels his resolve, pushing him to do whatever it takes to change the gruesome future, even if it costs him his own life. It is a heavy burden he carries, but Corporal Lee is dead set on rewriting the narrative and preventing the horrors he witnessed from playing out once again. As Corporal Lee strides down the familiar halls of Soul Station, he is determined to use this vacation to gear up for the looming threat, dead set on changing the future of the city. Meanwhile, the vice president, looking like she is ready to unwind, is about to light up a cigarette. She casually remarks about how it has been ages since her last vacation, and also throws in a colorful comment about military life which are actually not that colorful. But, her plans are thwarted as her lighter decides to play hard to get, leaving her cigarette unlit and probably her mood a little darker. Just as frustration sets in, the universe decides to intervene. 
their paths cross, and, in a serendipitous moment, Corporal Lee and the Vice President lock eyes. She, in her slightly vexed state, asks him the burning question, do you have a lighter? An awkward tension starts to descend between them, mainly because the Vice President has never revealed her casual and real personality to anyone before. The sun, meanwhile, is cranking up the heat. And beneath the blazing sun, we see a train barrels along its tracks. Inside, the Vice President and Corporal Lee find themselves sharing a seat, plunging into an uncomfortable silence that hangs heavy in the air. Breaking the awkward tension, she finally looks towards him and decides to initiate a casual conversation. She asks if this is his first vacation in a while, assuming his parents must be thrilled to see him. But with an unfazed expression, he calmly reveals that neither of his parents is alive, they passed away when he was young. The unexpected response sends a chill down the vice president's spine, and she is left pouting, realizing she might have inadvertently made things even more awkward than before. Noticing the vice president sulking, Corporal Lee decides to take the initiative. Flashing a pleasant smile, he reassures her that it is all good. While his younger years were tough and lonely after losing his parents, he found a second family among people he met as an adult. The vice president, intrigued, is keen to learn more about who he considers his family. Corporal Lee starts recalling memories where people close to him stand, calling out his name. With nonchalance, he mentions friends and co-workers, and then, with a subtle emphasis, he adds comrades in arms, of course. It is a casual way of encapsulating the unique bond formed in the military, a camaraderie that goes beyond mere friendship. Now that he is finally touched down in Yongdungpo, there is only one thing playing on Corporal Lee's mind. With just four days and three nights for this whirlwind vacation, he has got to prep himself for the future. With a broad grin, he spills the beans that topping his prep list is the timeless classic, getting his hands on some cold, hard cash. Now, he finds himself squinting at a guild advertisement billboard like it is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Turns out, the bigwig behind the company, Blue Tree, is swimming in a pool of trillions. Meet Gordon Pracy, the dude casually sipping his vine while raindrops of dollar bills fall around him. His black money swims underwater. Mr. Moneybag here has not only purchased high-ranking powerful folks but also some serious players and valuable items. Slowly but surely, he has taken the reins and turned everything into his own personal playground. According to our hero's insider scoop, they lost to the villain for a variety of reasons. But at the heart of it all was the green stuff yes you heard it right it's all money. So, our hero spills the beans that reaching Gordon Pracy's level of wealth is like trying to catch a unicorn and it's impossible. But he is not aiming for unicorn status, just enough cash to sidestep troubles and avoid getting caught up in Gordon's web. Lucky for my man, being a time-traveling wizard means he has got the lowdown on all the future money-making events and exactly where and when the cash will pile up. In a nutshell, he has figured out that if he throws some coins into the investment fountain before everyone else, even pocket change can turn into a money avalanche. But, and there is always a but, he needs a partner in crime who will not bail on him during the investment roller coaster, no matter what. So, our hero sets out on a quest to find someone faithful and loyal, a psychic who'd keep their promise even if it is written in invisible ink. As he ascends the stairs, he catches wind of a commotion, someone's dishing out the dumbass label like it is going out of style. The situation's heating up, and it looks like whoever's quarreling is ready to throw down. Now, we see a silver-haired dude gripping a boy, clearly on a mission. This silver fox is practically demanding the poor kid to hook him up with a job. But the boy is just laying it out straight, not many clients around these parts lately. Silverhead is not having it and insists the lad grab whatever job comes his way. In the midst of this workplace drama, cue our hero making a grand entrance, better late than never. Now, the silver-haired screamer does a 180, locks eyes with our guy, and there is a collective gasp. Suddenly, the silver hothead has transformed from an angry bird into a cool cat. With a wide grin, he struts over to our guy as if they are old buddies. Let us rewind to a time when Silverhead was not looking so intimidating. This was their first encounter, and he is also awakened just like Corporal Lee. We also get to see Corporal Lee, young and sprightly, returning Silverhead's introduction with an equally pleasant smile and greeting. Back in the present, as Silverhead starts getting cozy with Corporal Lee, the Corporal throws some ice on the party with a stern reminder that they are not exactly buddies enough to be exchanging pleasantries. So, giving the cold shoulder to Silverhead, our hero strides toward the other boy like it is no big deal. Meanwhile, Chubby Fella pipes up and asks Corporal Lee why he is even here, stirring the pot a bit. But Silverhead is not ready to let the drama die down just yet. He turns back to Corporal Lee and throws out a zinger, wondering if the Corporal had his own brain for lunch. With a flicker of defiance, Corporal Lee shoots back with an equally frosty glare. But Silverhead is not backing down, oh no. He fires off another question, taunting Corporal Lee about forgetting all the good old memories and offering to refresh his memory with some real talk. Now we take a flashback into the past once again where we see the Corporal Lee, the budding superhero, is levitating objects with his superpowers, putting on a show for a crowd of students. But instead of applause, they are throwing shade, questioning if that is the best he has got and mocking him for not living up to the Awakened One hype. Amidst the doubters, Silverhead, ever the voice of brutal honesty, lets loose with some colorful language, straight up calling Corporal Lee a loser and a dipshit. 
the objects Corporal Lee was levitating hit the ground unceremoniously, their once majestic dance cut short. Silverhead's patience evaporates, and he delivers a resounding slap to Corporal Lee's mouth. It is so fierce that it triggers a blood fountain. My guy sprawls on the ground, and Silverhead stands there triumphantly, raging because he is not about the whole Corporal Lee, the awakened vibe. He goes off, dissing Corporal Lee's powers as dumb and flat out calling him a dumbass. The threat is crystal clear, one more boast about being awakened, and Corporal Lee might as well start finding a perfect spot for his grave. Now, back in the present, Silverhead is serving the same cocky tone and energy to our guy. F and ally we get to know that this guy is Lee Wunchul, a c rank player with the fighter trait, proudly repping the Hope Guild. Silverhead takes it up a notch, threatening to throw it back to the good old school days and beat our guy to a pulp, making him beg for mercy just like in the good old times. In a classic power move, Silverhead orders the chubby dude to scram unless he wants a front row seat to our impending brawl. But our man, the epitome of casual coolness, fires back with a nonchalant give it a shot. Unfazed, our hero stares down Silverhead with the icy calm of a seasoned poker player, inviting him to go ahead and try his luck at murder. Corporal Lee must have hit the last nerve because Silverhead loses it. He winds up for a punch, aiming straight for Corporal Lee, who stands there like a statue, completely unimpressed. But, the fierce punch freezes midair as a pen hovers menacingly in front of Silverhead's eye, ready to ink him a new one. Blades appear at his feet, forming a deadly dance floor of impending doom. The scene zooms out, revealing Silverhead surrounded by a battalion of blades, each one poised to strike with just a flick of Corporal Lee's wrist. Corporal Lee throws down some heavyweight words, admitting he cannot guarantee victory over Silverhead, but he can darn well make sure Silverhead ends up looking like he got bulldozed by a whole army unit. Translation, our man here can turn him into a half-dead, regret-filled shadow of his former self, especially in close-range combat. The realization hits Silverhead like a ton of bricks, he is outclassed by our guy. But hold the drama, another character bursts into the room, announcing it is time to skedaddle if they want to make it to the event on time. However, the newcomer is left wide-eyed and probably wondering if he walked into the twilight zone, after seeing the chaos unfolding before him. Abruptly, Corporal Lee pulls a 180, playing the victim card and issuing apologies left and right to Silverhead. Out of nowhere, he wraps Silverhead in an embrace, leaving Silverhead utterly bewildered. Now, here comes the masterstroke of mind games. Corporal Lee starts spewing some great a bull, claiming he heard rumors that Silverhead got the boot from the White Tiger Guild for, wait for it, peeing his pants and bolting during his first raid. Cue a vivid mental image of Silverhead sprinting for dear life, courtesy of some unexpected bodily functions. Silverhead, visibly tensed, demands to know how Corporal Lee got wind of this embarrassing tidbit. Our man leans in, whispering a reminder that he has got a big mouth and advises Silverhead to shape up if he wants to avoid a public shaming by an F-rank player. Corporal Lee, not one to mince words, gives Silverhead the final boot, emphasizing the urgency to leave before things escalate any further. Outside the Hope Guild, everything appears calm and collected, blissfully unaware of the internal drama. Back inside, our man lays out the three guild cards he received from various seniors, spilling all the details about what is about to go down in these companies. The boy, still in disbelief, asks once more if it is legit. Are these stocks really about to shoot through the roof by those mind-boggling numbers? A simple nod from our man is the only reply needed. The boy's jaw practically hits the floor as the realization sinks in. If this intel is legit, we are talking about a life-changing turn of events. Outside the Blue Tree headquarters, a squadron of black-clad guards stands on guard duty, questioning how long they will be stuck on duty. One of them suggests spicing things up with a good old gate raid. But among these order-barking guards, Silverhead grinds his teeth, displaying an unusual level of agitation. His friend, clearly picking up on the vibes, asks about the sudden change in behavior. Just in the nick of time, their manager arrives on the scene, shooting daggers at the guards and labeling them as fucking servants, questioning why they are causing a ruckus in this supposedly reserved place. The spotlight shifts to a bulky dude, who turns to Silverhead with a stern expression, questioning if he is the leader of this rowdy guard gang. The dude, clearly unimpressed with Silverhead, casually places a hand on his shoulder, reminding him that it is Zone C, and in case he forgot, he throws some serious shade, questioning if Silverhead even knows the damn alphabet, specifically, Zone C. The humiliation train is rolling full steam. It seems like Silverhead has had enough of this verbal assault. In a moment of frustration, he unleashes a swift punch, shutting up the relentless trash talker. Giant dude takes an unexpected leap into the air, leaving the other guard on the sidelines in absolute bewilderment. But Silverhead is not hitting the brakes, instead, he unleashes a barrage of punches on the airborne guy, and blood starts splattering like a gruesome paint job. The force of each punch is so intense that the ground beneath them begins to shatter. Silverhead is not showing any mercy. With every punch, blood rains down, creating a gruesome spectacle. The other guards, standing by like helpless witnesses, cannot believe their eyes. The relentless assault continues until Silverhead screeches to a halt. 
With a face oozing malice and vibes that would make a devil blush, he orders his lackey to go find Corporal Lee because he has got a burning desire to end that dipshit once and for. Inside the Hope Guild, the chubby boy, still reeling from the bombshell about the stocks, just cannot wrap his head around the possibility of them skyrocketing. This guy goes by the name Park Chelsu, the leader of Hope Guild and an analyst class player. He is the one who later leads the charge in rediscovering rank F and finds a way to enhance his abilities. He is straight up skeptical, admitting he just cannot believe it. It is a reasonable reaction, after all. Anyone claiming they can magically turn your life around with money would raise some eyebrows. Park Chelsu throws Corporal Lee a curveball, entertaining the possibility that they fed him this stock information to set him up for a fall. Our man, determined to win this guy over, goes all in, asking if he really thinks he is untrustworthy. The boy responds swiftly and expresses his complete trust in Corporal Lee. With a genuine smile plastered across his face, Corporal Lee assures him to believe it all because it's the truth. To seal the deal and win over chubby Park Chalsu, Corporal Lee pulls out the big guns. He reveals the chat between him and the battalion commander. It is crystal clear evidence that he has been offered a proposal to join as an officer in the commission. With the undeniable proof laid out in front of him, the chubby dude finally accepts the truth. Now, Corporal Lee, wearing a pleasant smile, reveals his ace in the hole. He is now offering all the savings his parents left him. He discloses that it is a modest 20 million one, admitting it is not a fortune, but it is what he has got. As we resume the story, the first thing we spot is Corporal Lee finally trusting this boy with all his savings, putting genuine faith in him. Now, we flash back to a memory where Corporal is crying his eyes out alone. Then, this chubby boy comes along, trying to console him and reassures him that nobody in this world is without talents. It is just that talent is given the name of one superpower in this day and age. He tells Corporal not to beat himself up and to live a little longer until his talent is recognized as a superpower. Fast forward to the present, and Corporal Lee's treating this boy like the human sunshine who warmed his chilly nights back when he was a nobody. Now, we are getting the lowdown that in the near future, humanity is about to bump into some otherworldly beings who are pretty chatty. The tech goodies we snag from rubbing elbows with them are gonna be a game changer in the gate war. These beings have skills that are downright essential in putting the brakes on the gates and waves heading our way. So, my guy needs an expert who can shoot the breeze with these intergalactic buddies and pass on their tech wizardry to him. Fast forward to Yong Yungpo Blacksmith Alley, and we see the corporal wandering around, hitting up a merchant for the price of a mana stone. Looks like he is gearing up for the future, and with seven swarven artisans by his side, he is on a mission to craft his first master grade item. He is trying to gather blacksmiths whose status has gone beyond artisan to master, all before the villains catch wind of the plan. So, he strolls into this workshop, and the smith's there, doing his usual thing. But this old grandpa, he just straight up tells the corporal that he is only selling what is on these shelves. So he further tells Corporal to do not bother looking elsewhere, just focus on these items if you want something. And let me tell you, this blacksmith is no run-of-the-mill guy. He is artisan Kang Jiangdu, the dude who got the boot from the blacksmith's guild for his eccentricities. And trust me, you are about to find out why. In response, the corporal just gives the old man a confused smile and casually says, I see. Now, the smith is knee-deep in his work, too busy to spare any attention. Classic. Turns out, this old guy is crafting something special, a javelin made of orichalcon. It might look crude, but guess it is the Dragon Slayer Spear that is gonna be plunged right into the heart of the dragon. Terex. The corporal finally clicks and realizes why the groundwork for the first master grade items was laid in this ramshackle workshop. Now, a lady comes marching into the shop, straight up calling the corporal a crusty. But, the blacksmith spins around and gives her a stern scolding, telling her not to label customers like that. But the lady snaps back, accusing the grandpa of hypocrisy. She points out that he calls customers the same names, so why cannot she dish it out too? Despite being thrown off with weird nicknames, the corporal sports a pleasant smile. It turns out, this lady is someone from his past life, none other than Kang Bixiao. Four years later, after the old artisan Kang Jiangdu kicked the bucket, she inherited all his skills. This gal did not just stop at becoming a master smith, she surpassed even her master. Now, she starts scanning him with her keen eyes and immediately recognizes the branded long trench coat and Laurent boots. She swiftly transitions from a cocky brat to a graceful lady, reassuring the corporal that he is not a crusty but a customer. She asks him what he is looking for and tells him to just spill the beans. My man puts on a crooked smile, realizing that her blind money craze suits a dwarf perfectly. With her attention hooked, he decides to dish out all the ingredients he wants. For that, he forks over a total of 18 million won, leaving the lady over the moon with excitement. However, the old smith is clearly baffled, noticing that this young gun is not a mage. So why is he buying poisonous magical metal and mystical tungsten alloy beads that he cannot even handle? Eventually, this guy's money is bound to be wasted. But the lady immediately chimes in, telling the smith to pipe it down and reminding him that he must have a place to use the items. The corporal also responds, saying he just needs them and will be back to trade often. The old coot lets out a defeated sigh and mumbles a half-hearted sure. Now that he has snagged all the items he needed, he strides back, 
Throwing a casual goodbye at the lady who is sparkling with enthusiasm, she tells him to visit often since, after all, she is all about the money and that is the only thing she is interested in. As he takes a flashback, remembering her painful demise in his previous life, he is now fully fired up to protect her at all costs this time around. It is the middle of the night, but the bustling city streets are lit up like it is a clear day. Amidst the lively scene, there is a guy in a hoodie lurking in the shadows, seemingly keeping a watchful eye on someone. Here's our man, with a bag full of poisonous items. He is casually picking them up one by one, treating them like marshmallows and chomping them down like it is no big deal. He is dead set on significantly increasing his poison resistance and the amount of metal weight he can manipulate before the vacation ends. I mean, who needs a midnight snack when you can have a poisonous power-up session? Out of nowhere, a system window pops up again, reminding us that the absorption of metal is in progress and it is enchanted with poison. The major thing to note is that the notification says Corporal has ingested a poison enchanted metal, and after absorption, his tolerance to poison will increase by a small amount. It is mentioned that this process would usually take the same time, but since he has unlocked a breathing room, it is happening faster than ever. Let us sneak a peek into his body and see how things are getting torn into his stomach. As soon as the poison enters his belly, the breathing room kicks in, working its wonders and producing fire. Now, this fire immediately starts to melt down the poison. Due to his internal furnace activation, his metal absorption efficiency skyrockets by 250%. However, nothing comes without a cost, and this furnace activation inflicts severe pain on him. Consequently, his face starts to pale due to the intense pain inflicted. The system goes bonkers, bombarding him with relentless notifications about upcoming severe pain. Despite the intense pain he is enduring, he is dead set on chowing down on that poison. Time's ticking, and the Soul Station Gate incident is not waiting around. Two days pass, and a lackey draped in a hoodie finally spills the beans to his boss about Corporal Lee's mysterious whereabouts. The lackey confesses he has no clue what Corporal Lee is up to, but he has been locked in for two days and shows no sign of coming out. The moon glow is sneaking into the room through the window, and the entire stash of poison items lies empty. Finally, the window notification pops up again, revealing that Corporal has unlocked Tier 2 resistance to poison at a whopping 81%. Not only that, he has absorbed all the metals he chomped down, and his controllable metal weight has hit 17,499 grams, and his metal detection ability got a major boost. Now he can sense up to 500 grams of metal up to 135 meters away. So, now our guy's taking a moment to reflect on the progress he has made so far. He realizes that tier 2 poison resistance is not quite as good as he expected, but he is relieved that at least he has enough controllable weight to carry about 60 daggers. And then, the window notification chimes in again, congratulating the dude for successfully passing the first latent breakthrough, and he has gained a new skill trait. The skill is called Metal Smash, it is a rank D, and its effect involves consuming mana to crush a certain amount of metal. The amount of mana consumed varies depending on the metal's quantity, making it a powerful skill that destroys metal. A wide grin stretches across his face because with this skill, he can disarm almost any piece of equipment in one fell swoop. The fact that he acquired this skill is good enough for the amount of skill grinding he did. He suddenly senses something fishy and starts scanning the area with his magical metal detector. Suddenly, an unexpected party crasher makes a grand entrance, and as it turns out it's silver head again. But my dude isn't too surprised to see him. In response, he casually reminds him that he's a soldier now, with all these rules and regulations governing his moves. So, he politely suggests that it's best for him to head back. However, a sly grin creeps onto Silverhead's face, making it clear he's not here for a friendly chat. Without wasting a moment, he lunges at our guy with lightning speed, fists ready to unleash a beating. Corporal Lee stands his ground, cool as a cucumber, and casually blocks the incoming attack with his silver hand, leaving Silverhead scratching his head in bewilderment. Silverhead isn't backing down, but Corporal Lee suggests taking the fight outside before the civilians get caught up in the chaos. But Silverhead is adamant and itching to teach our guy a lesson. With determination, he throws his feet into the air, preparing for another kick. Yet, our man effortlessly leans down, gracefully dodging the attack. He retaliates by preparing his own steel fist, delivering a devastating blow to Silverhead's belly. The dude groans in pain, collapsing to the ground. Despite the brutal hit, Silverhead refuses to drop his cocky tough guy act. Gathering himself, he then whips out his enchantment, unleashing a beefed-up leg hit on our guy. Corporal Lee goes flying through the air, breaking through walls like he is auditioning for a superhero role, and eventually takes a nosedive out of the building, leaving a giant hole in its wake. The silver-headed troublemaker is not ready to call it a day. He is determined to end our guy. As our falling hero takes a mid-air breather, he activates his strengthening body transformation skill. His feet start morphing into steel, and right on cue, Mr. Silverhead reappears, swinging with all his godly strength. But like a ninja in a high-stakes ballet, our man pulls off a mid-air stunt, changing direction as if it is a walk in the park. 
he lands gracefully on the ground, revealing that while he might not be able to fly freely like he used to in his past life, a clever mix of strengthening body transformation and metal control skills lets him control his descent like a boss. This relentless troublemaker comes hurling down again, ready to crush our guy like a tomato with his enchanted leg. But once more, our man, with lightning quick reflexes, casually takes a step back, leaving Mr. Silverhead crashing into the ground. Now, the whole building's buzzing with excitement as residents peek out from their apartments to catch a glimpse of the impromptu showdown between two players. Silverhead, not one to be deterred, gears up for another attack while throwing insults our guy's way, questioning if he is just gonna keep dodging like a ninja rat. He screams at the top of his lungs, challenging our hero to come at him like before. Ignoring the verbal barrage, he takes a leap into the air, unleashing a barrage of kicks. But it seems none of them are finding their mark. After all, our man is not just any ninja, he is a seasoned military ninja. The surroundings start descending into chaos, and the pressure generated by their moves makes everything heavier. It is so intense that cars are literally floating above ground. Alright, so here we are, back in the building, and the crowd is losing their bananas. One person gives a quick heads up to the neighbors, avoid the first floor like it is haunted because there is a bunch of rowdy players down there causing a ruckus. Now, we see Corporal Lee is gracefully dodging kicks like he is dancing at a ninja ballet. But here's the catch, he is in a bit of a pickle. There is a gallery of civilians watching, and being the military officer he is, he cannot unleash his inner warrior too aggressively, afraid that if he does, it will mess up his grand plans for the Soul Station Gate. After a dazzling display of a hundred kicks in the air, our silver-headed hero finally plants his feet on solid ground. He then takes a peek at the peanut gallery staring down from the windows, some even recording this epic showdown. It is like they stumbled upon the weirdest street performance ever. To avoid landing on the wanted list, Silverhead decides to end this spectacle before it turns into the hottest viral video on the internet. Now, brace yourselves, because his legs start shimmering even more ferociously, like he is pushing the limits of some cosmic leg day workout. Corporal Lee, however, stands there, staring at this guy like he is asking if he is planning to turn the whole building into a pile of rubble. He reminds Mr. Shiny Hair that there are freaking civilians in the mix. With some serious authority, he yells at the dude, explaining that these innocent folks have zero business being dragged into their brawl. But Silverhead over here is on a whole new level of ticked off, claiming the public is just a bunch of trash bags sticking their noses where they should not. Undeterred, Silver Buddy takes another gravity-defying leap, ready to put an end to Corporal Lee. But Lee is not flinching, not even trying any fancy spins or acrobatics. At this point, Corporal Lee decides enough is enough. His eyes start shimmering with this cool blue energy, and it is like he is manipulating iron particles or something. Out of nowhere, he forges two rings and, with a magician's flair, grabs Silverhead's leg. The poor guy's fancy footwork equipment starts shattering into a million pieces. But Silverhead, however, seems to have missed the memo on stopping, still twirling in the air like some out-of-control gymnast, ready to lay the smack down on Corporal Lee. Meanwhile, Corporal Lee is over there doing his shiny thing. Just when you think it could not get more interesting, a notification window pops up like we are in some cosmic RPG, and we find out Corporal Lee's trick is called Metal Smash. It is a rank D skill, and get this, it consumes mana to crush a certain amount of metal. Mana consumption varies depending on the metal applied. In the blink of an eye, Silverhead's leg goes from high-tech to plain old ordinary. But, just as it is about to make contact with Corporal Lee, there is a sudden splatter of blood, and screams of course echoing through vicinity. Now, once confident Silverhead is groaning in pain, and clutching his shattered leg, life comes at you fast, especially when Corporal Lee is dealing the cards. Even though he is sprawled on the ground like a badly beaten up action figure, this guy is still keeping up the tough guy act. He is questioning our man, wondering why the heck he did this to him. But our hero is not in the mood for games. With a cold blare that could freeze time, he shoots back at the guy, asking why he is taking things to the extreme. The poor sod on the ground mumbles something about killing mosquitoes if they dare annoy him, no doubt about it. Corporal Lee, not one to mince words, reminds him of his less than stellar past. He digs into the guy's sorry history, pointing out that there must be a reason a lowlife like him, kicked out of a pack of wolves, is snarling like a wounded hyena. According to Corporal Lee, these superiority complex drunks do not deserve to be players. It is because, in his book, they always end up being the villains. But hold on to your seats, because it turns out Silverhead is not quite finished with the verbal bullshit. He starts laying it on thick again, testing Corporal Lee's patience. Our man, having zero interest in playing games, casually makes a finger gesture, and a sharp metal object appears right behind Silverhead's throat. With all the authority of a drill sergeant and a voice that could give you chills, Corporal Lee warns him never to show his face in front of him again. And just to drive the point home, he throws in a chilling promise that if Silverhead did, it would not just be a leg missing next time. Finally, Silverhead seems to have reached his breaking point. Meanwhile, Corporal Lee is still fuming, grinding his teeth, all while reminding Silverhead to thank his lucky stars that he is a military officer. If not, this silver dude would be in a world of hurt right about now. 
Finally, the cavalry in blue arrives at the scene. We find ourselves now outside the Awakened Task Force headquarters. Inside, Corporal Lee finds himself in the hot seat, facing interrogation. The officer in charge remarks that witness statements are aligning. Painting Silverhead as a problematic and vicious character. Now, if we zoom in on this officer, it is his first rodeo dealing with someone like Corporal Lee, a low-rank player walking away from a fight without so much as a scratch. Corporal Lee, master of spin, casually attributes his survival to the grieve, a shin and calf armor. With the green signal to go, Corporal Lee starts strolling out of the office, contemplating how he spent his whole life despising the F-rank player label. Little did he know, it would come in handy, helping him avoid suspicions and walk away from a brawl looking as fresh as a daisy. After Corporal Lee's departure, a newcomer rushes toward the officer with an urgent file in hand. Panicking, the newcomer insists the officer take a look at the profile. According to the report, the Silverhead got a serious beatdown from Corporal Lee. The officer, mouth hanging wide open, finds the idea of an F-rank player crushing a C-rank player's armor and taking him down without a scratch utterly unbelievable. Meanwhile, outside the headquarters, Corporal Lee is picking up momentum. In the blink of an eye, he dashes out like it is no big deal. Even the civilians in the vicinity cannot see what is coming. They just feel a breeze as something zips by them. As he runs, the only thing swirling in his mind is the Soul Station incident. In his past life, he recalls the death toll starting at the gates of Soul Station around 1524 today. So far, 745 confirmed casualties, and aside from the first, second, and third waves, this is shaping up to be a monster disaster unlike anything humanity has ever seen before. As Corporal Lee continues his journey, he takes a moment to glance at the news. The reports are pouring in about the Soul Station tragedy, sparking criticism from player experts and civil society organizations. Questions are being raised about the fundamental limitations and problems with the current gate response system. In the present, while soaring into the air, there is a lingering tension that grips his mind. He reflects on his experiences with the first two gates, but this upcoming one is an unknown. So with limited information, he realizes he might need to adjust his plans. He is determined to prevent this disaster, especially considering this one is worst among all of the Soul City incidents, and he is ready to take any action. The clock is ticking, time slipping away. The only thought echoing in his head, will he be able to handle it with his current progress? Inside the station, Corporal Lee is surrounded by ordinary citizens. A part of him urges him to go on a rampage, evacuate the general population. But he knows better. Somewhere among these ordinary folks, a villain might be lurking in the shadows. If he goes into hiding during chaos, he will miss the turning point that could change the future. So, he stands in the crowd, searching for any anomaly. The clock is ticking, and there are only two minutes left. Suddenly, a voice catches him off guard. The scene shifts, revealing the platoon vice president running toward him. She looks exhausted, as if she just ran a marathon, and confesses she has been looking for him for so long. With her big assets on full display, the lady goes into full scolding mode, giving Corporal Lee an earful. Apparently, news has spread like wildfire through the unit that Corporal visited the police station last night, and everyone's going crazy. Corporal Lee is left scratching his head, wondering how she knew he would be here. The lady, not missing a beat, reminds him that he mentioned having plans at Seoul Station. As the lady continues her scolding, she throws a curve ball, asking why Corporal Lee has not been picking up his phone. The dude is left in thought, scratching his head, wondering why the vice president is even at Seoul Station in the first place. It is like a plot twist he did not see coming, and he is starting to ponder if he has accidentally become the master of altering the future. With one minute left on the digital clock, signaling the impending arrival of the worst gate in the world, the lady demands an explanation for his visit to the police station. She wants to know everything right here. However, Corporal Lee is not vibing with the arguing and questions. Time is of the essence, and the gate is about to pop out any second. There is no room for dilly-dallying, he has got a plan to stick to. As the crucial moment arrives, Corporal Lee wastes no time and casually tosses some marble-like objects onto the ground, leaving the lady bewildered, wondering what the heck he is up to. The crowd also loses its collective mind, throwing shade at him for this unexpected toss of balls. They are not exactly convinced he should be playing marbles in the middle of station. Meanwhile, the vice president is on the same wavelength, shouting at him and demanding answers. She is all about the why are not you answering me drama, completely missing the fact that Corporal Lee is not in the mood for pleasantries. Our man in charge is not here for chit-chat. He instructs the vice president that when he gives the signal, she better run to where the gas masks are. Once again, the lady is left bewildered because this is definitely not what she was expecting to hear from Corporal Lee. Meanwhile, a mysterious smoke begins to envelop the surroundings, and the pressure intensifies as a thick purple aura starts to surround the area. Suddenly, a rift appears out of nowhere, and a purple portal materializes in the middle of the station. All eyes are drawn upward to the portal, leaving the lady scratching her head, wondering what in the hell is going on. And out of the portal, a giant monster starts to emerge, and Corporal Lee immediately turns around urgently. He shouts and signals for everyone to run towards where the gas masks are. Now, this spider-like beast finally decides to grace the ground, 
kicking off the Chaos and Doom party. It then passionately lunges towards the poor civilians who are attempting a marathon to outrun this monstrous sprinter. We spot Corporal Hero lending a hand to the evacuating civilians. He then orders the platoon leader to hit the safety zone pronto and, of course, snag a stylish gas mask from the passenger aid station. Finally, it seems the platoon leader is not exactly vibing with this brilliant plan. She snaps back, reminding him that she is not planning on being a solo survivor. After all, she is a soldier, not combat personnel. And her mission is evacuating the civilians and playing nurse to the wounded. She drops the bomb that she is not entirely sure what on earth he is up to, but she is putting her faith in him. As the platoon leader, she throws down the command for him to stay alive at all costs. Our man is feeling this energy, vibing on the same frequency, and with equal gusto, he reciprocates, yes madam. Now, the scene shifts, and we catch the battalion commander facing off with his senior, who seems less thrilled about the idea of promoting Corporal Lee, given his humble F-rank status. However, the battalion commander drops a truth bomb, claiming that assessing someone's potential as an outstanding officer goes beyond the mere mechanical grading of ranks. At this point, the senior starts to feel a bit challenged, and lets out a frustrated what escape from his lips. This is where the battalion commander spills the tea, revealing that the whole rank system is not just about checking boxes on a player's profile. It is not like picking your character level in a game. These ranks are handed out at the player training center based on expected outcomes of traits and aptitude in raid fights. It is all about real-life battle effectiveness. And as the players level up, the department is tweaking the ranks to keep it real. He further mentions that undervalued skills are getting squashed on the field. By the way, the player training center is the boot camp of South Korea. Everyone who is anyone gets admitted, gets schooled for about two months, and then gets their initial rank after a basic test. Now we are back in the thick of it, where the battalion commander is laying it all out, trying to get his boss to see the light about Corporal Lee's much-deserved promotion. But then, his senior is not having any of it, almost like he is asking if the battalion commander is trying to school him on military affairs. And let us not forget, this is not just any senior officer. We are talking about the one and only Brigadier General Choi yun Chiao of the 3rd Amp Brigade, rank 32nd in South Korea. A rank player whose magic spells are so epic, they could give any tactical weapon a run for its money. But the battalion commander, bless his heart, quickly backpedals with a no, sir, not wanting to ruffle any feathers. General Choi is not letting it slide, though. He hits back, pondering why any self-respecting veteran would ditch their cushy civil guild gigs to join the amp if they start handing out officer titles to, as he sees it, a lowly F-ranker like Corporal Lee. Then, with a tone as sharp as a freshly honed blade, he digs in, challenging the battalion commander on what exactly he finds so flawed with the military system as it stands. It is all a bit of a mess, but you have got to admit, military politics never sounded so entertaining. He makes his stance crystal clear, suggesting the battalion commander might see Corporal Lee as the next big thing. But to the general, Lee's about as intimidating as a bug. Just as the tension could be cut with a knife, the telephone rings, slicing through the standoff. The general picks up, and on the other end, the news drops like a bomb. A gate has popped up within the 1st Battalion's turf, smack dab in the middle of Seoul Station. And just to spice things up, it is not your garden variety gate, it is an unlucky event one. Both the battalion commander and General Choi are floored by the news. These unlucky events are like the universe's own brand of natural disasters, hitting specific areas with debuffs that could hobble a player or pile on extra rules that make missions a headache and a half. Now, back at Seoul Station, we are smack in the middle of this giant anomaly. There is a cloud-like barrier has swallowed the whole place up. Inside, players are doing their darndest to torch these spider-like monsters to a crisp. But here's the kicker, the fire is almost like a gentle breeze to these critters. Amidst the chaos, one soldier, probably with his adrenaline through the roof, yells out to his team leader, asking what in the world this spider monster is. It is not like anything they have seen in their field guide before. And just as he is pondering this new existential threat, one of the monster's legs, sharp as a spear, darts towards him. It is inches away from turning his head into a shish kebab. But there is a twist. Another soldier dashes in, moving with the kind of speed that would make a cheetah jealous, and he saves his comrade in the nick of time leaving the spider's sharp leg to only meet the ground, which it punctures, sending debris and rubble flying. Meanwhile, another soldier is laying on the heat, trying to distract the spider with flames, while the other two soldiers are still catching their breath after that narrow escape from becoming spider kebabs. The hero who made the save is not just any player, he is Jian Amnu, a Class C veteran player with the gladiator trait, rocking it in Soul Station's guard team too. Jian, with lungs of steel, yells to his crew to switch to a frost rune and tie down this beast's legs. His team does not miss a beat, quickly shifting gears to the frost rune, as the monster bellows like it is the end of the world. Jian gives the green light to blast this beast, and they unleash a cold fury on the spider. Before you know it, the spiders turn into a giant frost popsicle. The soldiers take a moment to catch their breath, relieved that the spider is temporarily out of commission. But Jian knows better than to celebrate too early. Given the size of this behemoth, he figures it will not stay frozen for long. 
they need to do some damage while they can. With that in mind, he charges at the frozen spider, ready to take it down a notch. He leaps into the air, aiming to strike the icy giant. But then, a closer look into the spider's eyes reveals a chilling fact, this creature's eyes are moving. It is fully aware of what is about to come its way. Immediately, the monster breaks free from its frosty shackles, shattering the ice as if it were mere glass. Dion, still mid-air with his sword poised for a decisive blow, suddenly finds himself in a precarious position, looking more like an appetizer about to dive straight into the monster's gaping maw. But just before the spider can turn him into a snack, Dion whips out his shield guard technique. And as if the gods decided to add a little more drama to the scene, lightning balls start zapping towards the spider, giving it a taste of electric fury. While Jian is up there doing his aerial ballet, the spider shifts its menacing gaze towards a new challenger on the battlefield. Now Corporal Lee enters into the scene. With all the authority of a seasoned hero, Lee strides towards the spider, exuding the kind of confidence that would make Superman tip his cape in respect. Corporal Lee does not waste a moment on small talk and dives straight into action with his metal manipulation powers. With a flourish of his hands, he conjures metal chains, snaring the spider in a metallic grip that tightens by the second. The process intensifies, and the spider writhes in agony as the chains constrict. Lee is employing a technique known as Metal Smash, a rank D skill that crushes metal using mana. The more metal he manipulates, the more mana it consumes. As he is ramping up the pressure, the system sends him a warning that his mana is rapidly depleting, now at 84%. But Lee is on a mission, he is not here to play around. Ignoring the warnings, he intensifies the process further, and another alert pops up. His mana has now dropped to 76%. With a final push, his metal chains constrict with such force that the spider is smashed into hundreds of pieces, reminiscent of a watermelon hit with a sledgehammer. Jian watches in awe, his jaws practically hitting the floor at the display of raw power. It seems he is not only one whose jaw is hitting the floor but everyone else in the vicinity is also left dumbfounded to see the spectacle. Greenish blood and limbs scatter in every direction. But amidst the chaos, Corporal Lee stands defiantly, basking in the success of his powers. With a newfound confidence surging through him, he is convinced he can take down this gate, and whatever else comes his way. A wider grin spreads across Corporal Lee's face, not just because he is about to save the civilians by stopping this monster, but also because he is eyeing the reward, all of it, for himself. As the beast struggles to regain its footing and emits a terrifying scream that echoes throughout the area, Corporal Lee stands before it, utterly unfazed. At this moment, he feels invincible, a maniac reveling in his power against the colossal behemoth. He begins to manipulate the metal balls scattered around, launching a barrage at the creature to squash it completely, intending to drain every last bit of temper from the monster. The balls aim straight for the spider's vulnerable spots, attempting to penetrate its thick skin. However, the monster's hide proves too resilient, refusing to let the balls through. But Corporal Lee, ever resourceful, is not deterred. He makes the balls spin, adding a devastating twist to his attack. Realizing its predicament, the monster seems to understand he is fucked. Meanwhile, the fucker is laughing like a maniac, taunts the creature, asking how it feels to be churned up inside like ingredients in a blender. But the monster is too overwhelmed by pain to respond, can do nothing but groan. Finally, it collapses to the ground, lifeless, as blood gushes out, marking the end of the beast and the triumph of Corporal Lee, who stands victorious, a testament to his formidable powers and strategic mind. At this point, Jian is still reeling from shock. He cannot wrap his head around the fact that the entire garrison of guards could not even scratch that monster. Yet here's this guy, Corporal Lee, capturing it single-handedly. Jian has been through countless raids and encountered many high-ranking players, but he has never seen anyone as laid back as Corporal Lee. He starts to entertain the idea that maybe Lee is from some mythical s rank ranker class, the kind you only hear about in Legends. But now, there seems to be someone else as well grinding his teeth and seething with frustration. And this mysterious guy is afraid that Corporal Lee is about to steal all the glory and potentially ruin his quest by popping up out of nowhere. Finally, Jian turns to Lee, introducing himself as Jian Manhu from the Soul Station Guard Team 2, and bluntly asks if Lee is an s rank player. But Lee, cool as a cucumber, tells him not to jump to conclusions so quickly, leaving Jian bewildered by the unexpected response. Lee then casually mentions that the first wave is not over yet. Right on cue, more spider monsters start pouring out of the portal, leaving Jian dumbfounded. But Corporal Lee is grinning like a maniac, over the moon to see more of these creatures emerging. At this point, Lee has one thing crystal clear, he is going to solo these suckers. And with that determination gleaming in his eyes, he is ready to take on whatever the gate throws his way. Now we are outside the chaos, where a colossal black blob dominates the scene, and the military has descended upon the area. It is not just one or two platoons, it is a full-blown army, with the 1st Battalion and the 3rd Battalion both on the ground. Adding to the mix, the Blue Flower Guild arrives at the scene, and one member remarks that the sight of military troops brings back memories. Another guild member suggests gathering all the mage players to unleash some battering magic on the ominous dome. 
However, someone opposes the idea, explaining that it is not just magic, it is a rule created by the system. Breaking through is not possible unless there is a way to override the system. So, for now, all they can do is wait for time to pass. Military choppers start descending onto the scene. We also get to see a red system alert that provides crucial information about the ongoing event. It is an unlucky event unfolding in the area, and once someone enters, there is no leaving. There is also an entry level limit set at level 15 and the main goal is to survive for 6 hours or defeat the boss monster to escape the red area. The clock is ticking, with only 39 minutes passed in 5 hours and 21 minutes still ahead on the countdown. As the choppers finally touch down, figures of authority emerge, ready to take action. Among them are the Lady President of the Flower Guild and everyone's favorite battalion commander, who wastes no time inquiring about the Blue Flower Guild's situation with players under level 15. With a touch of sass, the Lady President fires back, questioning whether the battalion commander truly believes the Blue Flower Guild would have players like that. She further challenges the notion of sending a rescue team inside, emphasizing that entering the area is tantamount to walking into certain death. Undeterred, the commander emphasizes the 800 innocent lives at stake and questions how they can prioritize soldier lives over civilians. He then reveals their trump card, Corporal Lee, who's been on a relentless rampage, slashing through monsters like there is no tomorrow. Suddenly, a sharp leg hurdles towards Corporal Lee. But he is quick to react, activating his strengthening body transformation skill and making a swift exit, leaving the spider's attack to meet only the unforgiving ground. As Corporal Lee gracefully glides through the air, the relentless monster is hot on his trail, giving him no respite. Thinking on his feet, he turns to the Soul Station Guard and instructs them to freeze the pursuing creature, just as they did before. Dion immediately responds with a crisp understood, and the team goes into action, unleashing another barrage of frost rune blasts. The beast finds itself getting a literal case of cold feet as it turns into a frozen popsicle. Amidst the icy chaos, a new player arrives on the scene, eyeing a lady who seems to be deeply involved in freezing the monster. Out of nowhere, this interloper lunges at her with monstrous energy, attempting to knock her off guard. However, Corporal Lee, ever vigilant, jumps into the fray, utilizing his metal control powers to manipulate ball-like objects. With precision, he hurls them toward the spider, landing direct hits on the monster's belly. Employing his metal spin technique, Lee ensures the balls spin to pierce through the thick spider skin. The monster, now with balls inside, screams in agony before collapsing lifeless on the ground. With one threat neutralized, attention turns to the other monster, chilling in the icy aftermath. But unexpectedly, it breaks free from the icy mess, intensifying its roar, signaling that the fight is far from over. Corporal Lee, far from slowing down, is even more fired up and ready to send the monster to the same place his friend went. However, a warning pops up, cautioning him about his rapidly depleting mana. Nevertheless, he continues his relentless assault on the monster, delivering a beating of a lifetime. Undeterred, Corporal Lee once again unleashes his metal smash ability, squashing the monster like a watermelon. Yet, this victory comes at a cost, as his mana now stands at a meager 39%. Exhaustion begins to set in, and Lee starts to feel the toll of his intense efforts. On the sidelines, this mysterious guy observes Corporal Lee, utterly baffled. He is convinced that a player of Lee's caliber would not bother with subways or trains, and he cannot comprehend why someone like him is hanging around Soul Station. Fuming, he realizes that Corporal Lee has thrown a wrench into the plan, and he never anticipated failing his first mission like this. A notification window pops up, revealing that the guy has failed to achieve the following goals for his quest, to bide his time until the venomous ironclad spider at Gate 1 nests inside Soul Station. As for the reward, he stands at the villain candidate rank, and completing the quest is crucial to increase his ranks. The window warns that if he does not complete the quest properly after accepting it, it will be game over with death. Devastated, this dude is determined to wipe Corporal Lee out of the equation. Meanwhile, we see civilians gathered in certain parts of Soul Station, while other areas are eerily deserted. The monstrous creatures are on the receiving end of a thorough beating, and with this monster demise, the first wave comes to an end. Corporal Lee, victorious, shouts at the guards to gather around. Dion appears, expressing gratitude to Corporal Lee for his assistance, acknowledging that the guards could not have stopped the first wave on their own. Seizing the opportunity, Jian once again takes the liberty to inquire about Corporal Lee's name and expresses curiosity about his player rank. Instead of responding, Corporal Lee starts scanning the other soldiers standing around. The male soldiers are puzzled, wondering why this guy is giving them a cold stare, while the female guards find it charming and start blushing. Jian notices the peculiar behavior and asks Corporal Lee if something is wrong. However, Corporal Lee seems lost in thought, trying to figure out if the guy who triggered the event is present. He recalls hearing that the culprit was supposed to be one of the guards, but the individual is nowhere to be found. Suddenly, the platoon vice president enters the scene, and Corporal Lee reports to her, inquiring if all the civilians have been evacuated. Dion is visibly losing his composure, questioning how an S-rank player is involved in military service, as S-rank players are supposed to be exempt, given their uncontrollable abilities. 
the vice president takes charge, providing details about the situation. She explains that the spiders were enormous, so they divided the citizens into small groups and evacuated them by placing them in rooms with narrow passageways. Fortunately, no one was seriously injured. She instructs Corporal Lee to report everything that happened during the first wave. So, Corporal Lee is basically playing detective, scanning the surroundings in a quest to nab the culprit. He is already pressed for time, and the sneaky suspect seems to be playing hide and seek somewhere else. In an attempt to break the tension, Corporal Lee throws in the idea that there might be a double gate. The Plato Lady and Jian both react like they just got hit by a surprise train. Corporal Lee's mind is on overdrive, thinking about the possibility that if he starts searching among the 800 civilians here, the culprit could easily slip away. And if things go south and the second wave kicks in, he is determined to stay one step ahead of that guy, or he is pretty much toast. Now, we are back outside, witnessing the battalion commander barking orders at Lieutenant Lee H. Women. He appoints him as the field commanding officer for the Seoul Station Rescue Operation. So, Lieutenant Lee promptly reports back, assuring everyone he's got it under control. Now, his platoon members are gossiping among themselves, wondering how the lieutenant is not a C-rank player when he is not even level 15 yet. The redhead, not exactly thrilled with the comments, is definitely not vibing with the chit-chat behind his back. The battalion commander steps in with a commanding voice, expressing that it is with a heavy heart he is sending in his low-level troops. However, he emphasizes that the lives of the citizens are at stake and instructs them to protect them as soldiers. The energetic soldiers respond with a resounding yes, sir in unison. Then, the battalion commander singles out the lieutenant, who turns around curiously. The commander makes it clear that when lieutenant encounters Lee Hunwick inside the station, he must actively incorporate Corporal Lee's input into the operations. The lieutenant, not exactly a fan of Corporal Lee, cannot quite swallow the idea of following his command so easily. Now, back inside the station, we see another gate has appeared in the area, and the first thing that greets everyone is a creepy skeleton with even its head fractured. Suddenly, a system window pops up, assuring the culprit that monsters in the area will not attack him. But as the culprit gazes at a bunch of skeletons on the ground, a shiver runs down his spine. He questions the system, exclaiming, what the heck is this? They are all dead, and wonders if this is what will not attack really means. Then, another notification appears, laying out the quest the user has to complete. The first one is to bide his time until the venomous ironclad spider at gate 1 has nested inside the soul station. The second task is to slaughter at least 500 civilians by any means necessary. The third quest involves delivering the time received from the elite monster, the Evil Seeker 11, at Gate 2 to the Villain Alliance. Now, the culprit decides to go along with this bizarre idea. After all, completing this quest could elevate him to the esteemed rank of a regular villain. Despite the downright weirdness of the quests, he figures he has no option but to roll with it. It is not every day you get handed such an unusual mission. Just as the culprit is soaking in the strange quest menu, out of nowhere, steel balls come flying at him from behind. But wait, before these metallic projectiles could turn him into a human pin cushion, Mother Nature decides to make an entrance. A bunch of roots burst out of the ground like they have been waiting for their cue in a magical garden play. In a blink of an eye, the roots wrap around the culprit, providing him with a full-blown cover from the impending steel ball barrage. Now, the culprit is grinding after realizing that he is no longer standing out like a sore thumb and does not have to skulk in the shadows to complete his missions anymore. On the flip side, there stands Corporal Lee, armed with his trusty steel balls and ready for action. He starts spilling the beans about the culprit as master plan. Apparently, the sneaky guy was plotting to hide among the citizens, waiting for the guards to become instant sushi during the first wave. And just in case there were other players among the civilians, he planned to cosplay as a guard to avoid suspicion. Giving credit where credit is due, Corporal Lee acknowledges the sheer brilliance of this guy's elaborate scheme. Then, in a classic dramatic twist, Corporal Lee drops Tang Jusip's real name like a bombshell. The guy behind the roots practically jumps out of his skin at the sound of his own name. Now this dude finds himself visibly shaken, and shoots Corporal Lee a curious glance, probably wondering if they attended villain school together or something. This is where we come to know that Tang Jusip is more than just a regular player. He is a B-rank player villain candidate with the ability of a cannibal tree, and he has aspirations to climb the ranks and earn the prestigious title of the Black Tentacle Villain, and in future he will be the one. Now, my man flashes him a cheeky grin, letting him know he is well aware of villainous types like him. But Scarface is left utterly dumbfounded. The fact that Corporal Lee knows all about him, while Scarface does not know jack shit about Corporal Lee is scaring the bejesus out of this guy. He then quickly hushes Corporal Lee, and insists him to keep the villain talk on the down low. Without skipping a beat, Scarface launches his roots towards our guy, assuming Corporal Lee must be some high-ranking player. But with a sly grin, Scarface makes it crystal clear that no matter Corporal Lee's rank, his abilities pale in comparison to Scarface's own compatible powers. He scoffs at the idea of Corporal Lee's metal balls doing any damage. This is the moment when fire starts to dance around Corporal Lee's face, his grin widening as if he has already cracked the code. 
Taking a deep breath, fire swirls into his mouth as he casually asks Scarface the million-dollar question, what exactly is his ability compatible with? Now, let us take a stroll down Corporal Lee's memory lane, where this Scarface guy wrecked havoc with his root manipulation. Even the innocent civilians were in his grasp, getting utterly humiliated and torn apart by him. Back then, he shouted at the top of his lungs for the Great Steel Emperor to come out of hiding. With no regard for human life, he asked the Steel Emperor if he is gonna hide and watch his cannibal tree slaughter and devour every human in their grasp. And this guy, Black Tentacle Young Jusef, has abilities that consist of a cannibal tree, a rank player. Finally, we catch a glimpse of the Steel Emperor standing amidst these swirling roots. As the camera zooms in, we see him bleeding his lungs out. Just a small warning before we head into the next two episodes, I have made a mistake with a certain person's pronouns. They were sometimes being referred to as a female inside the comic, but that was just a translator error, because that person is clearly a male character, and I unfortunately decided to refer them as a female because of the mistranslation. Please ignore this mistake as you listen ahead, as it will not be repeated after episodes 11 and 12. Thank you. Here we are again, back at the scene where Scarface is gearing up to throw down on our guy, but our hero not even flinching. In fact, there is this quirky smirk playing on his lips, a dead giveaway he has got everything figured out. As Scarface's tree roots start lunging at Corporal Lee, our boy is sidestepping them with such flair, you would think he is working through his morning workout routine. Meanwhile, Scarface is steaming, utterly bamboozled by Corporal Lee's near-divine agility. Just when you think you have seen it all, Corporal Lee decides to kick it up a notch. With a sudden leap, he is off, vanishing into thin air, only to reappear moving faster than a speeding bullet, his trusty metal balls at the ready. With a flick of his wrist, those balls are soaring towards Scarface like heat-seeking missiles. But let us not sell Scarface short, the man's got moves too. He is weaving through those metal threats, dodging left and right with his tree roots, making sure not a single one lands a hit. Once more, Scarface flings his roots towards our guy, aiming to trap him in a corner. But Corporal Lee is not the type to be easily subdued. With a swift leap, he takes to the air, leaving Scarface's attempts grounded. The frustration on Scarface's face is palpable, each second adding to his disbelief. He cannot fathom that Corporal Lee's simple tactics are outmaneuvering him, and the sight of Lee advancing fearlessly is what unnerves him the most. Mid-leap, Lee employs his signature finger gesture again, sending metal balls raining down towards Scarface. Yet, Scarface, ever the quick thinker, shields himself with his roots, creating a makeshift fortress. Encased within his rooty bastion, he shouts down to Corporal Lee, calling him a moron. He taunts Lee, proclaiming he can launch all the attacks he wants, but it is all in vain. None will breach his vegetative defense. At this point, Corporal Lee lands deftly atop the root shield that Scarface has conjured, a wide grin spreading across his face. He states that looks like I have found enough firewood for the day, a comment that flies right over Scarface's head. Unperturbed, Scarface retorts, insisting that despite Lee's proximity, he is powerless against him, mocking Lee's ignorance of his true capabilities. In a bold move, Scarface reaches out to grab Corporal Lee's hand, intending to fully deploy his cannibal tree powers by attempting to consume Lee's arm. However, instead of panic, a broad grin remains plastered on Lee's face, and fire starts flickering at the corners of his mouth. Just as Scarface thinks he is about to digest his foe, Corporal Lee showcases his resilience by activating his body's strengthening ability, transforming his arm into steel. Scarface, baffled by his inability to digest Lee's arm, scratches his head in confusion, completely taken aback by Lee's unexpected prowess. Meanwhile, Lee, undeterred and as confident as ever, opens his mouth wide. As he inhales deeply, fire begins to amass within, signaling the unleashing of yet another formidable ability. At this critical point, Scarface starts to grasp the severity of his predicament. The thought racing through his mind is sheer bewilderment. Initially, he was only dodging metal balls, and now, out of nowhere, Corporal Lee is unleashing fire powers. Where in the world did this fire ability come from? He wonders, panic setting in. Realizing his imminent defeat, Scarface begins to plead for his life, claiming he is on a crucial quest. He offers Corporal Lee all the rewards meant for the quest's completion in exchange for mercy. Scarface, now with a grin, thinks he has played his best card. Confident no one could refuse such a lucrative offer. However, as the fire in Corporal Lee's mouth grows more intense, Scarface, desperate, tries to renegotiate, promising to dedicate everything once the quest is completed. But Corporal Lee is not buying it. He dismisses Scarface's plea as utter nonsense, revealing that Scarface had tried the same deceit in Lee's previous life. Determined not to be fooled again, Lee stands firm against Scarface's manipulation. Scarface is utterly confused by the mention of a previous life, blurting out a bewildered what. But before he can grasp the situation, Corporal Lee, with no room for further discussion, commands, Just die already. He unleashes a ferocious blast of fire from his mouth, engulfing everything in the vicinity. Inside his root shelter, Scarface can only scream as he is consumed by the flames, his pleas for mercy lost in the roar of the fire that reduces him to ashes. Now, we find ourselves outside, where we see the lower-ranking soldiers about to make their entrance into Soul Station. 
The platoon commander, in a moment of fatherly concern mixed with military sternness, tells his soldiers there is no predicting what kind of gate has swung open inside. So, he urges everyone to pull themselves together in the most polite way possible, of course. As we zoom in on the soldiers in line, it is clear they are psyching themselves up, trying to mentally prepare before they dive into this proverbial hellhole. Just as they inch closer to the danger zone, a system alert pops up like an unwanted ad, blaring that this is a dangerous area. But our soldiers are not the type to click the back button. With courage cranked up to the max, they are determined to step inside. However, the system, in a voice that probably reminds them of every doomsayer they have ever ignored, announces that once they are in this nightmare, there is no stepping outside unless they tick off some pretty specific conditions. But these soldiers are on a mission all their own. As soon as they cross into the station, they spring into action, each taking on their role with a mix of dread and determination. Suddenly, Private Park lets out a yell that could wake the dead, absolutely petrified because right in front of him lies a gigantic spider, sprawled out on the ground, lifeless. The platoon leader, without missing a beat, whispers to Private Park with the urgency of a parent in a library, telling him to dude shut the fuck up. As they proceed with all the caution they can muster, someone calls out, who goes there? The platoon leader quickly pipes up, we are the amped rescue team, at your service. On the other end of the callout stands Jian, the ever-vigilant Seoul Station Guard. So, the guard spills the beans about the portal and all the thrilling bits and pieces. The lieutenant, ever so curious, inquires about the civilian casualties and what exactly went down. The guard, proud as can be, explains that thanks to an amped operation, everyone was evacuated, and every guard is following their orders to the letter. Now, the lieutenant starts to get a tad heated, immediately asking about a female soldier, bombarding the guard with questions about her well-being. The guard, taken aback by the lieutenant's relentless inquiry, finally mentions that the female soldier is managing the situation at the temporary shelter. But then the guard casually mentions that the guy he is talking about is Corporal Lee hyun -wook. Apparently, everyone here is dancing to his tune, and of course, the lieutenant is grinding his teeth because he has never been a fan of our boy. But immediately, Private Park jumps into the conversation, asking if the dude in question has spiky hair and sometimes sports a sinister smile. The guard confirms with a quick yes, and Private Park chimes in, suggesting to the platoon leader that it seems to be Corporal Lee hyun -wook after all. However, it looks like the platoon leader is not thrilled about the topic of our guy. In a burst of frustration, he snaps at Private Park, telling him to shut the fuck up and remember his place. Poor Private Park just turns around and apologizes. After all, you cannot talk back to the platoon leader. The platoon leader then raises his voice at the officer, reminding him that Corporal Lee is just a lowly F-ranker, while he himself is a C-ranker and therefore the one in charge now. But then, the officer throws a curveball, questioning platoon leader on how he managed to enter the place. He points out that there is a restriction at level 15 that bars anyone above level 15 from entering the station and emphasizes the question of how the platoon leader got in if he is such a high ranker. Now, the platoon leader is at a loss for words, just staring blankly at the officer, unsure of what to say. With a weighty tone, the officer makes it clear that he is aware of Corporal Lee's rank because he has heard it earlier. But he lays it out plainly that he is following Lee's orders because he believes Corporal Lee is fit for command. Besides, the officer reveals that he is a C-ranker too, so there is no obligation for him to follow the orders of a mere platoon leader. He continues to throw truth bombs at the platoon leader, humiliating him by stating that although he calls himself the rescue squad, all he is doing is flaunting his arrogance. He challenges the platoon leader, questioning what his plan is to rescue the trapped civilians and whether he even has a plan or a way out amidst this unfortunate event. Caught off guard, the platoon leader starts to panic, suggesting that for now, their best bet is to build a barricade at the entrance with a narrow passageway and bide their time. But then, the vice president arrives, announcing they are in big trouble. The platoon leader rushes towards her, concerned about her well-being and asking if she is hurt. Instead of exchanging pleasantries or high fives, she questions why he came here. He reveals his intention to rescue her. She cuts him off, telling him to drop the act because there is a double gate spotted, and civilians has found it. Now we see the civilians going absolutely bonkers, demanding to speak to whoever's in charge. The crowd is furious, itching to know why they kept it a secret that there was a double gate. Then, one of the guards tries to calm the civilians, saying they wanted to avoid causing chaos. But there is this one guy in the crowd, really making a scene, questioning how they can trust the guards. He goes on to challenge their duty, asking if they even understand what it means to be a guard. He throws out a zinger, suggesting they are just using civilians as human shields to buy time. Then, the lady who was totally called out retorts, asking where in the world he heard such nonsense. But then, someone from the crowd pipes up, saying it was the guard with the scar on his nose who spilled the beans. Back in the fray, and surprisingly, Scarface is still kicking despite being half-charred. His cockiness has not taken a hit, though. He claims he was fully prepared for this moment, the opportunity too good to miss, and he cannot believe he is about to lose everything. But my guy, cool as a cucumber, armed with his metal spheres, tells this charred dude to quit his moaning and just die already because he has got a schedule to keep. 
With a flick of his wrist, the steel balls whiz towards him, and just like that, Scarface meets his demise. My guy stands there, wondering why all these villains seem to have the same old spiel, and honestly, he is sick to death of it. Then, out of nowhere, a light begins to shimmer before him, forcing him to shield his eyes with his hand. A pathway appears out of thin air, and in the blink of an eye, there is a massive gateway before us, with two birds gliding towards it. As these creatures draw nearer, it becomes clear they are not just birds but girls with wings, dressed in white, like angels descending from the heavens. Right on cue, a system notification pops up, revealing that Mana is recovering at a rapid pace. We then see these two angels hovering around our guy like bees around a flower, and in the blink of an eye, his health has also recovered. These ladies keep hovering around him, carefree as can be, while my guy stands there, unfazed, because he is a Sigma male, after all. Another system notification arrives, announcing that a new quest has been initiated. A devilish grin starts to etch across his face as the system window pops up, spilling all the juicy details about this quest. It is called Lightbearer, Become the Dawn of the World. The quest narrative reveals that Corporal Lee had stopped the conspiracy of the betrayer of mankind, the villain, and now he has the chance to become the protector of humanity, the guardian. While these two ladies are still hovering around him, the system reveals that this quest will guide him to become the light of the world and asks if he is willing to accept the quest. With unfazed confidence, my man responds, absolutely not. Now, the once diligent ladies, brimming with enthusiasm, are left utterly bewildered by the unexpected choice he made. Then, the system window pops up again, asking if he is sure he wants to decline. Staring at the system window, he is mulling over the fact that the Guardian quests, with their pretext of protecting humanity, sound noble but in the end, it is just another group. While the rewards would be guaranteed, his actions would be restricted periodically. Above all, his main concern is that a quest is merely a quest, but humans are not so simple. He reflects on the possibility that if this quest is misused, a guardian could turn into a villain at any time. It could be the same as humanity's worst betrayal by Gordon Pracy, who, after all, was a guardian as well. So, seething in frustration, he straightforwardly states decline once again. But now, when he takes a casual glance to his right, it is clear that the blonde angel is not exactly on board with his life choices. And when he looks to his left, the situation is similar with the redhead angel, who appears even more visibly upset, bordering on angry. After rejecting the quest, the portal that had once opened now begins to close. In a blink, it vanishes, leaving him just standing there. Then, with swift gestures of his hands, he extends his arm and conjures a key from a pile of skeletons. The system window pops up again, announcing that he has won the first reward of the lucky event, Akashic Armory Key Number 2. Apparently, this is the item that the scar-faced, root-manipulating villain was searching for, and he was dead set on acquiring it, even if it meant slaughtering innocent citizens. If it is the main quest reward, then there is no doubt it is an object the villains need. A devilish grin cracks across his face. Given that every villain is eyeing this key, he decides to keep it for himself. At this point, he is dead set on screwing over those villainous suckers big time in this life. Now, Scarface guard makes a grand entrance into the scene, making it crystal clear to the fuming civilians that he is the only guard with a scar. So, they start confronting him, and as it turns out, he is not the one who fed the civilians bogus info to stir up chaos. But the civilians are still not having any of it. One of them points out that, either way, the guards hid the info about the double gate from everyone, so there is no guarantee they will not be used as human shields. Enter Corporal Lee, marching towards the angry crowd, absolutely livid at the sight. He cannot believe that Scarface, the root-manipulating motherfucker, is causing inconveniences from beyond the grave. The platoon leader steps in, trying to calm down this overly agitated guy who is really losing his cool. She tells him that even if they cannot trust the guards, they should at least have faith in the ant rescue team and urges him to listen to her. Meanwhile, my guy is actually amused by the situation. He is happy to see Battalion Commander Major Kim kang contributing to the chaos at Seoul Station, just like in his previous life. Only this time, Major Kim has sent the platoon leader, who arrived just when she was needed most. Back to the riled up crowd, where the skeptical guy is throwing doubts at the platoon leader, questioning why they should trust her. He mocks the idea of a rescue team of just six people, calling it the joke of the year, and questions their rescue plan. But before things can escalate further, Corporal Lee storms into the scene, radiating authority. He yells at the top of his lungs, with all the energy of a soldier, reminding them that if the second wave hits, they are all going to be in serious trouble. But it appears that these two particular individuals in the crowd are still not satisfied and raise their voices, stating they just cannot trust any of them and blaming them for the current predicament of the civilians. Corporal Lee counters this with a glare so intense it could pierce through souls, challenging the guy by asking, since they do not trust the military, what alternative they propose. This leaves everyone momentarily stunned, and a heavy silence descends as they all confront the harsh reality of their situation. Even the platoon commander is left agape. Then, Corporal Lee begins to speak, revealing that the rail guards fought with their lives on the line. He questions if their sacrifice is not enough to earn the civilians' trust. 
He then asks if there is anyone among them who would be willing to put their lives on the line for others. Now, those two loudmouths who were the most vocal are left utterly speechless, confronted with the reality of the sacrifices made on their behalf. In a bid to win over the crowd's sympathy, the platoon commander takes a moment to criticize Corporal Lee for his intimidating approach towards the civilians and questions his audacity for giving them cold glares and treating them poorly. She demands to know where he has been hiding all this time, questioning why he is only showing up now. Corporal Lee then reveals that he has just secured the double gate. At this moment, Private Park is filled with joy to see his friend accomplishing such a feat, while the vice president standing beside him is left in amazement. Meanwhile, the rail guard acknowledges that such a feat is expected of an S-ranker. However, as usual, the platoon leader tries to downplay his efforts, accusing him of lying. She claims there is no way he could have secured the double gate all by himself and accuses him of blatantly lying to everyone's face. But our guy does not care about her accusations. He remains focused on the bigger picture, reminding everyone that the second wave is imminent. He urges all the civilians to find the best possible hiding spots, emphasizing the urgency of the situation and the need for immediate action. The scar-faced officer immediately springs into action, responding to the command by leading all the civilians to barricade the entrance with chairs and desks, urging them to hide as best as they can. Observing this, the platoon commander is left with what can only be described as a lost puppy face, seething with frustration. She is utterly baffled by the commanding authority Corporal Lee is radiating, which leaves her no room to interject or get a word in edgewise. This leads her to question herself, wondering if this man is really the Lee Hyunwook she thought she knew. Back where the portal popped up, and we are ticking down to the second wave like it is the premiere of the worst movie sequel ever. In this crucial moment, Private Park steps forward, handing Corporal Lee his precious blade and the Vice President her book, items he thought they might need. They are both quick to thank him, appreciating the gesture. Now, Corporal Lee, chilling on the ground like he is about to start a campfire story, signals everyone to huddle up because he has got some tea to spill. He reveals that the spider monsters from the first wave were not mentioned in the monster manual. However, thanks to his own metal manipulation abilities and the efforts of the guard force, they managed to stop them. However, he cannot shake off the feeling that for a surprise monster attack, it was a bit on the light side. The scar-faced officer agrees, acknowledging that while the spider monsters were certainly formidable, there was something off about them, making their threat seem less than expected. Corporal Lee then drops his theory. Maybe the reason these creepy crawlies did not live up to the nightmare hype is that they were just the opening act. It is the first wave, after all, hinting that the real show is yet to start. So, Corporal Lee, getting a bit more casual, throws out a thought that, since an unlucky event is still an event, it probably has its own stages. He is betting that during the second wave, we might see monsters that use some kind of spider characteristic venom. He suggests, with a nod to everyone, that it might be smart to don gas masks beforehand, just in case. Meanwhile, we catch a glimpse of the platoon leader in the background, and she is practically fuming. Steam could be coming out of her ears at the sight of not just the vice president, but even the guards hanging on to every word our guy says. It is clear she is not thrilled about the attention he is commanding, and it is driving her up the wall to see everyone so intently listening to him. Corporal Lee further explains that, given the vastness of Soul Station, if poison gas starts spreading, the civilians could be at risk. So, they must lure the monsters to the outside platform at all costs. He then decides to lay out the details of this operation for everyone. He says that when the second wave starts, they must draw the monsters' attention and lure them outside. Lee volunteers for the luring task, while the rescue team and guards will wait outside in units, ready to attack the monsters from covered positions, much like they did during the first wave. The key is to hold their ground and bide their time. He stresses to everyone the importance of keeping their distance from the monsters at all costs. As predicted, the second wave of monsters begins to emerge from the portal, and the first thing they do is spray deadly poison across the area. Following the plan, Lee lures the monsters behind him, drawing them into the open. Following this, the soldiers and guards spring into action, unleashing a barrage of bullets on the creatures. They then start freezing them to ensure they cannot get any closer, executing the plan with precision and teamwork. And then, the boss of the monsters makes its grand entrance, changing the game entirely. Corporal Lee starts to lose his cool because this is not how things were supposed to go down. As the camera zooms out, we see the monster in all its terrifying glory, making the six-feet-tall Corporal Lee look like an ant by comparison. Now, Corporal Lee is terrified out of his wits and yells at the top of his lungs for everyone to run. Meanwhile, the platoon leader is completely baffled, wondering what on earth is going on. But then, in a moment of clarity amidst the chaos, he yells to everyone below, telling them to stay put and hold their positions. He insists that there is no change to their raid plan. They must lure the behemoth away from the civilians. The behemoth of a monster starts to survey its surroundings, noticing its fallen comrades sprawled on the ground like yesterday's trash, which makes it groan in frustration at the sight of its comrades' blood spilled everywhere. Then, it lets out a massive roar, with our guy standing defiantly in front of it, still trying to wrap his head around the situation. In his previous life, he remembers that the boss monster was supposed to appear after the second wave, not during it. 
So, he is left pondering how the future could have changed so drastically. Now we are at the scene where the soldiers and officers are on standby, waiting for orders. Even they can hear the monstrous roars echoing through the air, so loud and piercing it is like needles drilling into their eardrums. There stands Corporal Lee, defiantly facing the monstrous behemoth. In a fit of rage, the monster decides to throw a temper tantrum and attempts to strike down Corporal Lee. But with quick reflexes, Lee takes two steps back, dodging the blow. The giant's hand crashes into the ground with such force that it shatters the concrete like it is nothing. At this moment, one thing becomes crystal clear to the utterly terrified Corporal Lee. If he does not get his act together and stop this monster, it will mean annihilation for everyone present. The stakes could not be higher, and it is all on him to prevent a catastrophe. We are back in action, and Corporal Lee is gearing up to take down this beast. He is pretty convinced that if he does not put an end to this monstrosity here and now, it is going to be curtains for everyone at the Soul Station. Flexing his metal manipulation powers, he launches a metal smash, and a light begins to flicker ominously above the monster's head. But, pulling off this smash move is not exactly free of charge. His mon has taken a hit and has plummeted to 72%. And, would you believe it? Despite the flashy entrance, the monster does not even have a scratch on it. Instead of the intended smash effect ramping up, it starts fizzling out on this particular adversary. Then, the system window pops up with another cheerful warning that the metal smash was a no-go because the strength of the steel is apparently more hardcore than the force of the metal smash. And just like that, Corporal Lee is left scratching his head, probably feeling like he just got slapped in the face without warning. Meanwhile, the monster is not just standing around waiting for an invitation, it swiftly lashes out with its giant metallic sharp leg, aiming straight for Corporal Lee, who is now only a hair's breadth away from becoming shish kebab. But wait, Corporal Lee's not out of tricks yet. He whips out his metal skill combo, manipulating metal in such a way that he is able to pull off a mid-air acrobatic move, dodging the leg as it whooshes past him. As the camera pans out, we are hit with the jaw-dropping reality of just how massive this behemoth really is. It is clear now why Corporal Lee's metal smash was about as effective as a mosquito bite on this giant. Finding himself in a real pickle, Corporal Lee realizes that his usual go-to moves will not cut it, literally. After all, if a pillar can get sliced like a cucumber by this creature, what chance does his body's strengthening transformation stand? There he is, in midair, witnessing another deadly strike headed his way. But Corporal Lee is not one to give up easily. With grace that would put a gymnast to shame, he pulls off some more of his signature midair acrobatics, regaining his balance with the finesse of a cat. Then, in a move that screams hold my beer, he starts running up the monster's leg. It is clear that a light bulb has gone off in Corporal Lee's head. He is cooking up something risky, something so out of the box that it just might work. Because when you are the equivalent of an ad to a giant, what have you got to lose? Meanwhile, the cavalry arrives in the form of the platoon leader and the vice president. But they are not exactly the cheerleading squad Corporal Lee might have hoped for. Without missing a beat, the platoon leader starts laying into Corporal Lee for not sticking to the original plan of luring the monster outside to take it down. Taking a trip down memory lane, we find ourselves with Corporal Lee reflecting on his interactions with platoon leader Lee Minhee. In these recollections, we see a younger Corporal Lee addressing her with her full rank, tactical action officer Lee Minhee. However, Lee Minhee, ever the tomboy, does not seem too pleased with the formality. She challenges him, half-jokingly asking if he is trying to butter her up or make excuses by being so formal. As Corporal Lee steps out from the shadows, he acknowledges how he made it out alive this time, attributing his survival to Lieutenant Lee. But the lieutenant, ever humble, tries to brush off the praise, insisting that doing her job is nothing extraordinary. Corporal Lee, however, goes further, expressing his gratitude for having her as his partner. He recalls a time when she claimed to have memorized all the tactical manuals required for an officer, questioning if she was serious about her claim. But she retorts, challenging the notion that battle tactics can be reduced to mere memorization. She clarifies that while she does absorb the information, it is more about letting the knowledge mature in her mind. This, she explains, is crucial for overcoming the limitations of her warp abilities, which require a deep tactical understanding to utilize effectively and at the right moments. Lee Minnie proudly asserts that every tactic she employs is a testament to her relentless struggle for survival. It is not just about memorizing manuals, it is about applying that knowledge practically and creatively on the battlefield, something she has mastered over the years. Back in the present, the scene is intense. Lieutenant Lee Minnie is practically screaming her lungs out at Corporal Lee who is engaging the behemoth single-handedly in a daring display of bravery, or recklessness, depending on how one sees it. But Corporal Lee is far too entangled in his dance of survival against the monster to heed the vice president or the platoon leader's concerns. With every acrobatic maneuver and twist in the air, powered by his metal manipulation abilities, Corporal Lee's mana is plummeting at an alarming rate. From a concerning 45%, it rapidly depletes further down to just 32%. 
Despite the dire situation, he is fully committed to executing his unconventional plan, believing in Lieutenant Lee Min-hee's tactical acumen to decipher his strategy. As another of the monster's legs comes hurtling towards him, he dodges it with the same mid-air finesse. The collateral damage is becoming increasingly apparent, with pillars tumbling down amidst the chaos. It is then that a realization dawns on platoon leader Lee Min-hee. Corporal Lee is not just evading the monster's attacks, he is intentionally directing them towards the pillars. This revelation brings a new layer of concern to platoon leader Lee Min-hee. Even if Corporal Lee's strategy leads to the monster taking down all the pillars, she is acutely aware that the collapsing roof poses a significant risk. There is a high chance that their plan could backfire, potentially bringing both the monster and Corporal Lee down under the rubble. In a critical moment, platoon leader Lee Min-hee turns to the vice president, urgently requesting her to channel all the mana she can spare. The vice president, puzzled by this sudden demand, questions the rationale behind it. Without hesitation, Lee Min-hee reveals her intention to create the largest warp zone possible right at that crucial juncture. Meanwhile, with only one pillar left standing, Corporal Lee is pushing his limits. He is sprinting towards the final pillar, desperately coaxing his body to endure just a minute or two longer. His mana is depleting rapidly, now dangerously low at 27%. But as if mocking his efforts, the monster raises its hands skyward, then slams them down with such ferocity that the ground beneath them erupts into debris and rubble. It seems as though Corporal Lee has hit his breaking point. Yet, he has not thrown in the towel. Clinging to the last pillar, another monstrous strike descends upon him. In a bid for a few more seconds of resilience, he activates his body's strengthening transformation, turning his body to steel to withstand the impending hit. A system notification flashes a dire warning. Using the body's strengthening transformation beyond its threshold could wreak havoc on the caster's body. To make matters worse, his mana has now plummeted to a mere 3%. The monster's blow connects with the pillar, sending Corporal Lee hurtling backward. Miraculously, he manages to make the monster demolish the last pillar in the process. However, the cost is clear from Corporal Lee's expression. He is in no shape to continue the fight. He crashes into a wall with such force that it shatters upon impact, a testament to the brutal confrontation. As the building starts shaking like it is part of a mega fizzy cola candy experiment, cracks begin to spider web across its structure. It is a sight more nerve-wracking than watching your phone fall face down on concrete. Back to Corporal Lee, who is still partially embedded in the wall from his recent high-velocity encounter. It is clear to him that the building seconds from pulling a dramatic exit, and he is hell-bent on not letting the monster waltz out of this catastrophe. So, with a determination that is half admirable, and half what is this shit, he starts to peel himself off the wall, dagger in hand, ready for one last stand. But before Corporal Lee can dive headfirst into another possibly regrettable decision, Platoon leader Lee Minnie, armed with her enchantment and the volume of someone trying to talk over a metal concert, yells for the daredevil to hustle his way out of danger. Despite Lee Minnie's vocal fireworks begging Corporal Lee to escape the collapsing nightmare, he stands his ground. Face bloodied and battered, he argues that activating the warp right now is their only shot at survival, even if it risks turning him into a permanent fixture of the rubble. Caught in a dilemma that is eating away at her, platoon leader Lee Min-hee is torn between the mission and her partner's safety. But in a moment of do or die, she triggers the warp beneath the monster, sending it tumbling down a level just as the building decides it is time to renovate, starting with the floor. The monster, looking as baffled as a cat in a bathtub, has barely a moment to register the what just happened before the ceiling decides to introduce itself personally. Through the chaos, Corporal Lee, despite looking like he has been through a blender set on high, wears a grin of victory, thrilled to be in the thick of it with his old partner once more. As the building embraces its dramatic finale, collapsing around them, the vice president and platoon leader are left in the aftermath, the former's voice a mix of terror and awe at Corporal Lee's audacity. Now, let us take a peek back once again, where the Steel Emperor stands above the body of a dead monster, telling his partner that they have lost way too many comrades in arms in this operation. It is making him doubt whether he actually deserves to be the leader. But the red-headed lady stays silent. She then turns to him and utters his name, sternly scolding him, calling him a pathetic brat. She asks if he is going to keep up with this weak talk. Then she questions him, who decides who deserves what, and asks if he still does not trust himself. But the Steel Emperor stays silent, probably reflecting on her words. Now, back to the chaos that is unfolding in the Soul Station. We see Corporal Lee in his battered state, trying to walk out. But his mana level is at 3%, and he is beyond exhausted. He is apologizing to everyone and then starts falling down with the crumbling building. Then he flashes back to the past, where we see the lady holding onto his coat. A pleasant smile is etched on her face as she tells him not to bear it alone. If he gets uneasy, she tells him to look into the eyes of the people around him who trust him and follow him. Now, in the present moment, we catch a glimpse of the vice president and the platoon leader, both fully prepped and ready to catch Corporal Lee before he hits the ground. With his battered face, he manages to open one eye, just in time to see his friends and comrades standing by, ready to catch him. And there he goes, into the safe arms of the vice president, who snags him midair as he pops out of the warp. 
Meanwhile, the platoon leader is pushing her limits to keep the warp gate open, sweating bullets. But then, Corporal Lee lands safely on the ground, and just like that, the warp gate snaps shut. The entire station collapses, with debris and rubble flying in every direction, it is like a blockbuster movie scene but with worse special effects. Cut to outside the Seal station, where the system alert blares, announcing that the boss monster has appeared. It is time to eliminate the boss monster, with almost five hours on the clock until the anomaly finally wraps up. Next up, we catch a soldier in a full sprint, desperate to update the commander. He bursts out with, the media's having a meltdown. They are all over the story of boss monsters popping up and what we are doing about it. The battalion commander, upon hearing this, is practically stewing in frustration. It is like watching a teapot about to scream its lid off. Meanwhile, the Flower Guild president is soaking up all the gossip from her manager, who whispers the juicy bit that the director and the vice president hinted pretty loudly that if she keeps up her current tactics, her reign as the head of the attack squad might be as short-lived as a snowball in a sauna. Hearing this, the lady's about to blow a gasket. She rants about how these so-called brothers are ambushing her like a pack of wild dogs, orchestrating a takedown that is tearing her apart. It is as if they have been lying in wait, just for this moment. But then, we witness a pause in the chaos as the battalion commander and the Flower Guild president's eyes meet. It is an awkward moment charged with tension, like two cats on a hot roof eyeing the last piece of fish. The commander's glare could practically drill holes, and she is having none of it. She snaps out and tells commander to cut the creepy stare off, deciding it is high time to break the ice. All she has to do is make that call, seems easy enough. She nervously pulls out her phone, nibbling on her nails with tension thick in the air. She mutters under her breath why him of all people. But, trapped in the web of circumstances, she goes ahead and dials his number. And in a twist that could make anyone chuckle, she has got him saved as crazy dog and her contacts. Now, we are back inside the ominous black blob. The soul station is now nothing but dust and debris. Miraculously, Corporal Lee has survived. Alongside him, safe and sound, are his companions, with the vice president busily tending to Lee's injuries with her magic. As she works her healing spells, she confesses she was almost certain Lee was a goner. Now, we zoom in on Corporal Lee, whose eyes are a mirror of despair. The future has shifted beneath his feet, leaving him doubting the value of the knowledge from his previous life. He starts to wonder if is it all worthless now. He is now teetering on the brink of frustration, trying to piece together everything. In the midst of chaos, we see the ever-diligent vice president working her magic, quite literally, to heal Corporal Lee. The atmosphere is tense, a stark contrast to her focused calm. Cut to the platoon leader, who has clearly reached her boiling point. She is grinding her teeth in frustration, a tempest brewing within. Suddenly, she grabs Corporal Lee by the collar, unleashing a torrent of questions and expletives. She demands him why the hell are you going rogue and making reckless decisions. She makes it crystal clear that without her intervention, everyone inside would have been wiped out. She continues her fiery lecture, emphasizing that tactics are built on promises, on the trust that team members will execute the agreed-upon actions at the designated time. This, she asserts, is the bedrock of all strategy. As her words wash over him, Corporal Lee is hit with a flashback of a friend echoing similar sentiments about the importance of trust. Then, as if ignited by her words or perhaps the memory of his friend, a sly, almost devilish grin begins to play across Corporal Lee's face. He makes a sharp comeback, cutting off the platoon commander's rant to remind her that now is hardly the time for such discussions. Yet, in a twist, he expresses his gratitude to her. It seems her fiery words have somehow cleared the fog for him, and now he knows exactly what he must do. However, it seemed like the platoon leader was not quite on board with Corporal Lee's plan. She suspected him of trying to go solo yet again, pointing out that not everyone is blessed with a hide as tough as nails. They needed a game plan that did not rely on superhero skin. The platoon commander was just as shocked as anyone when he saw Corporal Lee springing back to his feet like a cat with nine lives. He spilled the beans that the boss monster was about to make a dramatic entrance from the rubble, and he had a trick up his sleeve to welcome it. But Corporal Lee, with a grin that could sell ice to penguins, assured everyone that they were going to bring the thunder, literally. He rallied the troops, saying it was time to band together and shock the monster into submission. With the enthusiasm of a cheerleader on game day, he declared that the linchpin of their monster-mashing strategy would be none other than Private Park Junmo. Poor Park was left scratching his head, wondering why he was always the chosen one. And now, we are back outside where an angry crowd has gathered around grilling the battalion commander with questions. It seems word has gotten out that a monster has shown up at Seoul Station, and everyone is shouting the same question. What is going to happen to the citizens of Seoul Station? They are demanding that the military and authorities make a statement. Then, the commander, feeling the heat from the public, finds himself teetering on the brink. He reveals that, with the additional details considered at this time, they are planning a briefing. For now, he lets slip that the secondary rescue team for this unlucky event has been deployed. But this just gets the crowd even more worked up. With a boss monster having appeared, and the military sending yet another rescue team that is even less impressive than a level 15 group, the crowd is baffled. They are asking, in disbelief, if the military really plans to defeat the boss monster by throwing a bunch of low-level personnel at it. 
Now we are zipping back inside Soul Station, and it looks like the monsters decided to wake up again. He is tossing debris around like confetti at a parade, making a grand entrance. This time, the monster seems madder than ever, grinding its teeth at the thought that these humans managed to outsmart it. It unleashes a massive roar, the force of which is so intense that it sends the corporal and vice president stumbling backwards. And just when you thought things could not get weirder, the monster starts levitating, legs spinning like a cartoon character. But then, something else catches its eye, a gigantic water bubble, just floating there above it. The officer gives the signal, and the guards spring into action, dropping the water ball right on target. The monster finds itself taking an unexpected bath, completely drenched. But, the monster shrugs the water off like it is no biggie, and it seems ready to move on to the next round of this bizarre showdown. Meanwhile, the guards are ramping up for the ultimate face-off. The guards fires up the amplification room. Corporal Lee then yells over to Private Park, let us light this up. Private Park gets into action, funneling his lightning into the amplification room, sending shockwaves towards the monster. The monster is not just standing there taking it, it is writhing in a mix of anger and pain. Private Park, not letting up, pushes his limits, pouring out as much lightning as he can muster. To push him even further, Corporal Lee shouts words of encouragement, urging him to keep the pressure up until they are ready to deploy the big guns, a massive frost room. But then, in a dramatic twist, someone new bursts onto the scene, commanding everyone to halt in a voice that brooks no argument. Suddenly, an overwhelming force presses down on everyone, bending them to their knees as if the very air around them has turned heavy. Private Park, caught in this unseen grip, struggles alongside the monster, which also feels the pressure. We are back outside once more, where the battalion commander is standing his ground against an agitated crowd, all eager to know the game plan for neutralizing the looming threat. Then, the commander drops a bombshell. This time, the backup is not just any ordinary squad. They have got an S-class player with no level restrictions, the Fist King, Han Thiessen himself. And there he is, Han Thiessen, the authority figure, the S-ranked player who is not just a big deal in Korea, being ranked number one, but also holds the ninth spot globally. As he strides towards the monster, he assures everyone, I have got this. Leave it to me and clear out. Corporal Lee cannot help but sport a massive grin, witnessing firsthand the kind of presence an S-ranker brings to the table. Han Thiessen, matching Lee's grin with his own, gears up, his fists engulfed in flames, ready to show this beast why he is the top dog. Now, Corporal Lee finds himself in a whirlwind of confusion. The future he thought he had figured out is shifting before his eyes, leaving him unsure about the information he once trusted. Initially, his plan was to sacrifice the reward and just hang tight for five hours, hoping the monster would vanish on its own. The arrival of Han Thiessen, however, was a twist he had not anticipated. He reflects on his past life, where, as an S-ranked player with no level restrictions, S-rankers were capable of soloing dungeons. The sudden appearance of Han Thiessen at the station, clinching the clearing reward for this unlucky event, had previously cemented his reputation as the undefeatable fighter. In that past life, Han Thiessen had managed to obtain the secret item, Minan and Maclar's secret armor, a feat that significantly contributed to his legend. This time around, Corporal Lee is feeling a mixture of vindication and anticipation. With a broad smirk spreading across his face, he is quietly thankful for Han Thiessen's timely appearance. It is not just about avoiding the loss of the reward anymore, Lee is eyeing the chance to claim it all for himself. The monster, not one to sit idly by, launches an attack at the Fist King. But Han Thiessen, with a mere flick of his palm, halts the beast's formidable assault as if swatting away a fly. Standing there defiantly, it is clear he is in a league of his own. With a sly smirk, Han Thiessen readies himself for his counterattack. The armor on his hand begins to glow brilliantly, signaling the unleashing of a devastating blow. The monster is sent flying, crashing into the ground with such force that the onlookers are practically eating dust, witnessing the raw power of the Fist King firsthand. However, the dust settles to reveal an unexpected turn. The monster, this giant beast, does not have a single scratch on it. Han Thiessen quickly realizes this opponent might be tougher than he initially thought. Yet, undeterred and with a determination that speaks volumes of his confidence, the Fist King does not see this as a setback. With lightning speed, Han Thiessen launches into the air, leaving a trail of fire in his wake. He zips past the monster, breaks midair to change his trajectory, and then comes hurling down, targeting the monster's face with a thunderous punch. As he lands the blow, Han Thiessen remains suspended in the air, his fist still shimmering with power, while the monster is forced back onto its feet, reeling from the impact. As the monstrous beast takes a devastating punch from the first king, it goes down like a sack of potatoes, sending shockwaves that scatter nearby soldiers like bowling pins. Amidst the settling dust, there stands Corporal Lee, clutching the vice president making sure she does not go flying off into the stratosphere from the pressure. Taking a closer look, we see the vice president informing Corporal Lee that she has blessed him with mana, but she cannot afford to expend more since she believes the other teammates are more crucial. Corporal Lee, with a pleasant smile, reassures her that he will be fine and tells her not to worry about him since he is not planning to use his body anyway. But then, he abruptly snaps his hand out of her grasp and leaps down to the ground, 
heading towards the monster. Meanwhile, the platoon leader, as always, is throwing shade at him, asking what the heck he is trying to pull off this time. Now, here comes the Fist King again, grinning like a maniac with that gaping mouth of his, clearly having the time of his life. He starts throwing punches at the monster like it is a punching bag at the gym. The poor monster, after taking a beating of its life, starts crumbling into pieces. And just as the monster begins to disintegrate, Corporal Lee whips out his metal smashing technique. That is when the Fist King smells something fishy in the air, realizing a shady move is about to go down. Suddenly, the monster's chest explodes into a million bits, raining its insides down on the battlefield. The Fist King lands swiftly on the ground, bewildered by the unexpected turn of events. It is like someone snatched his kill right from under his nose before he could claim it. Then, a notification window pops up, spilling all the juicy details about the metal smashing ability. It is a rank D skill, and it seems to consume mana to crush metal, with the mana consumption varying based on the amount of metal targeted. Right now, Corporal Lee's mana is sitting at a measly 13%. Now, Corporal Lee stands tall beside the Fist King, both watching as the monster teeters on the brink of oblivion. With a stern tone, the Fist King turns to our guy, demanding to know what the heck he wants. He reminds Lee that he would already warned everyone not to mess with his kills, yet here Lee is, snatching victory right out of his jaws. But Corporal Lee is not about to take any guff. He snaps back, calling out the Fist King for his questionable ethics, even for an S-ranker. The Fist King, now boiling with rage, demands to know what Lee is blabbering about, denying any wrongdoing. That is when Lee hits him with a reality check, reminding the Fist King that he was the one who interrupted Lee's raid in the first place, so ultimately, Corporal Lee deserves this kill. The Fist King scoffs, questioning whether a mere corporal like Lee could have taken down the monster solo. But Lee, cool as a cucumber, tells the Fist King to buzz off. And that is when things really heat up. The Fist King, completely losing his cool, threatens to squash Lee's head with a single fist. Out of nowhere, they both start sprinting toward the monster, each determined to land the killing blow and claim the glory for themselves. As Corporal Lee hurls his knife towards the monster, he is bellowing at the top of his lungs, letting the Fist King know that they are the ones who held the line until the bitter end. He is not about to let this so-called Fist King swoop in at the last moment and snatch his reward. Meanwhile, the Fist King is hot on Corporal Lee's tail, his eyes locked on Lee's sword. He is just as dead set on nabbing the kill before Corporal Lee can get his hands on it. And amidst this chaotic showdown, the poor monster is probably wondering what the heck these guys find so fascinating about him. It is like being the unwitting star of a very strange and violent reality show. So, they both reach the monster, and Corporal Lee's sword starts slicing its way into the monster's belly while the Fist King launches his fist straight at the monster as well. The monster reels from the onslaught, crackling with lightning and fire as it takes a serious beating. Then, the Fist King gears up for another devastating blow, unleashing it with full force. The monster crashes to the ground, engulfing the entire vicinity in blazing flames. The shockwaves are so intense that even Lee struggles to keep his footing. Finally, we are outside, and the blob that once swallowed Soul Station begins to vanish as the monster lies defeated. The area is now free from its grip. As the blob dissipates, Soul Station is revealed once again against the sky. Among the civilians, word spreads that the monster was taken down in less than five minutes after the Fist King entered the fray. Finally, the survivors trapped in the station for hours start emerging. In the crowd, a concerned lady rushes towards her mother, immediately asking if she is okay or if she got hurt anywhere else. The mother warmly embraces her daughter, reassuring her not to worry, that she is alright. But then tears start welling up in the lady's eyes after the heartfelt hug, emotions running high after the intense catastrophe. Finally, relief washes over everyone as they realize they are safe after the harrowing ordeal. The news spreads across TVs, with reporters announcing a miracle, all the people in Seoul Station survived once again. A notification pops up, confirming that the monster, the venomous ironclad spider queen, has been finally slain. It also congratulates survivors for enduring the unlucky event, hinting at lucky rewards for those who weathered the storm. Now, we see the Fist King looking at the system window, but he does not seem too thrilled with the outcome. Maybe he was hoping for a bit more recognition, or perhaps the rewards did not meet his expectations. As we glance at the system window, it reveals that a lucky reward will be given to the Fist King for assisting in the defeat of the boss monster. Now it is clear why he is seething with anger. Meanwhile, Corporal Lee is busy performing some wizardry while still lodged in the corpse of the Monster Queen, a clear indication of why our guy got the kill. Then, a notification pops up, indicating that an unknown energy is imbuing the Cloud Blade, reaching 24%. Finally, we see our guy casually snagging the reward the system threw his way. 
The bracelet he yearned for in his previous life is finally in his possession, and he gazes at it with wide eyes. Suddenly, another system window chimes in, stating that the user has obtained a man in a Nackler secret armor. It is a hero-grade relic with the trait that the user can level up the armor through battles. When infused with mana, it creates a thin layer of transparent armor over the user's skin, making it perfect for carrying and storing special features. It even contains a subspace that allows the user to secretly store items. And so, in the grand saga of Soul Station's chaos, our dude emerges as the hero, grinning like a devil who just got the last slice of pizza. Meanwhile, the Fist King is more disappointed than a kid who opened socks for Christmas, calling our guy a cheeky bastard and demanding answers. But as steam starts rising from our guy, he is not about to let the Fist King reign on his parade. He munches down on the bracelet reward like it is his last meal, while the Fist King throws a tantrum louder than a toddler denied candy at the checkout line. Our man turns around, giving the Fist King a look that could curdle milk, and sets him straight. He asks what reward is he talking about, and makes it clear that they are the ones who saved the day. He should be thanking Corporal and his team for letting this party crash her tag along like a lost puppy. And just like that, he drops the mic, leaving the Fist King fuming like a kettle about to explode. But hey, you gotta hand it to the Fist King for his persistence, even if he is more stubborn than a mule with a headache. He keeps going on about how the system works, like he is the guru of game mechanics. He then mentions that, the boss monster's contribution is 7%, so his share is still bigger than Corporal's ego. As we glance at the fuming Fist King, his eyes shimmering with frustration and anger, he reveals that he endured six months of isolated training, only to be dragged into this mess out of nowhere. He firmly believes he deserves a hero-grade item at the very least to balance things out. With a terrifying tone and demeanor, he demands once again how Corporal Lee plans to make up for it. But our man could not care less about the Fist King's cocky attitude. A sly grin dances on Corporal Lee's lips as he thinks. This dude must be kidding, arguing about time and compensation in front of a soldier who had to return to military duty for all this bullcrap self-labor. Suddenly, the entire area crackles with energy, fire intensifying around the Fist King like he is about to explode. He demands if Lee knows who he is dared to mess with, but Lee just shrugs it off, daring him to bring it on because Corporal Lee is not scared one bit. The Fist King can spout all the nonsense about solitary training and his contribution, but in Lee's eyes, it does not freaking matter, because if the Corporal had to be compensated fairly for all the time he has spent fighting, then no reward could ever make up for it. So, Corporal Lee is ready to take this bastard down. No holds barred. Sure enough, the Fist King lunges at our guy with all his might, ready to land a punch that would make even Superman jealous. But just before impact, it is like someone hit the pause button on life. As the scene transitions, we see the battalion commander and the Flower Guild president, bursting onto the scene like unexpected guests at a party. The Fist King's jaw practically hits the floor, while our guy's expression is like a confused emoji come to life. Then, Lieutenant Colonel Kim Kangsiak decides to drop some wisdom bombs, asking why they are all throwing punches when the gates are closed. Talk about raining on their parade. But Corporal Lee, ever the opportunist, seizes the moment like a kid catching the ice cream truck at just the right time. He grabs the Fist King's fist, but instead of a fight, he launches into a barrage of compliments, showering the Fist King with praise like confetti at a parade. With a swift nod and a cheeky wink, Corporal Lee makes his exit, leaving the Fist King standing there like a deer caught in headlights. And as Lee walks away, he salutes his senior like he is in some kind of military sitcom. The commander can only shake his head in disbelief, while Lee, with a grin as wide as the Grand Canyon, assures him that he is perfectly fine. Thank you very much. But the Fist King is not having any of this nonsense. He screams at Corporal Lee, demanding that he get his ass over here. However, before things escalate further, the Flower Guild lady jumps in like a superhero with a verbal lasso, telling the Fist King to shut his big mouth. She admits she has no clue what is going on, but right now, she just wants him to shut his ass up. As tensions simmer down, our attention shifts to the sky, where TV news choppers capture every juicy moment of the Soul Station incident, broadcasting live to the entire nation. The Flower Guild president makes a point that if the Fist King causes any more trouble, it will be impossible to contain the fallout, and it will not do any favors for the Blue Flower Guild's reputation. Still fuming, the Fist King realizes he is backed into a corner, with no choice but to face the harsh reality of the situation. Suddenly, a voice booms out, urging everyone to make way because the Brigadier General is on his way. Sure enough, a portal begins to materialize, and with a flourish, the teleport opens, revealing the Brigadier General floating in like he owns the place. Turning towards the Fist King, the Brigadier General cannot help but express his amusement at seeing the Fist King still lingering around. But the Fist King is still sulking, not exactly thrilled with the idea of heading home empty-handed, without any shiny medals or rewards. The General also notices the awkward tension radiating from the Fist King, not to mention the Flower Guild President is also standing there like a lost puppy. Taking a moment, the Brigadier expresses his intrigue once again, noting the presence of even the Blue Flower Guild Master's daughter. 
He then asks if there is any problem here, but the flower guild lady tries to play it cool, warmly welcoming the general and brushing off any notion of trouble, stating that the gate is already closed now. The general gives a knowing twinkle in his eye, acknowledging that if they are talking about the blue flower guild, there must be no problems there. The flower guild lady catches on to his wavelength, understanding exactly what the old coot is getting at. Meanwhile, the general turns to the lieutenant, who promptly salutes his senior. Back to the flower guild lady, she is grilling the fist king like a master chef, wondering why Soul Station looks like it got hit by a tornado when the fist king was supposed to handle it without breaking a sweat. But the Fist King is still stuck on the fact that someone stole his thunder. Then, he drops the bombshell that he did not actually wreck Soul Station or clinch the top spot in the raid. The President's jaw hits the floor faster than a cartoon character realizing they have run off a cliff, demanding to know what the heck he means he is not the first. But the Fist King is in no mood for further discussion. He reminds the Flower Guild Lady that he has fulfilled all his responsibilities and insists that it is time for her to keep her promises as well. With that, he takes flight into the sky, leaving the lady reeling in the shockwave of his departure. She is left baffled by the revelation that the S-Ranker who is known as the Fist King did not rank first in a mere level 15 unlucky event. She wonders who the hell could have ranked first then. Meanwhile, back with our guy, he is getting an earful from the general, who is finding it absurd that his military records specify Corporal Lee can only control up to 300 grams of metal, yet his reports now suggest he can control way more than that. Finally realizing that it must be the corporal who snagged the first spot, the general continues his tirade, suggesting that either the records are wrong or there is the possibility that Lee is not truly an F-ranker. The flower guild lady, overhearing everything, starts to sweat beads at the realization that this dude might just be a freaking F-ranker. The old coot, with a pleasant smile, finds the whole fiasco quite fascinating and demands a detailed debriefing while they take a walk. Because apparently, even in the midst of chaos, there is always time for a stroll. As the reality sinks in, the flower guild lady feels like her head is about to explode as she wonders what is going on. Meanwhile, our guy takes a leisurely stroll with the budget-friendly mob psycho. But at this point, Corporal Lee shoots him a doubtful glance. He is on high alert because he knows that Brigadier General Choi yun Chiao is not a man to be trifled with. Choi's powers have earned him the reputation of a tactical nuclear weapon, and to top it off, he is remarkably clever. He is the one even the necromancer was most wary of, having attempted several assassination attempts against him. Finally, the general breaks the silence, demanding a report of what happened earlier. Corporal Lee snaps into action with a soldier's energy, but he cannot shake the feeling that the general suspects him of some unusual activity compared to his recorded abilities. He halts his steps and brings them closer together, adopting the stance of a disciplined soldier. It is time to stay sharp, because when the brigadier general starts asking questions, you better have your answers ready. And so the corporal starts spitting out that not long ago, when he caught his second elite monster, his abilities instantly improved with an achievement message saying Dunce Rebellion. Instead of the 300 grams as reported, he is now handling up to 17 kilograms and has gained a few skills during his improvement spree. The general starts to wonder that achievement systems are certainly just as uncommon as quests. But right now, the only thing on the corporal's mind is that he does not want the world to know that F-rankers can progress. With a broad grin, the general buys our guy's story, but deep down, the corporal knows the general is not fully sold on it yet. Then the general explains that given the corporal's fighting strength and abilities, he could not be called an F-ranker, and his combat abilities are perhaps C rank or above. Now the corporal hits with a realization that it seems the general also wants to scout him as well. So, the general gives a nod of praise to our boy for his fantastic job and asks if there is something he would like as a reward. Maybe some magic armor or anything. He tells him to name it, and he will have it. But Corporal Lee seems relieved that the general does not want to scout him. Seeing an opportunity to snag a shiny item, a grin widens on Lee's face as he reveals that there is actually something he wants. Then, he challenges the general, saying it is just that he does not think even a brigadier general could give it to him so easily. Now, the brigadier is even more curious to hear what this thing is that he cannot grant him. And with a drum roll, Lee bluntly states that it is one of the general's treasured items, a hero rank item called the Fail Knot. Suddenly, a sparkling realization hits the general as if Corporal Lee just found out about the stash of dirty magazines the general was hiding from his wife. It is a moment of pure comedic gold, where the general's poker face crumbles faster than a house of cards in a windstorm. Back at the broken-down soul station, the general is laughing so hard he is practically holding onto his belly like he just heard the joke of the year. With a playful twinkle in his eye, the general tells Corporal Lee, let us have a chat when you get another badge right on your chest. Corporal Lee, with all the soldierly energy he can muster, replies with a crisp, Thank you, sir. As the general starts to stride away, still chuckling to himself, Lee cannot help but sulk a little. He saw this coming from a mile away. He knew that old man was going to change the subject faster than a politician dodges a tough question. But despite the disappointment of not getting his hands on the fail knot, Lee is still relieved. After all, a special promotion means he will be able to stay hidden for a while longer. And for now, that is victory enough for him. So a few days pass by, and we find ourselves at the 3rd Armored Brigade, 1st Battalion. 
a notification window pops up, stating that Manon and Mackler's secret armor is being digested, and in Vebo Furin efficiency is at 150%, with about 6 minutes left until metal absorption is complete. As he sits on his bed, our guy is just pissed off at how long this is taking, but he reassures himself that hero rank items are harder to digest after all. Suddenly, Private Park appears on the scene, interrupting our guy's sulking. Along with him is Private Choi Mini, whose trade is chaser and is an E-rank guy, demanding they do something other than PT now. But our man pulls up his shirt, showing his banged up body, and asks them if they cannot see he is totally bruised up. Then we see three other goons arrive at the scene. One with a bald head, Private Choi Tiong, whose trade is sniper and is also an E-ranker. The one in the middle is Private Park Sungmo, with the trade of a shaman and an E-ranker. And the purple-headed one is Kim Kyungjin, with the trade of a thief, and also an E-ranker. As Corporal Lee reflects on the past events, he finds solace in the camaraderie forged through fire and chaos. In the midst of raids and life-threatening situations, he is grateful for the steadfast support of his friends and comrades who stood by his side, unwavering in their faith and trust. Just as he is lost in his thoughts, the door creaks open, and in walks Private On Minty, back from the military hospital after getting roughed up in the last confrontation with the Kobolds. Reporting for duty, Minty's return is like a beacon of hope amidst the uncertainty of battle. Without a moment's hesitation, Corporal Lee jumps to his feet and wraps Minty in a bear hug, a silent testament to the bond they share. For Lee, future rewards pale in comparison to the simple joy of seeing his friends return safely by his side. As Minty stands bewildered by the unexpected display of affection, Lee chuckles and explains that it is all for him showing up just in time for training. Though Minty might not fully grasp Lee's sentiment, the warmth of their embrace speaks volumes. With cheerful energy, Lee leads the way, surrounded by his comrades and friends. In this moment of shared camaraderie, they form a tight-knit circle of support, ready to face whatever challenges lie ahead. After all, in the chaos of battle, there is no greater comfort than knowing your friends have got your back. As Corporal Lee leads everyone to the training center, he is determined to ensure their safety through rigorous preparation. But, a sudden interruption halts their progress. We see Private Park, looking visibly shaken, comes running down and stammers out that Ka and lower rankers are not permitted to use this training facility. In his eyes, it is a place reserved for the elite, and mere mortals like them have no business treading its hallowed halls. Just as Private Park was dropping the bad news bomb, Corporal Lee swoops in and gives him a little neck grab wake up call. Now, Park, looking like a deer caught in headlights, starts babbling about restrictions and how they cannot start training. But, Corporal Lee's eyes are like two determined laser beams, and he is not having any of it. He pulls a 180, cranks up the volume, and starts yelling at everyone nearby. He is shouting about how everyone here survived an unlucky event, and asks them then why the heck everyone is getting jittery now. Like, seriously, he asks Park if he did not just leveled up or something. Lee's on a motivational rampage, and I cannot help but wonder if he has had one too many energy drinks. Private Park hits Corporal Lee with the reality check, reminding him that they were just backups back then, and now it is every soldier for themselves. Surprisingly, Corporal Lee decides to have Private Park's back, becoming his backup buddy or something. Private Park's face lights up with happiness, and he asks if it's actually happening. Suddenly, the training hall gate creaks open, giving off major creepy vibes. It is feels as if there is a monster about to come out, and that the whole platoon is practically peeing their pants in fear. Corporal Lee, now standing behind them, goes all drill sergeant, pushing them and dropping F-bombs left and right. He sternly asks what the heck they are doing standing there, and sternly instructs them to get the fuck inside. But the soldiers are frozen solid, scared to even twitch. Then, a sly smile creeps onto Corporal Lee's face, like he has just cracked the code. After what feels like forever, everyone's finally herded into the training hall. Corporal Lee slams the shutters closed behind them, trapping those poor souls inside. Now they are banging on the shutters, begging Corporal Lee to let them out but he is standing there, looking all determined and stuff, not budging an inch. Corporal Lee, still sporting that devilish grin, seems to be enjoying the spectacle of everyone freaking out. He is convinced it is just the beginning of their training, and now it is time for some attribute training, whatever that means. Meanwhile, outside the cafeteria, things appear to be going smoothly. It is like the calm before the storm. Inside, two soldier ladies are gossiping at their desks. The blackhead one spills the beans to her brown-haired buddy about how it was the freaking Frank Corporal who pulled off the blockade operation and also cleared the unlucky event. The second lady cannot believe it, adding that she imagined him as some super buff dude, which clearly is not the case. Back to Corporal Lee, he is grinning like a Cheshire cat, excited that the trapped bunch will finally get a boost. Suddenly, though, he starts poking his ears, wondering why they are feeling so darn itchy. Now, we also get to see the red head officer busy doling out orders to two soldiers, instructing them to purchase supplies matching the number of workers in each company. Suddenly, her attention shifts to Corporal Lee, and she questions him if he was not supposed to be at his personal training. Corporal Lee, playing it cool like any junior should, fires back with a smooth excuse. 
He claims he is at the PX for energy supplements for his hardworking subordinates. Meanwhile, we also notice Sanguk, passing by, who cannot help but shoot Corporal Lee an annoyed look. Even the lady soldier on the other side joins in with an icy stare. Anyway, the officer digs deeper, asking if it is true he received the Dunce Rebellion achievement. Corporal Lee owns up to it with a crisp yes. But she is not buying it just yet, and bluntly states that his report about his extraordinary feat seems fishy. She demands to know what he is hiding, but Corporal Lee, with an awkward smile, plays innocent, asking, what could he possibly be hiding? Now, alarms start ringing in Corporal Lee's mind. He is left wondering if she is onto something for asking such pointed questions. Suddenly, their attention is diverted by some commotion nearby. Two soldiers are having a lively chat, but the lady's focus is quickly snatched by something else. Amidst the background noise, a broadcast from the admin room breaks in. The announcement cuts through, summoning Corporal Lee to report to the battalion commander's office immediately. The commander wants him. The broadcast wraps up, leaving the red-headed officer frustrated that just when she thought she was making headway, the broadcast came in right on cue. Corporal Lee, seizing the opportunity, is ready to go. In her parting words, the officer makes it crystal clear that she has got her eyes on him. She does not know what he is up to, but she is watching. With that, she dismisses him, telling him to go now. After narrowly escaping the red-headed officer's interrogation, Corporal Lee is determined to steer clear of her for the time being. With that hurdle cleared, he wonders why the commander is summoning him, especially since the promotion ceremony is still a few days away. As he walks through the corridor, voices echo from the battalion commander's office, sounding agitated. Corporal Lee reaches the door and knocks. Upon hearing the invitation to enter, he steps inside and snaps a salute, announcing his presence. But before he can finish his report, he notices the presence of Brigadier General Choi yun Chial and the battalion commander, sensing the thick tension between the two of them. It seems like he has walked into quite the heated situation. Finally, the Brigadier General turns toward the Corporal Lee, and as the battalion commander attempts to speak, the Brigadier General intervenes, silencing him with a stern look and deciding to explain the situation to Corporal Lee personally. With a somber and serious tone, he begins to explain the grave circumstances. Just days ago, a red gate opened in the Shinram area, and the Blue Flower Guild had the raid rights for it. However, when the guild members entered to deal with the gate, chaos ensued. The Flower Knights, instead of facing external enemies, turned on each other, resulting in brutal internal conflict. The platoon commander desperately tried to reason with the soldiers, reminding them of their shared guild allegiance, but his pleas fell on deaf ears. The knights, consumed by madness, began attacking their own comrades. In the end, he too becomes a victim of the madness, chased down by his own comrades and succumbing to a painful death. The news about the Red Gate being declared a Trouble Rank 3 hits Corporal Lee like a runaway train. Trouble Rank 3 means that after three unsuccessful attempts to raid the gate, the organization is considered lacking in capabilities, and two or more organizations are required for a joint response. Corporal Lee's mind is racing with questions. He cannot recall any incident like this ever happening in his previous life. The Brigadier General continues to lay out the grim details, explaining that the Red Gate has an energy limit of level 18 or lower, with a maximum of 30 players allowed. The shocking revelation is that it has been reported as a zombie dungeon, implementing an impossible to leave until raid successful after entering policy. The gravity of the situation starts to sink in, and the challenges ahead become increasingly daunting. As the Brigadier General reveals that the Red Gate is the domain of the commander of the Dead Army, a necromancer, Corporal Lee finds himself terrified, because he does not want to entertain the idea that the necromancer has arrived. The Brigadier General goes on, mentioning that even the proud Blue Flower Guild sacrificed talented rookies and still failed at the raid. He emphasizes that dungeon raiding is typically a guild affair, but then his expression takes a creepy turn, and he points out that Corporal Lee is the best candidate for this dungeon raid. But then, Battalion Commander intervenes, sporting a disappointed look that clearly conveys his disagreement with the plan. Turning to Corporal Lee, the Battalion Commander questions whether he can actually pull it off. Now, Corporal Lee is left contemplating the situation. It is something he has not encountered in his previous life, and the potential connection to the necromancer raises concerns. Despite this, he becomes resolute and agrees to give the raid a shot. A pleased smile spreads across the brigadier's face, while the gorilla of disbelief stands in the corner, gawking at the unexpected turn of events. Before diving into the nitty-gritty, our corporal figures he better snag whatever advantage he can for the upcoming Red Gate raid. So, he nonchalantly drops the bomb that his current weapon would not even dent a tin can, let alone take on the challenges of the mission. Throwing in a friendly grin, he casually nudges the general to spill the beans on that fail knot they chatted about last time. He makes it clear that with the fail knot in his possession, he guarantees success in the raid. The fail knot, a legendary weapon, is described as a one-shot arrow that never misses. It is associated with Sir Tristan, a character from the Legends of King Arthur. Despite its incredible accuracy and magical effects, its difficulty to retrieve means it can only be used as a weapon once. So even in the Brigadier General hands it's a treasured weapon that is like a last resort. 
but in the hands of someone who can practically control metal, are Copples turning this legend into a whole new bedtime story. After Corporal Lee boldly demands the fail not, a wide smirk appears on the brigadier's face. With a sly grin, the old guy makes it crystal clear that it is not a favor, it is a deal. Copple's got to bear the full brunt of the risk if he botches this mission. No free lunches here, but our man, undeterred, flashes a devilish grin of his own. He figures the bigger the risk, the sweeter the payoff. It is a gamble, and he loves it that way. Now, he is all geared up for this raid. But here is some juicy insides. Despite the norm of sending executives as leaders for dungeon raids, the brigadier is sending him, a regular soldier, as the raid leader. He figures it is likely due to his rivalry with the Blue Flower Guildmaster, Yui Heck. Corporal Lee sees this as an opportunity. If he succeeds, it is a significant victory for a common soldier against an elite player from the Blue Flower Guild. Even if he fails, it will not necessarily be their failure, as they are only participating in the raid as backup for Blue Flower. If Corporal Lee succeeds, the Brigadier will put to rest claims of his uselessness and win the psychological war against the Blue Flower Guild. It is a win-win situation for Brigadier Choi and Chial, and that is why he is willing to hand over that precious fail knot. The Brigadier, being the shifty character he is, drops the bomb that Corporal's promotion to Sergeant will have to wait until after the raid. Now, our boy's no fool. He knows this old dude can switch gears like a chameleon, but he is not about to let himself be taken advantage of. So, with that same devilish grin firmly in place, Corporal turns to the Brigadier General and lays it out. The fail not was the promised reward for this gig, but if he pulls off the raid, he is looking for a little extra something. It is a bold move, and he is not playing games. The old man, not one to beat around the bush, assures Corporal that as long as he does not flop the raid, he will entertain whatever wishes he has got up his sleeve. Copperl, losing soldier energy, hits him with a casual thank you, sir, and throws in a solid reassurance that come hell or high water, he is making sure that raid is a success. Now, we are back with the goons who have just kicked monster butt and are huddled behind the shutter, inspecting their handiwork. Faces smeared with monster blood, they turn around to greet their fearless Copperl. In the mix, there is Private Park, all pumped up after breezing through the C-rank training grounds. He has got this newfound confidence, thinking he is the king of the world. With that same devilish grin making a comeback, Corporal Lee casually drops the bomb. Everyone's got to suit up. The squad's left scratching their heads, wondering what on earth he is babbling about. Then, at the top of his lungs, Corporal belts out the news. They are diving into their first solo deployment. But the once happy face of Private Park is now looking like a scared kitten. Questions when he signed up for this roller coaster ride. A new day unfolds, and the military truck barrels its way to the destination. Inside, Corporal Lee takes center stage, dishing out crucial intel about the impending Red Gate mission. Given that it is a zombie dungeon, they are packing bullets infused with holy power, adding a little kick to the recoil. With a stern demeanor, he orders his comrades to exercise caution when firing these bad boys and emphasizes the need to stay on high alert at all times. Curiosity sparks among the troops as one soldier, unable to contain his inquisitiveness, queries Corporal about the fail not. Cool as a cucumber, Corporal reassures him he has got it covered. Sneakily, we catch a glimpse of him concealing the legendary arrow beneath his sleeves. As the military juggernaut arrives at the Silim Dong Red Gate, the Blue Flower Guild's base camp, Corporal takes charge. He commands his platoon to disembark from the truck, gearing up for the mission ahead. Just as they start prepping, a native soldier saunters in, declaring a detour to an operations meeting before entering the fray. Corporal, ever the leader, follows suit, leaving the platoon in the capable hands of Park Junmo with a nod and a charge to handle everything in his absence. As the platoon soldiers gear up, their eyes unintentionally wander over to the members of the Blue Flower Guild. Let us just say the soldiers are not feeling the love from the Blue Flower Guild members, who seem to be less than thrilled about the support squad presence. Inside the Blue Flower Guild, a guy starts throwing shade, spilling the tea that these soldiers in front of them are part of the ant support squad, regular soldiers, the lowest rung of the ladder. He questions whether they are not shouldering too much of a burden, hinting at some covert operation called Operation Retrieval, and then dropping the name Achilles like it is hot. But before he can dive deeper, the boss shuts him down with a resounding shut your goddamn mouth. Apologies follow promptly, and the loudmouth is left zipping his lips. Meanwhile, Corporal Lee's ears have perked up, catching wind of the whole Operation Retrieval drama. Now, his mind's doing somersaults, trying to decode what this soldier meant by that cryptic phrase. The plot thickens, my friend. The big shot from the Blue Flower Guild hatches a plan to ditch the amped as soon as they enter the dungeon. But a cautious voice beside him warns that going solo might not be the brightest idea, survival's no guarantee. Unfazed, the big shot reveals that, in the grand scheme of raids, everyone's life is on the line, and each person must protect themselves. It is a harsh reality, and they have no choice in the matter. Meanwhile, Corporal Lee waltzes into the meeting room, expecting a crowd. But surprisingly, it is just the guild president, flying solo. Red flags start waving in Corporal's mind as he wonders if there was supposed to be a full-blown meeting. The lady, making a beeline toward our guy, spills the beans that she had a hunch Corporal would show up. 
she reminisces about the time he, without hesitation, pocketed her business card as an F-ranker. Copperl cuts to the chase, admitting he never asked for it. It dawns on him that she is frustrated realizing she handed her card to a lowly F-ranker, and it is clearly bothering her. She then decides to ditch the past, and bluntly reminds Copperl that he is nothing more than a sidekick for this raid. She lays it out straight, instructing him not to pull any funny business that interferes with the Blue Flower Guild's plans. His role, stay in a corner. That is the sole reason she bothered calling him in. Copperl, now catching on to the Flower Guild scheme, realizes they signed up for the support squad of regular soldiers just to boss them around. But no way in heck is Copperl Lee going to bow down and play by their rules. Asserting himself, he declares that both sets of troops have equal rights and are no less than the Blue Flower Guild. The lady, unimpressed, throws a casual so what. His attempt to level the playing field is met with a scoff, and she questions if he is suggesting they are going to take on a boss monster. She admits Copperl's got skill and guts for an F-ranker, but she finds the idea laughable. Not one to back down, Copperl, to stir the pot, asks why they cannot take on a boss monster. He provocatively questions if she is worried the support squad might outshine the Blue Flower Guild in the raid. The lady then starts to chuckle and then she bursts into laughter that fills the room, echoing off the walls as she scoffs at Copperl's claims. Once she regains her composure, she questions if Copperl actually believes he will get lucky like he did at the Seal Station. But Copperl, undeterred, takes a few steps toward her, towering over her as he asserts that she should not dismiss his efforts as mere luck. The lady, seemingly unimpressed, throws shade, suggesting Copperl might have a death wish. She challenges him to enter the dungeon before the Blue Flower Guild does, but in the next breath, she rescinds the offer, making it clear he cannot. She drops a bombshell, revealing that three of this year's top 100 prospects are part of this raid. Condescendingly, she tells Copperl not to be a bother and orders him to stay out of the way. As Lady Yuhina, or rather Catherine, walks away, Copperl Lee is left scratching his head. Bewildered by her lack of response to his provocations, his mind drifts to the mysterious Operation Retrieval, wondering if there is something he is not privy to. Unable to contain his curiosity, he calls her out with her title, but she insists on being addressed by her name. Catherine, seizing the opportunity, Copperl proposes a bet. If the support squad manages to nab the boss monster before the Blue Flower Guild, Catherine has to grant him a favor. With a nonchalant tone and a peculiar grin, she questions if he has any idea who he is dealing with but agrees to the bet. However, she makes it clear that if Copperl loses, he will have to forfeit his life to her. The stakes are high, but Copperl, undeterred, accepts the challenge. The scene shifts outside the Red Gate, where the Blue Flower Guild confidently strides into the portal, leaving the fully geared support squad standing tall behind them. As the Blue Flower Guild activates their shields, the platoon commander swiftly issues instructions to his squad. They are planning to exit the entry zone before the other soldiers catch up, prompting the leader to command everyone to get ready to run. With a decisive order to enter, the entire Flower Guild squad steps into the portal, leaving the support squad on standby until they receive the green signal to enter in three minutes. During this tense wait, Copper Lee checks in with Private Min, who reports back that he is okay. As the clock ticks down, the support squad prepares to make their move. Copperl advises everyone to stay focused, harking back to their training drills, reminding them to watch their breaths. With the command to enter, the support squad steps through the portal, emerging on the other side. However, the scene that greets them is far from what they expected. Instead of a relatively peaceful environment, they find themselves surrounded by madness. Flower Guild soldiers are tearing each other apart, a gruesome sight that shocks the newly arrived squad. Copper Lee, thinking on his feet, places his hand over a soldier's mouth, preventing any screams of fear that could attract the attention of the frenzied zombies. The whole area is a chaotic battleground, with Flower Guild soldiers, some dead, others still fighting, and scattered limbs strewn across the ground like discarded toys. Even their team leader has succumbed to the monstrosity, now a part of the zombie horde. The support squad is thrust into a dire situation from the moment they set foot on the other side of the portal. In the midst of the chaos, there is one person who has managed to avoid succumbing to the monstrous fate that has befallen his comrades. However, even he is gripped with terror, watching helplessly as his fellow soldiers are torn apart, their blood splattering in all directions. Copper Lee, with a swift hand gesture and military language unfamiliar to outsiders, signals to his soldiers to stand tight behind the zombies. As the colossal monster turns around, its empty eye sockets locking onto the support squad, a hushed tension fills the air. The soldier, unable to contain his fear, unleashes a piercing scream that could wake the dead. In response, the undead commander swiftly throws its hands towards the soldiers, attempting to grab them. In the face of impending danger, Copper Lee reacts decisively. With a commanding voice, he orders the support squad to open fire. The soldiers, following their leader's lead, unleash a barrage of holy bullets from their guns. Copper Lee, with precision, joins the onslaught, shooting holy bullets that cut through the air. Despite the relentless barrage of bullets, none of them seem to land on the colossal undead creature. A mysterious barrier appears to shield the monster, pissing Copper Lee to the point of grinding his teeth in frustration. In an attempt to turn the tide, Copperl commands one of the soldiers, Choi Tiong, to execute a plan. 
With precision, Choi Tiong takes aim at the monster. Just as he is about to act, the scene shifts to a flashback where Copper Lee is teaching the soldiers about shooting. During the training, a soldier raises a concern. He points out that modern firearms lack the destructive power needed to harm monsters effectively. Copperl agrees, acknowledging that the support squad will not be dealing critical damage. Even using holy bullets will not cut it against dungeon executive level monsters. Copperl explains that they are using rifles for the assault because of the noise they make, not their destructive power. As the soldiers absorb Copperl Lee's unconventional wisdom about noise, they start to wonder about the role it plays in this madness. Copperl reveals the intriguing fact that generally, zombies may have desensitized senses, but their hearing remains intact. So, while their firearms may not kill the zombies, they can disorient them. The squad is left in amazement at their wise and nerdy Copperl. Expanding on the strategy, Copperl explains that by disorienting the zombies, they will not be able to perceive the squad. However, Baldi raises another question, asking if the zombies in this dungeon have senses other than hearing. Copperl drops a truth bomb, revealing that if that is the case, their chances of success are slim. Most of the squad would become zombies, and chaos would ensue as they kill each other. Returning to the battlefield, the narrative shifts to Choi Tiong, who possesses the sniper trait. He is targeting the monster's ear, a crucial weak point. After locking onto the target, he pulls the trigger, bombarding the colossal undead creature with bullets in a strategic move to exploit its vulnerability. Moving on, the moment Choi pulls the trigger, bullets start flying everywhere, hammering the undead king. But honestly, it is kind of pointless because not a single bullet gets past his beefy shield. But here's the silver lining, the plan to get the undead king all disoriented is actually working. He is stumbling around, unable to hit back, which is their cue. Seizing the moment, Private Minty lobs a grenade towards the big bad. But get this, these are not your run-of-the-mill grenades, they are juiced up with some magic. In the blink of an eye, the grenade goes off. Looks like it did ruffle the big guy's feathers, but let us be real, it is more of an annoyance to him than a proper smackdown. Meanwhile, Minty is out here playing the hero, shielding everyone from the blast's backlash with his tanky self, always ready to take one for the team. But then, out of nowhere, the undead king starts to fizz out like soda pop, turning into mist and completely vanishing, leaving the squad scratching their heads in total confusion. Just when they spin around to check their six, that mist gets all cozy and starts gathering up again, and bam, the undead king pops up right behind them. Only this time, he is not throwing a solo act, he has brought a whole crew of his creepy pals. And these zombie minions from the Blue Flower Guild are diving straight at the support squad. And as we pull back for a wider look, it is clear we are not just dealing with a handful of baddies. There is a whole army of these freaks storming towards our squad. Immediately, Private Choi, Private Park, and Private Kim get the signal to change their magazines. As soon as they do, their guns suddenly go off and start to float. The Corporal, with his metal manipulation ability, is ready with his four trusty guns. He takes a pause for a moment, waiting for the best timing. Then, with a simple gesture of his fingers, he triggers all of the gun's triggers, and the guns start bombarding the monsters with bullets, causing the mindless knights to crumble down. But these zombies are relentless. They are closing in with every tick of the clock, and it is just a matter of time before those guns run out of ammo. Just when it seems like we are in a tight spot, one of the smart cookies from the support squad, probably Private Kim, spots something shiny on the zombie. And would not you know it, he's got that thief trait, so he instantly recognizes it as a rare grade item. Meanwhile, as the undead king is busy playing catch-up, notices a giant blast on the horizon. Now, we see the corporal with his metal manipulation Nojo just casually making grenades float around and go kaboom wherever and whenever he damn well pleases. Because why not add a touch of fireworks to the undead party? At this point, the undead king's had it up to here with these pesky soldiers, and he just wants to swat them away like annoying flies. He unleashes a roar of frustration, sending out some dark energy vibes. Now, if we shift our gaze to the support squad, it looks like all the undead buddies have bitten the dust, and the only one left standing is the corporal with his floating guns. The squad finally gets a moment to catch their breath, and one private, probably nursing some aching legs, thinks the crisis has passed. Another soldier nods in agreement, feeling the same relief. But our corporal, he is not quite ready to pop the celebration champagne just yet. He has got this nagging feeling that something's off. They dodge the threat according to plan, sure, but there is a lingering question. Why were not there as many zombies as they expected? And what is the deal with the boss monster's name getting all distorted in the notification window? The corporal huddles the squad together, telling them to stay sharp because the threat has not been completely neutralized. So, the corporal decides it is high time to skedaddle from there. Meanwhile, up on the mountain peak, there is this authoritative figure keeping an eye on the support squad. As the scene zooms out, you can see this big snake slithering around his body, like he owns the joint. It turns out this giant snake and the vampire dude are buddies, having a good laugh at the support squad's futile efforts. But hey, even though they are having a chuckle, the vampire dude acknowledges the squad's efforts and mentions to his snake pal that it seems they have got some interesting ones coming in. 
as the support squad explores the surroundings, they feel like they have stumbled into a ghost town. Not matter where they look there is nothing near the dungeon, no facilities, no zombies, nada. It is just an open and empty sandbox. The corporal, who has raided countless dungeons, finds himself on edge. He has never seen a place this strange before. While they are on surveillance duty, the corporal notices some metal moving in the surroundings. Quick as a cat, he readies himself, and with a swift finger gesture, he hurls down a blade using his metal manipulation, and it materializes right before the suspect's throat. But, this guy starts screaming his lungs out, swearing he is just a regular human. The suspect immediately stands up, throwing his hands up in surrender. He spills the beans, saying he was hiding because he thought a zombie parade was heading his way. He quickly reveals himself as a survivor from the third raid squad, a guy named Kim Tsip affiliated with the Blue Flower Guild. This hoodie draped wannabe magician is a D-ranker with a sniper trait and a main skill in stealth. I mean, no doubt about it, this guy managed to hold his ground solo in this hellhole. But the corporal, he is not completely buying it. Doubts start creeping in, a lone survivor on top of everything. The suspect starts huffing and puffing, asking the boys for some water or a snack. Classic move, trying to win them over with the basic human needs. The scene transitions, and we find ourselves back outside in the Blue Flower Guild's swanky temporary ops room. The manager is spilling all the deets to the guild's vice president. Gugwang Group just sent out a secret cooperation letter to all the big guilds. The lady, biting her nails in nervousness, immediately asks, what does it say? The manager reveals that the player who retrieves his grandson's body, and the hero-grade Spear of Achilles in the second joint raid will be rewarded with a whopping 80 billion and a massive sponsorship from the Blue Flower Guild to the Player's Guild. And of course, the news hits the lady like train. Now, back inside, we see the newcomer finally getting his hands on the support squad's supplies to munch on. While he is at it, he spills the beans that Flower Guild's top priority in this mission was to retrieve the spear. But as they entered the gate, everyone got sent straight to hell. Hearing this news, the corporal starts grinning like a devil. After connecting all the dots, he realizes that this was the reason the Flower Guild president was being so damn cautious. The famous Spear of Achilles is here. The newcomer drops another bombshell, revealing that the chairman's second grandson, Guding Hoon, bit the dust in the first raid, and he was rocking the Spear of Achilles. That spear was like the symbol of Gugwang Group. Now it all makes sense why they are dangling 80 billion as a reward for anyone who brings back the chairman's grandson's dead body and the Spear of Achilles. It also clicks for the corporal why the Flower Guild was giving them the cold shoulder during the joint raid. At this point, the support squad is left mulling over what they just heard. Private Minty, in particular, seems to be on the edge, looking like he has seen a ghost. Private Park, noticing Minty's distress, asks if something's up. Minty, hiding his face, mumbles that it is nothing, but it is clear he is spooked by all the creepy stuff going on. Meanwhile, our mysterious guy is back, perched on the hill, keeping a watchful eye on everyone. He does not seem too thrilled to see the support squad just standing around chatting. He wants to stir things up a bit for his own amusement. In the next moment, the giant, burly undead appears right behind him, and it looks like he is itching to dive into the action to have the time of his undead life. Trouble's brewing, and it is about to get real interesting. At this point, the corporal senses a bunch of different metals on the move. But it is not a dozen, not 39, not 70, but a whopping 120 of them. As the scene zooms out, we see the entire undead army ready to tear the support squad into shreds. Leading this gruesome parade is our snake-loving friend, complete with sharp fangs popping out of his mouth. On the other hand, Corporal Lee is on the edge of his roller coaster seat. The numbers are rapidly increasing, and he knows that is not a good sign. Without wasting a moment, he orders the support squad to go with Plan C. The entire squad is left utterly bewildered to hear this, and it seems like Plan C is no joke, a do-or-die kind of thing. In a flash, he orders Private Minty and Choi Mini to set up the equipment. As they open their backpacks, we see them filled with metal balls. Immediately, the corporal commands them to execute potion doping. Following his orders, they bring out drinks, crack them open, and start chugging as instructed. The newcomer in the hoodie is left confused, trying to figure out what is happening. Then, cue the system notifications. After drinking the mana star, regular mana stats will continuously replenish for 5 minutes, and with the HP star, regular stamina stats will continuously replenish for 6 minutes. Now, there is an energy surge through the corporal's body, a much needed boost before heading into the fight. It is about to go down, and the squad is gearing up for a showdown with the undead army. Now, the corporal pulls Private Park aside and shares some secret plan that they are keeping hush hush. Private Park's initial reaction is allowed what? but then he nods, showing he is on board with whatever the secret mission is. Meanwhile, the newcomer is losing his mind, screeching and demanding answers about what the heck Plan C is. One of the privates spills the beans, telling him they are planning to run for it and advises him to stick close unless he wants to join the zombie parade. While the hoodie-draped guy is still bombarding them with questions, it becomes evident that the zombies are closing in. The scene shifts, and we see the beasts running at full tilt. Right on cue, the hoodie guy turns around only to be faced with a horde of mindless zombies heading his way. But then, Corporal Lee's trusty metal balls start hovering in the air. 
These are no ordinary balls, they are enchanted ones. Corporal Lee stands amidst the hovering balls like Magneto straight out of the X-Men, ready to save the day. Immediately, he commands the entire squad to withdraw from the current zone. It is all happening in the blink of an eye, and the race against the undead is on. Now we are back with this maniac, grinning at the thought of the soldiers sacrificing one of their comrades as bait. He chuckles, thinking it is the best they can come up with to save their lives. He is convinced his enormous undead army will wipe everyone out in the blink of an eye, making their efforts futile. Little does this goon know about Corporal Lee, standing resolute on the ground with his trusty enchanted metal balls. It is about time he unleashes a bombardment on the entire army, and he is fully prepared for it. Meanwhile, the soldiers are sprinting in the opposite direction, while the newcomer is once again doing his usual complaining routine. He raises concerns, questioning if Plan C involves abandoning Corporal Lee to face death recklessly. But Private reassures him that Corporal Lee Hyun would plan this tactic himself, emphasizing that the Corporal is not someone reckless who would just fail. Finally, the army is right in front of Corporal Lee, and immediately, he starts dashing towards them with his metal balls following his trail. Passing through them like it is no big deal, the monsters turn towards him, and they get smacked in the face by these enchanted balls. As soon as the metal balls hit the monsters, Corporal Lee, pushing his limits, unleashes his metal smash. The energy around the ball intensifies, shimmering in red, and in the blink of an eye, it blasts right in front of the monsters' faces, leaving a splash of blood in its wake. It is a moment of sheer battery, and the tide of the battle may be turning. Corporal Lee, playing his own version of metal ping-pong with those enchanted balls, and he is just going ham. It is like he is orchestrating a fireworks display for the undead, but instead of pretty lights, it is explosive metal balls raining down. Meanwhile, the snake-loving friend is once again perched above the mountain and is witnessing this shiny bombardment with his own eyes. Finally, he realizes that these folks are not here for a casual Sunday stroll. It was a deliberate plan to use iron beads infused with divine power, creating explosions. With all the noise from the beads, the monsters start going crazy. As soon as the sound echoes in the vicinity, the giant undead king turns around, shouting at the top of his lungs in a fit of frustration because this is not the kind of music his ears prefer to listen to. So here's Corporal Lee, chilling among the dead bodies of creatures, enjoying the aftermath of his metal ball extravaganza. Suddenly, amidst the roars of the undead king, he senses something different, a metal presence of a completely different rank. His eyes lock onto someone standing afar, and he wonders if it is a person. Out of the blue, the two bulky undead standing by the person take a leap into the air, shocking Corporal Lee. He is left wondering if this is the necromancer himself. The two monsters are now inches away from Corporal Lee, and upon contact, the ground beneath them shatters into a million pieces. Corporal Lee's helmet also takes a beating, but he is not one to break easily. He takes a leap and starts running out of the mess using some skill combo. However, it becomes apparent that he did not escape unharmed. A bleeding forehead is a clear sign that these seemingly ordinary-looking undead are anything but ordinary. There he goes, Corporal Lee, extending his hand like he is about to unleash a can of whoop-ass on these mad undeads coming his way. Meanwhile, the snake lover is grinning, thinking he has got Corporal Lee cornered because those divine-powered iron beads he prepared have already run out, and the Corporal's energy level is in shambles. But hold up, his face does a complete 180 when he sees the shards of the metals raining down from the sky. He realizes these are the same shards of the iron beads Corporal Lee shammed earlier, and the Corporal is controlling them with his metal manipulation. In the blink of an eye, he pulls off a move called Steel Rain Free Fall, and blades start raining down on those monsters. Hell breaks loose, and an entire platoon of monsters crumbles into the ground, biting the dust. Just when we thought Corporal Lee might catch a break, the entire army of undead starts marching down his way, and the undead king is all fired up to take everyone down. But hold on, the undead king shifts his gaze once again, witnessing another explosion nearby. These are the enchanted grenades doing their magic. The entire horde of zombies and even the undead king himself is momentarily stunned in their tracks. The newcomer is utterly terrified, questioning why they are grabbing the undead's attention when the plan was just to sacrifice one guy and make a run for it. Private Park is having none of it, asking what the heck he is talking about and why he would think they would have such a ridiculous plan. Private Park spills the beans that this was a decoy operation meant to lure the zombies away from Corporal Lee Hunwick from the very start. Looking at the Undead King, it seems their plan is successful so far. The Undead King changes his tracks, heading towards the explosions. Meanwhile, the Snake Lover is also watching the chaos unfold. Finally, it sinks into his mind that Corporal Lee was not the bait after all. They were planning a raid from the beginning. He is pissed that he never saw it coming, but being the maniac he is, completely drenched in his superiority. He starts laughing at the prospect that the opponent is strong, and he is going to have so much fun mingling with these ants. Now, Corporal Lee is looking around, trying to figure out what the deal is with this maniac who is laughing like there is no tomorrow. He is genuinely wondering what this guy's objective is in entering the raid gate, and to top it off, this dude seems to blend right in with the zombies. A window notification pops up, cautioning that less than 50% of the potion effect duration is left, with 2 minutes and 15 seconds of mana star effect remaining and 2 minutes and 58 seconds of HP star effect remaining. 
Meanwhile, Corporal Lee is scratching his head, contemplating if this is the guy he suspected. It appears that this guy has decided to take matters into his own hands, and his snake companion starts spewing out a fully-fledged weapon like it is no big deal. Holding this snake saliva-filled spear, his tongue is just dangling in the area, and the idea of poking a hole into Corporal Lee's head with this spear seems to be turning him on. So, the guy takes his stance, and his snake friend gears up for some poisonous action. At this point, Corporal Lee's curiosity gets the best of him, and he bluntly asks the guy if he is the necromancer. Just the mention of the word necromancer triggers something in the snake lover's mind. Corporal Lee, looking at his face, wonders if he is not the necromancer. The snake guy decides to break his silence and makes it clear that if Corporal values his life, he better start talking and spill the beans on how he knows about the necromancer. Corporal Lee, taking glances at his surroundings, figures out that these dead zombies are not resurrecting. Considering the guy's reaction, he concludes that he is definitely not a necromancer. But then, he throws another question at him, asking how he is connected to the necromancer. At this point, the snake lover starts fuming, grinding his teeth because instead of laying it out straight, Corporal Lee is further questioning him bluntly. In a fit of frustration, the snake guy shouts at the corporal, calling him a rascal. Unable to get the answer he was seeking, he lunges at Corporal Lee in frustration. No sweat for Corporal Lee, with a swift move, he deflects the direct hit. However, the power behind the snake guy's shot is no joke. The sheer pressure of the weapon hitting creates ripples in the surroundings, showcasing the force behind the attack. The snake guy is fuming even more, realizing how Corporal Lee effortlessly deflected his mighty attack. What the snake guy does not know is that Corporal Lee is rocking an indomitable steel body. He is using the ability of the hero rank weapon, Minan and Mackler's secret armor, which he snagged in the Soul Station incident. This weapon grants him two new skills, Mana Shield and Secret Tattoo. Consuming a certain amount of high hardness magic metal boosts the rank of the skill. Corporal Lee is fully aware that if it were not for the fusion of Manon and Mackler's secret armor with the steel alloy in his arm, it would have been game over, his arm would have been cut off. But then, the snake guy throws Corporal Lee back with sheer force. Undeterred, Corporal Lee gains his momentum, employing his skill combo technique. A blade comes hurling toward the snake guy from the back, but he casually deflects it with a flick of his spear, treating it like it was just a joke. He taunts Corporal Lee, asking if he actually thought these petty tricks would work. Unfazed, Corporal Lee takes another determined stance, still getting pushed back. Our Corporal does not back down. He is still holding his ground, getting pushed back but not giving up the fight. Meanwhile, the shards of those metal balls and the zombie corpses start to shine like disco lights. Corporal Lee, with the grace of a seasoned dancer, hurls down a barrage of sharp shards at the snake guy. But hold up, here comes the snake buddy to the rescue, playing the ultimate bodyguard and shielding his master from every shard. Corporal Lee's left there, scratching his head, wondering what kind of snake has such VIP protection. In the end, the snake duo seems okay, but here's the twist, the snake buddy is now rocking a cool new look, pierced with hundreds of shards. It is like a metal fashion statement gone wild. Now, the snake guy finds himself scratching his head. After witnessing Corporal Lee's slick moves, he is forced to believe that this corporal is not just your ordinary Joe or Alex. His attack patterns go way beyond the level 18 player, and Corporal Lee must have surpassed the level restrictions of the Red Gates. On the flip side, Corporal Lee has a similar sentiment about this snake guy. He is also forced to believe that this snake lover must have passed some serious level restrictions. So, in perfect unison, they both throw the question out there, how the hell did they manage to get inside this gate? The snake guy is getting even more pissed, seeing that Corporal Lee is now pushing all the right buttons, really getting on his last nerve. Now, as we take a look at this guy's hand, we see the divine bead shards are burning his skin. That revelation hits Corporal Lee hard, and his eyes widen in disbelief because a player who can get harmed by divine power is none other than the notorious vampire players. They are the evil tribe that annihilated the AMT. This is when it was found out that the soul wave was coming. Meanwhile, the snake guy on the other hand is losing his temper with each passing second. He asks Corporal Lee if he has got a knack for pissing people off. With a swift move, he shrugs off all the shards that pierced him and his snake buddy. In the blink of an eye, their wounds miraculously heal themselves. Now, the snake guy is taking his game up a notch. He readies his spear, and a black energy starts swirling around it, threatening Corporal Lee once again. The question lingers, is he ready to have his limbs chopped off by the infamous spear, or will he spill the beans and reveal who the Corporal really is? Even Corporal Lee is having second thoughts at this point. Observing the ominous energy emanating from the weapon, there is no denying it, it is the Spear of Achilles that the Gugwang group was desperately searching for. Corporal Lee is well aware of the grim reality, if the Spear's true powers are unleashed, nothing could stop it. Not even his fusion of secret armor and steel body stands a chance against its might. So, after Corporal Lee realizes the gravity of the situation, he is not ready to throw in the towel just yet. He is dead set on decoding Snake Guy's upcoming attack because, let us face it, otherwise, his story might get wrapped up right there. Out of nowhere, the system window chimes in with a cautionary note, announcing that less than 60% of potion time remains. 
there is 1 minute and 43 seconds of mana star time left and 2 minutes and 22 seconds of the HP start time. Corporal Lee finds himself in a bit of a pickle because the potion effect will only last a little over 2 minutes, and he has got to play for the win within that time. It is crunch time and the pressure is on. On the flip side, the snake lover is fully prepared, ominous energy swirling around him, and he is dead set on tearing Corporal Lee apart into shreds. The showdown begins, and the vampire takes the liberty to strike first with his Achilles spear. In the blink of an eye, Corporal Lee immediately ducks down, leaving the attack to sail above his head. The blade he was holding is still suspended in the air. As the scene zooms out, it becomes clear that this attack is not just any attack, it is turning everything in its path into smithereens. Meanwhile, Corporal Lee, using his metal control prowess, prepares his dagger for a sneaky attack. He swiftly hurls the sword down, but within a split second, the snake fella chimes in and stops the spear from piercing his vampire friend, taking the full brunt on his head. Corporal Lee is fuming at this point, seeing this snake interfering in his attacks. So, this blood-sucking dude gears up for another attack, spouting more threats at Corporal Lee, reminding him that these petty tricks will not work. He hurls another attack down, unleashing the same dark energy once again. Now, Corporal Lee is genuinely feeling cornered because that sneaky snake keeps defending against all long-distance attacks. He cannot hit him with the bead shards at all. To make matters worse, this vampire is relentlessly whipping out dark energy attacks without giving Corporal Lee a chance for proper retaliation. It has made close-range combat nearly impossible. The snake guy is not even taking a breath, repeatedly sending down waves of dark energy. He is also utterly pissed, probably because Corporal spilled the beans about the necromancer and this dude is not happy that Corporal is treating the necromancer's name like it is just another item on the menu. Finally, a grin starts to etch on his face, one that has been missing for a while now. He is about to play his ace up his sleeve, quite literally. The divine arrow is in his sleeves after all. Then, Corporal Lee turns to the annoyed vampire and casually asks him if he is really that eager to know who Corporal is. He nonchalantly reveals that he is just a soldier. To add a sprinkle of confusion, Corporal throws another question at the vampire, asking if he was already discharged. The vampire, not catching on to what Corporal is talking about, demands a straightforward answer. Suddenly, the vampire's gaze falls on a box right in front of him. With the same devilish grin etched on Corporal's face, he explains that this is precisely what he meant. Corporal Lee had already figured out that this vampire never set foot in the military. Now we find ourselves back where the zombies are on the chase, and the ant squad is doing their best to evade them. Private Park got a grenade, and he is all set to throw it into the mix. However, the newcomer tries to intervene, suggesting that they should use this opportunity to escape while the boss monster is nowhere in sight. He is convinced the raid squad would not stand a chance, especially with the zombie parade going on. Plus, he is pretty sure Hyunwook is zombie chow by now. He urges them to hide, emphasizing the importance of staying safe. Private Park, on the other hand, firmly believes in Corporal Lee's capabilities and insists that he is not someone who would easily fail. But this newcomer continues to question their certainty, asking about this mysterious signal they keep mentioning. Now, let us rewind a bit, where we see Corporal turns to Private Park and drops a bombshell. Before they bail out of this zone, he casually tells Private Park to slap a Claymore mine on his back. Private Park, quick on the uptake, asks if he mean the KM-1801. Corporal gives a nod, confirming it is precisely the one. He throws in a heads up that if that Claymore decides to go boom, it is like waving the white flag for everyone to know he has played his last trump card and failed. Corporal lays down the plan. When that explosive spectacle goes down, Private Park's mission is to ninja hide with the whole squad. Now, back to Corporal Lee. Armed with his metal crush abilities, he decides it is time to give that bomb a one-way ticket to Detonation City. The entire vicinity lights up like a 4th of July display on steroids. The flames are dancing wild, and this intense inferno and these metal balls are charging straight towards the snake guy. Meanwhile, on the sidelines, Corporal is trying his best not to get swept away by the bomb's pressure. On the flip side, the snake guy and his slithery sidekick are turning into crispy critters, courtesy of the fiery chaos. By the way, a little background on our explosive star, the Claymore. Its official name is KM-1801. It is not your average mine. It is a horizontal fragmentation directional mine, or simply put, a Claymore. This bad boy is a directional anti-personnel shrapnel mine, a weapon of mass destruction with C4 explosive, unleashing over 700 metal beads, each one by 8 inches in diameter and about 3 millimeters in length. After the flames die down, we find our snake and his vampire buddies standing tall in the settling haze. The snake is howling like a banshee after that fiery ordeal, and suddenly, with a resounding thud, he collapses onto the ground. The guy with the spear just stands there, probably contemplating his life choices. Now, he is extra ticked off. He starts questioning Corporal Lee's audacity to try and blow him to smithereens. He is throwing shade at Corporal Lee, asking if he seriously thought he could kill the Chosen One with a mere bomb. But Corporal Lee could not care less about this dude's ramblings. He gears up for round two, preparing for another attack. 
In a plot twist, Corporal unveils his trump card and smacks the guy square in the chest with his arrow. The dude goes crashing backward, courtesy of the arrow's sheer force. In the midst of the chaos, he is screeching in pain, wondering how on earth that arrow could be so fast that he did not see it coming. Meanwhile, Corporal Lee stands defiantly after unleashing his final hit on this troublesome foe. A notification window pops up, treating us to the juicy details. It is a Sir Tristan's fail not boasting the remarkable ability to track down and attack a locked target with a 100% success rate. Not just that, it also nullifies any magical resistance the locked target may have. Corporal Lee takes a moment to school the struggling vampire, making it crystal clear that the annoying snake was just a warm-up act. The real ace up his sleeve was this arrow. Vampire, attempting to pull the arrow out of his chest, soon realizes it is a futile endeavor. Right now, Corporal Lee is the one steering this arrow ship, and it is not coming out easily. With a broad grin etched on his face, he reassures this poor soul that he will not meet his maker just yet. Corporal's got some burning questions to throw at this guy, and he is in no rush. Back at the ant squad, where the newcomer is clueless about the signal they were discussing when, right on cue, a blast echoes through the entire area. One of the privates turns to Private Park, announcing that it is a Claymore explosion. Private Park, now caught in disbelief, wonders how this could be happening. To him, the explosion signals that it is time for the entire platoon to hightail it out of there. On the flip side, the newcomer is grinning from ear to ear, ecstatic that they finally got the signal they were waiting for. He confidently states that he was right, being alone out here would have meant a lousy death. Now, with the corporal meeting the same fate, they can go into hiding. The newcomer suggests they dig into their combat rations and wait for the rear raid squad to arrive, ensuring their survival in this chaotic mess. However, Private Park, with a stern tone and a gaze that could pierce souls, looks at the newcomer. Unaware of the reason for the cold treatment, the newcomer asks what is up. That is when Private Park drops the bombshell, revealing that the signal just confirmed that one of their comrades might be dead. He questions how he can dare to feel happy and grin in such a dire situation. So, the tension hangs heavy in the air after Private Park's reality check. The newcomer quickly backpedals, assuring everyone he did not mean to be callous. He apologizes for the loss and throws in the classic we got alive online. Time to move, he says. But just as they are gearing up to hit the road, this thick force in the area starts cranking up a notch. The newcomer is scratching his head, wondering what the heck is going on. The soldiers are on high alert, feeling the intensity. Everything in the atmosphere seems to be reshaping, and out of nowhere, a whole castle appears. The notification chimes in, dropping the bomb that it is the zombie king's castle, and Dako, being manifested. Apparently, the zombie king does not take kindly to anyone messing with his digs. Everyone's jaws hit the floor at the sight of a building popping up out of thin air. One soldier admits they have never seen anything like this before. Just when you thought things could not get crazier, a zombie king's castle decides to join the party. Now, one of the private spots that the zombies are also popping up along with the castle. The blue flower guild member is practically peeing his pants at this point. But Private Park takes charge, raising his hand and signaling everyone to keep it down. As the scene unfolds, it is a full-blown zombie convention, a horde materializing out of thin air. Out of the blue, our blue flower buddy freaks out and bolts in the opposite direction, leaving everyone bewildered. The zombies catch wind of him, and it is game on. They start chasing the poor guy. Private Park, cool as a cucumber, orders the platoon to open fire. But there is a sea of zombies, and it is clear they are outnumbered. Park quickly shifts gears, barking orders to find the best hiding spot. It is survival mode, and things just went from bad to worse. Back with Corporal Lee, he has got the vampire pinned against the wall, and the bloodsucker is trying to yank that arrow out. But Corporal Lee is not playing. He makes it crystal clear that arrow is under his command, and it is not coming out easily. Now, there is this cocky grin on the vampire's face. He wants to know if Corporal Lee seriously thinks he can kill him with a measly arrow. Lee admits he cannot outright kill him without divine power, but he drops the bomb. If this bloodsucker keeps bleeding at this rate, he is in for a world of pain beyond death. Vampire's teeth are practically grinding in frustration. The bloodsucker decides to go all Hulk mode, exerting even more force to free himself from that arrow. But Corporal Lee, with a smug smirk, is not having it. He tosses the question back at him, how exactly is he connected to the great Gugwang group's second grandson? And further asked is he the financial backer? The vampire's eyes widen in shock, and he retaliates, hurling insults at our guy, calling him a vermin and a lowly dog. But Corporal Lee is not having any of it. He thrusts the arrow even further, and the vampire screams his lungs out. After all the futile struggling, the bloodsucker is now utterly exhausted. Meanwhile, Corporal Lee, with a twisted grin, seems to be having fun with the interrogation. He is not done yet. Lee dives into the next question, asking if the vampire knows who the necromancer actually is. The vampire, despite being in shambles, shoots back with a sassy tone, claiming he does not know anything. He is a being who can be anyone, a comrade by the corporal's side, or even a family member. But then, Corporal Lee, dagger in hand, makes it crystal clear, crossing the line and bringing up his family is way too far. 
It is crystal clear to Corporal Lee that this vampire thrives on acknowledgement from others, but he is not getting a straight answer. Lee fires back with another question, asking if the vampire has ever actually seen a necromancer in person. The bloodsucker, proving to be a tough nut to crack, remains elusive. Corporal Lee, undeterred, starts thrusting his dagger into the vampire's neck even further, determined to get to the bottom of this cryptic situation. To rile the vampire up, Corporal Lee starts feeding him a bunch of bullshit about his supposed necromancer boss. Lee spins a yarn, claiming the necromancer is nothing but a coward, lurking in the shadows while his lackeys do all the dirty work. According to Lee, this elusive boss does not even show his face to his own lackeys, let alone talk to them face to face. Corporal Lee, with a sly grin, circles back to the burning question, what is the deal between this vampire? and the necromancer. Is he just some obsessive stalker? At this critical moment, the snake regains consciousness and silently slithers upright behind Corporal Lee. The vampire, alarmed by the sudden appearance of the snake, remains silent. However, the snake, with its giant jaws wide open, attempts to swallow Corporal Lee whole. Sensing the tide turning in his favor, the vampire seizes the opportunity and shouts at Corporal Lee, questioning how he dares to keep rambling when he does not even know who the necromancer truly is. Corporal Lee remains unfazed and makes it clear that he knows way more than the vampire does. He reveals that, for a long time, both of them used to look out for each other. The vampire dismisses it as nonsense, claiming the necromancer has not even awakened yet. Right on cue, as if Corporal Lee had it all figured out, he slams the giant snake on the head with the Achilles spear with all his might. After slamming the snake, Corporal Lee expresses gratitude to the vampire for providing him with a rare item. A system notification promptly appears, announcing that he has acquired Achilles' spear. The spear's unique trait is that wounds inflicted by it do not heal easily. Corporal Lee, now deep in thought, wonders about the awakening of the necromancer's powers. He then almost blurted out that he was going to eat it but quickly corrected himself, saying he is going to use it. If the necromancer had started acting, why would not he inform Lee? On the flip side, if the necromancer has not awakened yet, why is this vampire so fiercely loyal? The pieces of the puzzle are not adding up for Lee, and suspicions are brewing. Turning his attention to the snake guy, Corporal Lee interrogates him about how he managed to infiltrate the place. The Blue Flower Guild is supposed to be guarding the gate from the outside, so how did this snake guy barge in here all alone? So, the vampire gives Corporal Lee the look like he has just cracked the Da Vinci Code. He spills the beans, admitting he is the gatekeeper who opened the raid gate. And then, like a plot twist in a B-movie, he casually throws the question back at Lee, asking how the heck he sneaked through the gate, dropping the bomb that no one over level 18 is supposed to waltz in. Lee's left scratching his head, wondering if individuals can play gatekeeper DJ. The vampire, grinning like the Cheshire Cat, mocks Lee's flustered expression, claiming he is clueless. To make matters more interesting, he hints at a second phase about to roll in. And just like that, the surroundings begin to transform. Corporal Lee is utterly baffled as the terrain undergoes a drastic change. It becomes clear that he is not only at risk of losing himself but also the fail knot. Without wasting any time, Corporal Lee retrieves his fail knot by piercing a hole in the vampire's chest, swiftly reclaiming it. A system warning then slaps him with the news that the Zombie King's castle and Dako has completely manifested, and the entry restriction for the gate has increased from level 18 to level 30. Corporal Lee is left utterly puzzled by this Zombie King castle scenario, and starts questioning if this is the second phase the vampire was talking about. In the midst of this chaos, the vampire spills the beans that after this phase, his raid gate will be all said and done. He lets out a maniacal laugh, inviting Corporal Lee to experience the true horror of this world, all by his design. Now, back with the ant squad, they are doing their best to play hide and seek with the sudden influx of zombies. However, the undead's attention is suddenly drawn to something nearby. As the scene shifts, the undead emperor makes his grand entrance into existence. Something else materializes before his eye sockets, and it appears to be his eyes, now floating in the air as if it is the most natural thing in the world. Taking a closer look, we see his eye sockets are empty, and then, a mesmerizing purple hue begins to shimmer in the eyes of the other zombies in the vicinity. Every zombie starts screeching at the top of their lungs. It finally revealed to the terrified soldiers that the undead king is the puppet master, the one who controls life and death, reigning over light and darkness. Another notification pops up, announcing the beginning of the descent of zombie king Baron Samdi. The message describes Baron Samdi as a symbolic shaman and holy spirit of voodooism, controlling life, death, and resurrection. The figure before them is declared the true form of the zombie king. To intensify Corporal Lee's fear, the vampire reveals that his comrades, now turned into bait, will be offered as sacrifices. The zombies will then exit the gate, swarming into the outside world. With a challenging tone, the vampire invites Corporal Lee to try and stop the descent of the true zombie king, Baron Samdi. Back with the squad, they are playing a high-stakes game of hide-and-seek with the rampaging zombies. Suddenly, the zombies zero in on Private Park, who is desperately trying to stay hidden behind a wall. Panic sets in as it becomes apparent that these zombies can see them. Out of the blue, someone starts blasting the zombies with a gun, 
providing a momentary relief. But as the scene zooms out, it reveals an entire squad of zombies ready to tear everyone apart, making the ant squad seem like a mere speck in an endless sea. Determined, Private Park takes command of the situation. He instructs the raid squad that the zombies have developed visions, and he is going to provide cover to buy them enough time to escape. However, the zombie king has different plans and is not about to sit idly. He then extends his hand, and a chain-like thing hovers around his fist. With a flick of his whip, he hurls the chain down, shattering the ground into a million pieces. A soldier is sent flying behind, and now, these roots are mere inches away from tearing Private Park into a million pieces. Suddenly, a trusty grenade makes its grand entrance, landing right at the zombie's feet. It explodes, unleashing a fiery cloud that devours everything in its vicinity. The hero behind this tactical move, none other than Private Minty, brandishing his trusty shield. Private Park goes into a fit, demanding to know what the heck Minty thinks he is accomplishing, given clear commands to hightail it out of there. In response, Private Minty explains that Private Park would not last long flying solo in this zombie nightmare, so they are here to lend a hand. Little did they know, things look pretty darn futile when faced with the freaking zombie king. Unfazed, one of the soldiers, unafraid of these undead abominations, starts bombarding them with bullets. But the undead king casually extends his hands, deflecting all attacks with what seems like a defensive barrier. It is like trying to bring down a fortress with a water gun. Despite the soldiers raising concerns about staying there and the risk of turning into zombies if anyone gets killed, the squad takes a bold stand. They hurl even more enchanted grenades at the zombies, creating yet another fiery spectacle. The squad members make it crystal clear that if one person goes down, everyone will go down with them. They suggest to Private Park that he runs with them, or they will all be stuck in this perilous situation. Private Park, deeply moved by this unexpected gesture, finally commands the entire squad, including himself, to retreat. Before leaving, they ensure a fiery exit by tossing out all the grenades they have got. Meanwhile, the vampire guy continues to threaten Corporal Lee, making it clear that the zombies will attempt to exit the gate and swarm into the outside world. He gives a challenge to Corporal Lee to try stopping them if he has the guts to do so. So, here's Corporal Lee, full speed ahead, armed with his trusty divine weapons, and all he cares about is reaching the castle where his comrades are holed up. As he dashes through the mayhem, the distant sound of grenades exploding catches his attention. He cannot help but wonder if it is coming from the castle. Now, let us flash back to the moment Corporal Lee was having a heart-to-heart -heart with his squad. He is laying down the serious talk about the Claymore Mine. If that thing blows up, it means he has played his final card. He tells everyone to hide like their lives depend on it. And then, in that dramatic pause, he drops the bomb that if he does not make it back, squad leadership will be passed on. But just as he is wrapping up his speech, Private Park, ever the optimist, chips in. Showing some serious faith in Corporal Lee, he declares that he will be waiting for him. With a reassuring smile, he makes it crystal clear that the whole squad will be holding their breath until Corporal Lee makes it back. Corporal Lee, not one to let the mood get heavy, reassures everyone with that same infectious grin. He promises to come back for each and every one of them and tells them to keep the welcome party ready. In the present, Corporal Lee's mind is a swirling mix of determination and memories of the promise he made to his comrades. He spots a group of zombies blocking his path, almost like they have organized a welcoming committee just for him. However, he is not one to let a little undead gathering ruin his plans. He reaches for one of his trusty weapons, the Achilles Spear, unlocking its true potential. As he does so, a pesky system notification chimes in, warning him about the sky-high mana consumption. The zombies, on the other hand, have started their slow descent toward him. Ignoring the persistent system warnings, Corporal Lee dismisses it with a terse shut the heck up. He is well aware of the mana situation, but he is resolute in keeping his promise to come back to his comrades, no matter the cost. Meanwhile, on Team Zombie, the undead king and his buddies are having a moment of reflection, staring at their fallen comrades. Just as they are about to go full on mournful, a notification rudely interrupts, announcing that Zombie King Baron Sambi's descent has hit a snag. Needless to say, the Zombie King is not thrilled. He is grinding his teeth like he just bit into a rock and realizes one of his precious artifacts is missing. He spins around, sees a soldier holding the artifact, and you can practically see the steam coming out of his ears. Private Park, being his usual blunt self, demands to know why on earth the soldier picked up Zombie King memorabilia. But good old Private Kim, always thinking two steps ahead, just shrugs and says he figured the Zombie King would not miss it. But, surprise surprise, it is not exactly a cakewalk. A horde of relentless zombies is hot on their heels, and Private Kim is dangerously close to becoming a zombie snack. Just when things look dire, the heavens send down a barrage of fire, bombarding those relentless stalkers. The entire squad kicks into action, realizing they are trapped behind a wall. One quick-thinking Private plants a bomb on the wall, with a status update that the C4 setup is good to go. Private Park immediately commands Private Minty to shield the front line. With bombs in place and shields up, the zombies closing in. Private Park yells the magic word, BLAST. The bomb is detonated, and in the blink of an eye, there is a grand explosion. The light turns red, and every monster that dared to approach is now scattered into oblivion. On the outside, fellow squad members watch the spectacle unfold. 
The castle wall crumbles down in the aftermath of the explosion. The echoes of the blast reverberate through the entire area, and as the fiery light subsides, the once threatening zombies are now nothing but trash, scattered in bits and pieces amidst the rubble and debris. Soldiers, trying to gather themselves after blasting the shit out of the wall and zombies as well. So, amidst the chaos and rubble, one soldier bravely stands up, checking in on everyone's survival status. Slowly but surely, each soldier crawls out from the wreckage, reporting back to Private Park. As they gather themselves, one soldier remarks on the successful blockage of the zombie entrance, but another voices concern about being trapped inside with dwindling oxygen. Private Park, always cool under pressure, reassures them that they have handled the immediate threats and need to focus on finding an exit. Just when they think they are in the clear, the walls start to crumble once more. Out pops the zombie king's silver whip, like a grim reminder that their troubles are far from over. Private Park takes command, urgently instructing everyone to duck as the zombie king unleashes his deadly whips. The once relatively stable situation descends into chaos, and soldiers scramble to avoid any contact with those ferocious whips. It is a dance of survival, where a wrong move could mean a one-way ticket to the afterlife without any appointment with the grim reaper. Meanwhile, the zombie king stands resolute, both hands extended, flaunting his whips with a nonchalant air, and he is here to take what belongs to him. As the artifact stolen by Private Kim floats into the air, a sinister grin creeps across the zombie king's face. It is the look of someone who has just found exactly what they have been searching for, and that alone sends shivers down every soldier's spine. Before the zombie king can unleash chaos upon the trembling soldiers, the corporal arrives on the scene, commanding the giant to halt his movements. The unexpected turn of events catches everyone off guard, and a pleasant smile spreads across Private Park's face as he quips to the corporal about being fashionably late. Finally, standing tall and armed with unwavering determination, the corporal demands to know the audacious motherfucker who dared to mess with his squad. And with that cliffhanger hanging in the air, we reach the end of our chapter. The stage is set, the players are in position, and it is just a matter of time before we witness the showdown between the Empty Skull and the Mighty Steel Emperor. To behold their epic class, please stay tuned for the coming episode. Until next time.